Sharp Siege Chapter 1 It was ten days short of Candlemas, 1814, and the Atlantic wind carried shivers of cold rain that slapped on narrow cobbled alleys, spilt from the broken gutters of tangled roofs, and pitted the water of saint jean de Luzes in a harbour. It was a winter wind, cruel as a bird's sabre, the whirled chimney smoke into the low January clouds shrouding the corner of southwestern France, where the British army had its small lodgment. A British soldier, his horse tired and mud-stained, rode down a cobbled street in Saint-Jean-de-Luz. He ducked his head beneath a baker's wooden sign, edged his mare past a fish cart, and dismounted at a corner where an arm bollard provided a tethering post for the horse. He patted the horse, then slung its saddlebags over his shoulder. It was evident he had ridden a long way. He walked into a narrow alley, searching for a house that he only knew by description. A house with a blue door and a line of cracked green tiles above the lintel. He shivered. At his left hip there hung a long metal scabbarded sword, and on his right shoulder was a rifle. He stepped aside for a woman, black dressed and squat, who carried a basket of lobsters. She, grateful that this enemy soldier had shown her a small courtesy, smiled her thanks. But afterwards, when she was safely past him, she crossed herself. The soldier's face had been bleak and scarred, darkly handsome, but still a killer's face. She blessed her patron saint that her own son would not have to face such a man in battle, but had a secure, safe job in the French custom service instead. The soldier, oblivious of the effect his face had, found the blue door beneath the green tiles. The door, even though it was a cold day, stood ajar, and without knocking, he pushed his way into the front room. There he dropped his pack, rifle and saddlebags onto a threadbare carpet, and found himself staring into the testy face of a British army surgeon. I know you, the army surgeon, his shirt cuffs thick with dried blood, said. Sharp, sir, Prince of Wales, and I said I knew you, the surgeon interrupted. I took a musket ball out of you after Fuentes de Noro. Had to truffle around for it, I remember. Indeed, sir. Sharp could hardly forget. The surgeon had been half drunk, cursing and digging into Sharp's flesh by the light of a guttering candle. Now the two men had met in the outer room of Lieutenant Colonel Michael Hogan's lodgings. He can't go in there. The surgeon's clothes were drenched in prophylactic vinegar, filling the small room with his acrid scent. Unless you want to die. But not that I care. The surgeon wiped his bleeding cup on the tail of his shirt, then tossed it into his bag. If you want the fever, Major, go inside. He spat on his wide-bladed scarifying gouge, smeared the blood from it, and shrugged as Sharp opened the inner door. Hogan's room was heated by a huge fire that hissed where its flames met the rain coming down the chimney. Hogan himself was in a bed heaped with blankets. He shivered and sweated at the same time. His face was greyish, his skin slick with sweat, his eyes red-rimmed, and he was muttering about being purged with hyssop. His topsails had gone to the wind. The surgeon spoke from behind Sharp. Feverish, you see. Did you have business with him? Sharp stared at the sick man. He's my particular friend. He turned to look at the surgeon. I've been on the neve for the last month. I knew he was ill, but... He ran out of words. Ah, the surgeon seemed to soften somewhat. I wish I could offer some hope, Major. You can't? He might last two days. He might last a week. The surgeon pulled on his jacket that he had shed before opening one of Hogan's veins. He's wrapped in red flannel, bled regular, and we're feeding him gunpowder and brandy. Can't do more, Major, except pray for the Lord's tender mercies. The sick room stank of vomit. The heat of the huge fire pricked sweat on Sharp's face and steamed rainwater from his soaking uniform as he stepped closer to the bed. But it was obvious Hogan could not recognize him. The middle-aged Irishman, who was Wellington's chief of intelligence, shivered and sweated and shook and muttered nonsenses in a voice that had so often amused Sharp with its dry wit. It's possible, the surgeon spoke grudgingly from the outer room, that the next convoy might bring some Jesuits' bark... Jesuits bark. Sharp turned towards the doorway. 
Mm, a South American tree bark major, sometimes called quinine. Infuse it well and it can perform miracles. But it's a rare substance major and cruelly expensive. Sharp went closer to the bed. Michael? Michael? Hogan said something in Gaelic. His eyes flickered past Sharp, closed, then opened again. Michael! Do go, the sick man said distinctly. Do go! It'll not make sense, the surgeon said. He just did. Sharp had heard a name, a French name, the name of an enemy. But in what feverish context and from what secret compartment of Hogan's clever mind the name had come, Sharp could not tell. The field marshal sent me. The surgeon seemed eager to explain himself. But I can't work miracles, Major. Only the Almighty's providence can do that. Or Jesuit's bark, which I haven't seen in six months. The surgeon still stood at the door. Might I insist you leave, Major? God spare us a contagion. Yes. Sharp knew he would never forgive himself if he did not give Hogan some gesture of friendship, however useless. So he stooped and took the sick man's hand and gave it a gentle squeeze. Macaro, Hogan said quite distinctly. Macaro, Major! Sharp obeyed the surgeon's voice. Does Macaro mean anything to you? It's a fish, the mackerel. It's also French slang for pimp, Major. I told you, his wits are wandering. The surgeon closed the door on the sick room. And one other piece of advice, Major? Yes? If you want your wife to live, then tell her she must stop visiting Colonel Hogan. Sharp paused by his damp luggage. Jane visits him. A Mrs. Sharp visits daily, the doctor said. But I have not the intimacy of her first name. Good day to you, Major. It was winter in France. The floor was a polished expanse of boxwood. The walls were cliffs of shining marble, and the ceiling a riot of ornate plasterwork and paint. In the very centre of the floor, beneath the dark, cobweb-encrusted chandelier, and dwarfed by the huge proportions of the vast room, was a malachite table. Six candles, their light too feeble to reach into the corners of the great room, illuminated maps spread on the green stone table. A man walked from the table to a fire that burnt in an intricately carved hearth. He stared at the flames, and, when at last he spoke, the marble walls made his voice seem hollow with despair. There are no reserves. Calvé's demi-brigade is ordered south without delay. The man turned from the fire to look at the table where the candle glow illuminated two pale faces above dark uniforms. The Emperor will not take it kindly if with the Emperor... The smallest man at the table interrupted in a voice of surprising harshness. Reward success! January rain spattered the tall east-facing windows. The velvet curtains of this room had been pulled down twenty-one years before. Trophies to a revolutionary mob that had stormed triumphant through the streets of Bordeaux. And there had never been the money nor the will to hang new curtains. The consequence, in winters like this was a draught of malevolent force. The fire scarcely warmed the hearth, let alone the whole huge room, and the general standing before the feeble flames shivered. East or north? It was a simple enough problem. The British had invaded a small corner of southern France, nothing but a toehold between the southern rivers and the Bay of Biscay, and these men expected the British to attack again. But would Field Marshal the Lord Wellington go east or north? We know it's north, the smallest man said. Why else are they collecting boats? In that case, my dear Duco, the general paced back towards the table, is it to be a bridge or a landing? The third man, a colonel, dropped a smoked cigar onto the floor and ground it beneath his toe. Perhaps the American can tell us. The American, Pierre Duco said scathingly, is a flea on the rump of a lion, an adventurer. I use him because no Frenchman can do the task, but I expect small help of him. Then who can tell us? The general came into the aureole of light made by the candles. Isn't that your job, Duco? 
It was rare for Major Pierre Ducot's competency to be so challenged, yet France was assailed and Ducot was almost helpless. When, with the rest of the French army, he had been ejected from Spain, Ducot had lost his best agents. Now, peering into his enemy's mind, Ducot saw only a fog. There is one man, he spoke softly. Well? Ducot's round, thick spectacle lenses flashed candlelight as he stared at the map. He would have to send a message through the enemy lines, and he risked losing his last agent in British uniform, but perhaps the risk was justified if it brought the French the news they so desperately needed. East, north, a bridge, or a landing? Pierre Ducot nodded. I shall try. Which was why, three days later, a French lieutenant stepped gingerly across a frosted plank bridge that spanned a tributary of the Neve. He shouted cheerfully to warn the enemy sentries that he approached. Two British redcoats, faces swathed in rags against the bitter cold, called for their own officer. The French lieutenant, seeing he was safe, grinned at the picket. Cold, yes? Bloody cold. For you. The French lieutenant gave the redcoats a cloth-wrapped bundle that contained a loaf of bread and a length of sausage, the usual gesture on occasions such as this, then greeted his British counterpart with a happy familiarity. I've brought the calico for Captain Salmon. The Frenchman unbuckled his pack. But I can't find red silk in Bayonne. Can the colonel's wife wait? She'll have to. The British lieutenant paid silver for the calico and added a plug of dark tobacco as a reward for the Frenchman. Can you buy coffee? There's plenty. An American schooner slipped through your blockade. The Frenchman opened his cartouche. I also have three letters. As usual, the letters were unsealed, as a token that they could be read. More than a few officers in the British Army had acquaintances, friends, or relatives in the enemy ranks, and the opposing pickets had always acted as an unofficial postal system between the armies. The Frenchman refused a mug of British tea, and promised to bring a four-pound sack of coffee, purchased in the market at Bayonne the next day. That's if you're still here tomorrow. We'll be here. And thus, in a manner that was entirely normal and quite above suspicion, Pierre Ducot's message was safely delivered. Why ever shouldn't I visit Michael? It's eminently proper. After all, no one can expect a sick man to be ill-behaved. Sharp entirely missed Jane's pun. I don't want you catching the fever. Give the food to his servant. I've visited Michael every day, Jane said, and I'm in the most excellent health. Besides, you went to see him. I should imagine, Sharp said, that my constitution is more robust than yours, but it's certainly uglier, Jane said, and I must insist, Sharp said with ponderous dignity, that you avoid contagion. I have every intention of avoiding it. Jane sat quite still as her new French maid put combs into her hair. But Michael is our friend, and I won't see him neglected. She paused, as if to let her husband counter her argument. But Sharp was quickly learning that in the great skirmish of marriage, happiness was bought by frequent retreats. Jane smiled. And if I can endure this weather, then I must be quite as robust as any rifleman. The sea wind howling off Biscay rattled the casements of her lodgings. Across the roofs, Sharp could see the thicket of masts and spars made by the shipping crammed into the inner harbour. One of those ships had brought the new uniforms that were being issued to his men. It was not before time. The veterans of the South Essex, that Sharp now had to call the Prince of Wales's own volunteers, had not been issued with new uniforms in three years. Their coats were ragged, faded and patched, but now those old jackets that had fought across Spain were being discarded for new bright cloth. Some French battalion, seeing those new coats, would think of them as belonging to a fresh, unblooded unit, and would doubtless pay dear for the mistake. The orders to refit had given Sharp this chance to be with his new wife, as it had given all the married men of the battalion a chance to be with their wives. The battalion had been stationed on the line of the River Neve, close to French patrols, and Sharp had ordered the wives to stay in Saint-Jean-de-Luz. These few days were thus made precious to Sharp, days snatched from the frost-hard river line, days to be with Jane, and days spoilt only by the illness that threatened Hogan's life. I take him food from the club, Jane said. The club? Where we're lunching, Richard. She turned from the mirror with the expression of a woman well pleased with her own reflection. Your good jacket, I think. 
In every town that the British occupied, and in which they spent more than a few days, one building became a club for officers. The building was never officially chosen, nor designated as such, but by some strange process, and within a day or two of the army's arrival, one particular house was generally agreed to be the place where elegant gentlemen could retire to read the London papers, drink mulled wine before a decently tended fire, or play a few hands of whist of an evening. In Saint Jean de Luz, the chosen house faced the outer harbour. Major Richard Sharp, born in a common lodging house and risen from the gutter-bred ranks of Britain's army, had never used such temporary gentlemen's clubs before, but new and beautiful wives must be humoured. I didn't suppose, he spoke unhappily to Jane, that women were allowed in gentlemen's clubs. He was reluctantly buttoning his new green uniform jacket. They are here, Jane said, and they're serving an oyster pie for luncheon, which clinched the matter. Major and Mrs. Richard Sharp were dine out, and Major Sharp had to dress in the stiff, uncomfortable uniform that he'd bought for a royal reception in London and hated to wear. He reflected, as he climbed the wide stairs of the officers' club with Jane on his arm, that there was much wisdom in the old advice that an officer should never take a well-bred wife to an ill-bred war. Yet the frisson of irritation passed as he entered the crowded dining room. Instead, he felt the pang of pride that he always felt when he took Jane into a public place. She was undeniably beautiful, and her beauty was informed by vivacity that gave her face character. She had eloped with him just months before, fleeing her uncle's house on the drab Essex marshes to come to the war. She drew admiring glances from men at every table, while other officers' wives, enduring the inconveniences of campaigning for the sake of love, looked enviously at Jane Sharp's easy beauty. Some, too, envied her the tall, black-haired, and grimly scarred man who seemed so uncomfortable in the lavishness of the club's indulgent comforts. Sharp's name was whispered from table to table. The name of the man who had taken an enemy standard, captured one of Badajoz's foul breaches, and who, or so rumour said, had made himself rich from the blood-spattered plunder of Vittoria. A white-gloved steward abandoned a table of senior officers to hasten to Jane's side. The captain wanted to sit here, ma'am. The steward was unnecessarily brushing the seat of a chair close to one of the wide windows, but I said as how it was being kept for someone special. Jane gave the steward a smile that would have enslaved a misogynist. How very kind of you, Smithers. So, uh, he's over there. Smithers nodded disparagingly towards a table by the fire, where two naval officers sat in warm discomfort. The junior officer was a lieutenant, while one of the other man's two epaulettes was bright and new denoting a recent promotion to the rank of a full-post captain. Smithers looked devotedly back to Jane. I've reserved a bottle or two of that claret you liked. Sharp, who'd been ignored by the steward, pronounced the wine good and hoped he was right. The oyster pie was certainly good. Jane said she'd deliver a portion to Hogan's lodgings that same afternoon, and Sharp again insisted that she should not actually enter the sick room, and he saw a flicker of annoyance cross Jane's face. Her irritation was not caused by Sharp's words, but by the sudden proximity of the naval captain, who had rudely come to stand immediately behind Sharp's chair, in a place where he could overhear the conversation of Major and Mrs. Sharp's reunion. The naval officer had not come to eavesdrop, but rather to stare through the rain-smeared window. His interest was in a small flotilla of boats that had appeared around the northern headland. The boats were squat and small, none more than fifty feet long but each had a vast press of sail that drove the score of craft in a fast gaggle towards the harbour entrance. They were escorted by a naval brig that, in the absence of enemies, had its gun ports closed. They're chasse marais, Jane said to her husband. chasse marais? Coastal luggers, Richard. They carry forty tons of cargo each. She smiled, pleased with her display of knowledge. You forget I was raised on the coast. The smugglers in Dunkirk use chasse marais. The Navy, Jane said loudly enough for the intrusive naval captain to hear, could never catch them. But the naval captain was oblivious to Mrs. Sharp's goad. He stared at the straggling fleet of chasse marais that, emerging from a brief rain squall, seemed to crab sideways to avoid a sandbar that was marked by a broken line of dirty foam. Ford! Ford! The naval lieutenant dabbed his lips with a napkin, snatched a swallow of wine, then hastened to his captain's side. Sir? The captain took a small spyglass from the tail pocket of his coat. There's a lively one there, Ford. Mark her. 
Sharp wondered why naval officers should be so interested in a French coastal craft, but Jane said the Navy had been collecting the chasse marais for days. She'd heard that the boats, with their French crews, were being hired with English coin, but for what purpose, no one could tell. The small fleet had come to within a quarter mile of the harbour, and, to facilitate their entry into the crowded inner roads, each ship was lowering its topsail. The naval brig had hove to, sailed shivering, but one of the French coasters, larger than the rest of its fellows, was still under the full set of its five sails. The water broke white at its stem and slid in bubbling, greying foam down the hull that was sleeker than those of the other, smaller vessels. He thinks it's a race, sir, the lieutenant said with happy vacuity above Sharp's shoulder. Hmm, a handy craft, the captain said grudgingly. Too good for the army. I think we might take her onto our strength. Aye, aye, sir. The faster, larger lugger had broken clear of the pack. Its sails were a dirty grey, the colour of the winter sky, and its low hull was painted a dull pitch black. Its flush deck, like all the chasse marais decks, was an open sweep broken only by the three masts and the tiller by which two men stood. Fishing gear was heaped in ugly, lumpen disarray upon the deck's planking. The naval brig, seeing the large lugger race ahead, unleashed a string of bright flags. The captain snorted. Oh, bloody frogs won't understand that. Sharp, offended by the naval officer's unwanted proximity, had been seeking a cause to quarrel, and now found it in the captain's swearing in front of Jane. He stood up. Sir? The naval captain, with a deliberate slowness, turned pale, glaucous eyes onto the army major. The captain was young, plump, and confident that he outranked Sharp. They stared into each other's eyes, and Sharp felt a sudden certainty that he would hate this man. There was no reason for it, no justification, merely a physical distaste for the privileged, amused face that seemed so full of disdain for the black-haired rifleman. Well? The naval captain's voice betrayed a gleeful anticipation of the imminent argument. Jane diffused the confrontation. My husband, Captain, is sensitive to the language of fighting men. The captain, not certain whether he was being complimented or mocked, chose to accept the words as a tribute to his gallantry. He glanced at Sharp, looking from the rifleman's face to the new, unfaded cloth of the green jacket. The newness of the uniform evidently suggested that Sharp, despite the scar on his face, was fresh to the war. The captain smiled superciliously. Doubtless, Major, your delicacy will be sore tested by French bullets. Jane, delighted at the opening, smiled very sweetly. I'm sure Major Sharp is grateful for your opinion, sir. That brought a satisfying reaction. A shudder of astonishment and fear on the annoying, plump face of the young naval officer. He took an involuntary step backwards, then, remembering the cause of the near quarrel, bowed to Jane. My apologies, Mrs. Sharp, if I caused offence. No offence, Captain... Jane inflected the last word into a question. The captain bowed again. Bamfield, ma'am, Captain Horace Bamfield, and allow me to name my lieutenant Ford. The introductions were accepted gracefully as tokens of peace, and Sharp, outflanked by effusive politeness, sat. The man's got no bloody manners, he growled loudly enough to be overheard by the two naval officers. Perhaps he didn't have your advantages in life, Jane suggested sweetly. But again, the scene beyond the window distracted the naval men from the barbed comments. Christ! Captain Bamfield, careless of the risk of offending a dozen ladies in the dining room, shouted the word. The outraged anger in his voice brought an immediate hush and fixed the attention of everyone in the room on the small impertinent drama that was unfolding on the winter cold sea. The black hulled lugger, instead of obeying the brig's command to lower sails and proceed tamely into the harbour of Saint Jean de Luz, had changed her course. She'd been sailing south, but now reached west to cut across the counter of the brig. Even Sharp, no sailor, could see that the chasse marais fore and aft rig made the boat into a handy, quick sailor. It was not the course change that had provoked Bamfield's astonishment, but that the deck of the black hull lugger had suddenly sprouted men like dragon's teeth maturing into warriors, and that from the mizzenmast a flag had been unfurled. The flag was not the blue ensign of the navy, nor the tricolour of France, nor even the white banner of the exiled French monarchy. They were the colours of Britain's newest enemy, the stars and stripes of the United States of America. Uh, Jonathan! 
a voice said with disgust. Fireman! Bamfylde roared the order in the confines of the dining room, as though the brig's skipper might hear him. Yet the brig, head to wind, was helpless. Men ran on its deck and gun ports lifted, but the American lugger was seething past the brig's unarmed counter, and Sharp saw the dirty white blossom of gun smoke as the small broadside was poured at pistol-shot length into the British ship. Lieutenant Ford groaned. David was taking on Goliath and winning. The sound of the American gunfire came over the wind-broken water like a growl of thunder. Then the lugger was spinning about, sails rippling as the American skipper let his speed carry him through the wind's eye, until, taut on the opposite tack, he headed past the brig's counter towards the fleet of Chasse Marais. The brig, foresails at last catching the wind to lever her hull around, received a second mocking broadside. The American carried five guns on each flank, small guns, but their shot punctured the brig's Bermudan cedar to spread death down the packed deck. Two of the brig's guns punched smoke into the coal wind, but the American had judged his action well, and the brig dared fire no more for fear of hitting the chasse marais, into which, like a wolf let rip into a flock, the Americans sailed. The hired coasters were unarmed. Each sea-worn boat, sails frayed, was crewed by four men who did not expect, beneath the protection of their enemy's navy, to face the gunfire of an ally. The French civilian crews leapt into the cold water as the Americans, serving their guns with an efficiency that Sharp could only admire, even if he could not applaud, put ball after ball into the lugger's hulls. The gunners aimed low, intending to shatter, sink, and panic. Ships collided. One chasse marais mainmast, its shrouds cut, splintered down to the water in a tangle of tarred cables and tumbling spars. One boat was settling in the churning sea. Another, its rudder shot away, turned broadside to receive the numbing shock of another's bow in its gunwales. Fire! Captain Bamfylde roared again, this time not as an order but an alarm. Flames were visible on a French boat, and then another, and Sharp guessed the Americans were using shells as grenades. Rigging flared like a lit fuse. Two more boats collided, tangled, and the flames flickered across the gap. Then a merciful rain squall swept out of Biscay to help douse the flames, even as it helped hide the American boat. They'll not catch her, Lieutenant Ford said indignantly. Damn his eyes, Bamfile said. The American had got clear away. She could outsail her square pursuers, and she did. The last sharp saw of the black hulled ship was the flicker of her grey sails in the grey squall and the bright flash of her gaudy flag. That's Killick! The naval captain spoke with a fury made worse by impotence. I'll wager that's Killick! The spectators, appalled by what they had seen, watched the chaos in the harbour approach. Two luggers were sinking, three were burning, and another four were inextricably tangled together. Of the remaining ten boats, no less than half had grounded themselves on the harbour bar, and were being pushed inexorably higher by the force of the wind-driven flowing tide. A damned American in a cockle boat had danced scornful rings around the Royal Navy, and, even worse, had done it within sight of the army. Captain Horace Bamfylde closed his spyglass and dropped it into his pocket. He looked down at Sharp. Mark that well, the captain said. Mark it very well. I shall look to you for retribution. Me? Sharp said in astonishment. But there was no answer, for the two naval officers had strode away, leaving a puzzled Sharp and a tangle of scorched wreckage that heaved on the sea's grey surface and bobbed towards the land, where an army, on the verge of its enemy's country, gathered itself for its next advance. But whether to north or east, or by bridge or by boat, no one in France yet knew. Chapter 2 He had a cup water of a face, sharp, blind, savagely tanned. A dangerously handsome face framed by a tangled shock of gold-dark hair. It was battered, beaten by winds and seas, and scarred by blades, and scorched by powder blasts, but still a handsome face, enough to make the girls look twice. It was just the kind of face to annoy Major Pierre Ducot, who disliked such tall, confident, and handsome men. Anything you can tell me, Duco said with forced politeness, would be of the utmost use. I can tell you, Cornelius Killick said, that a British brig is burying its dead and that the bastards have got close to forty chasse in the harbour. Close to? Duco asked. 
Well, it's difficult to make an accurate count when you're firing cannon, Major. The American, careless of Duco's sinister power, leant over the Malachite table and lit a cigar from a candle's flame. Aren't you going to thank me? Duco's voice was sour with undisguised irony. The Emperor is most grateful to you, Captain Killick. Grateful enough to fetch me some copper sheeting? Killick's French was excellent. That was our agreement. I shall order some sent to you. Your ship is at Goujon, correct? Correct. Tuco had no intention of ordering copper sheeting sent to the Bassin d'Arcachon, but the American had to be humoured. The presence of the privateer captain had been most fortuitous for Duco, but what happened to the American now was of no importance to an embattled France. Cornelius Killick was the master of the Thuella, a New England schooner of sleek, fast lines. She had been built for one purpose alone, to evade the British blockade, and, under Killick's captaincy, the Thuella had become a thorn in the Royal Navy's self-esteem. Whether as a cargo ship that evaded British patrols, or as a privateer that snapped up stragglers from British convoys, the schooner had led a charmed life, until, at the beginning of January, as the Thuella stole from the mouth of the Gironde in a dawn mist, a British frigate had come from the silvered north, and its bow chasers had thumped nine-pounder bulls into the Thuella's transom. The schooner, carrying a cargo of French twelve-pounder guns for the American army, turned south. Her armament was no match for a frigate, nor could her speed save her in the light, mist-haunted airs. For three hours she was pounded. Shot after shot crashed into the stern, and Killick knew that the British gunners were firing low to spring his planks and sink his beloved ship. But the Thuella had not sunk, and the mist was stirred by cat's paws of wind, and the wind became a breeze, and even though damaged, the schooner had outrun her pursuer and taken refuge in the vast Bassin d'Arcachon. There, safe behind the guns of the Teste de Bouche fort, the Thuella was beached for repairs. The wounded Thuella needed copper, oak, and pitch. Day followed day, and the supplies were promised, but never came. The American consul in Bordeaux pleaded on Cornelius Killick's behalf, and the only answer had been the strange request from Major Pierre Ducot that the American take a chasse marée south and investigate why the British collected such craft in Saint-Jean-de-Luz. There was no French navy to make the reconnaissance, and no French civilian crew lured by British gold could be trusted with the task, and so Killick had gone. Now, as he'd promised, he'd come to this lavish room in Bordeaux to give his report. Would you have any opinion, Duco now asked the tall American, why the British are hiring Chasse Perhaps they want a regatta. Killick laughed, saw that this Frenchman had no sense of humor at all, and sighed instead. They plan to land on your coast, presumably. Or build a bridge? Where to, America? They're filling the damn harbor with boats. Killick drew on his cigar. And if they were going to make a bridge, Major, wouldn't they take down the masts? Besides, where could they build it? Duco unrolled a map and tapped the estuary of the Adour. There? Cornelius Killick hid his impatience, remembering that the French had never understood the sea which was why the British fleets now sailed with such impunity. That estuary, the American said mildly, has a tide fall of over fifteen feet with currents as foul as rat puke. If the British build a bridge there, Major, they'll drown an army. Duco supposed the American was right, but the Frenchman disliked being lectured by a ruffian from the New World. Major Duco would have preferred confirmation from his own sources, but no reply had come to the letter that had been smuggled across the lines to the agent who served France in a British uniform. Ducot feared for that man's safety, but the Frenchman's pinched, scholarly face betrayed none of his worries as he interrogated the handsome American. How many men, Ducot asked, could a chasse marée carry? A hundred? Perhaps more if the seas were calm. And they are forty, enough for four thousand men. Ducot stared at the map on his table. So, where will they come, Captain? The American leant over the table. Rain tapped on the window and a draft lifted a corner of the map that Killick weighted down with a candlestick. The Adour, Arcachon, or the Gironde? He tapped each place as he spoke its name. The map showed the Biscay coast of France. That coast was a sheer sweep, almost ruler straight, suggesting long beaches of wicked tumbling surf. 
yet the coast was broken by two river mouths and by the vast, almost landlocked bassin d'Arcachon. And from Arcachon to Bordeaux, Duco saw it was a short march, and if the British could take Bordeaux, they would cut off Marshal Sue's army in the south. It was a bold idea, a risky idea, but on a map, in an office in winter, it seemed to Duco a very feasible one. He moved the candle away and rolled the map into a tight tube. You would be well advised, Captain Killig, to be many leagues from Arcachon if the British do make a landing there. Then send me some copper. It will be dispatched in the morning, Duco said. Good day to you, Captain, and my thanks. When the American was gone, Duco unrolled the map again. The question still nagged at him. Was the display in saint jean de Luz's harbour merely a charade to draw attention away from the east? Duco cursed the man who had not replied to his letter, and wondered how much credence could be put on the words of an American adventurer. North or east? Bridge or boats? Duco was tempted to believe the American, but knowing an invasion was planned was useless, unless the landing place was known. Yet one man might still tell him, and to know the answer would bring a victory. And France, in this bitter, wet winter of 1814, was in need of a victory. Looking for us, sir? A midshipman in a tarred jacket stood at the top of weed slime water steps on Saint Jean de Luz's quay. Are you the vengeance? Sharp looked apprehensively at the tiny boat, frail on the filth litted water that was to carry him to the vengeance. Sharp had received a sudden order, peremptory and harsh, that offered no explanations but merely demanded his immediate presence on the quay where a boat from His Majesty's ship Vengeance would be waiting. Four grinning oarsmen doubtless hoping to see the rifle officer slip on the steep stone stairs, waited in the gig. The captain would have sent his barge, sir, the midshipman said in an unconvincing apology, but uh, it's been used for the other gentleman. Sharp stepped into the rocking gig. What other gentleman? No one confides in me, sir. The midshipman could scarcely be more than fourteen, but he gave his orders with a jaunty confidence as Major Sharp crouched on the stern thwart, and wondered which of the ships moored in the outer harbour was the vengeance. It seemed to be none of them, for the midshipman took his tiny craft out through the harbour entrance to buck and thump its bows in the tide race over the sandbar. Ahead now, in the outer roads, a flotilla of naval craft was anchored. Amongst them, and towering over the other vessels like a behemoth, was a ship of the line. Is that the vengeance? Sharp asked. It is, sir. A seventy-four, and as sweet a sailor as ever was. The midshipman's enthusiasm seemed misplaced to Sharp. Nothing about the vengeance suggested sweetness. Instead, moored in the long swell of the grey ocean, she seemed like a brutal mass of timber, rope and iron, one of the slab-sided killers of Britain's deep-water fleet. Her checkered sides were like cliffs, and the ponderous hull, as Sharp's gig neared the vast craft, gave off the rotten stench of tar, unwashed bodies and ordure, the normal odour of a battleship becalmed. The midshipman shouted orders, oars backed, the tiller was thrown across, and somehow the gig was laid alongside with scarce a bump of timber. Above Sharp now, water dripping from its lower rungs, was a tumble-home ladder leading to the main deck. You'd like a sling, Lord, sir? The midshipman asked solicitously. I'll manage. Sharp waited as a wave lifted the gig, then jumped for the rain-stick ladder. He clawed at it, held on, then scrambled ignominiously up to the greeting of a boatswain's whistle. Major Sharp, w welcome aboard. Sharp saw an eager, ingratiating lieutenant who clearly expected to be recognized. Sharp frowned. Uh, you uh, were with, with Captain Bamfylde, indeed, sir. I'm Ford. The elegantly clothed Ford made inconsequential conversation as he steered Sharp towards the stern cabins. It was an honor, he said, to have such a distinguished soldier aboard. And was it possible that Sharp was related to Sir Roderick Sharp of Northamptonshire? No. Sharp was remembering Captain Bamfylde's parting words in the officers' club. Were those the reasons for his summons here? One of the Wiltshire Sharps, perhaps. Ford seemed eager to place the rifleman in a comforting social context. Middlesex, Sharp said. Oh, oh, do mind your head. Ford smiled as he waved Sharp under the break of the poop deck. I, I can't quite place the Middlesex Sharps. My mother was a whore. I was born in a common lodging house, and I joined the army as a private. Does that make it easier? Ford's smile did not falter. Captain Bamfylde's waiting for you, sir. Please go in. 
Sharp ducked under the lintel of the open doorway to find himself in a lavishly furnished cabin that extended the width of the Vengeance's wide stern. A dozen officers, their wine glasses catching the light from the galleried windows, sat around a polished dining table. Major, we meet in happier circumstances. Captain Horace Bamfile greeted Sharp with effusive and false pleasure. No damned American to spoil our conversation, eh? Come and meet the company. Seeing Bamfile in his ship made Sharp realize how very young the naval captain was. Bamfile must still lack two years of thirty, yet the naval captain possessed an ebullient confidence and a natural authority to compensate for his lack of years. He had a fleshy face, quick eyes, and an impatient manner that he tried to disguise as he made the introductions. Most of the men about the table were naval officers whose names meant nothing to Sharp, but there were also two army officers, one of whom Sharp recognized. Colonel Elphinstone? Elphinstone, a big burly engineer whose hands were calloused and scarred, beamed a welcome. You haven't met my brother in arms, Sharp, Colonel Wigram. Wigram was a grey-faced, dour, bloodless creature who acknowledged the ironic introduction with a curt nod. If you could seat yourself, Major Sharp, we might at last begin. He managed to convey that Sharp had delayed this meeting. Sharp sat beside Elphinstone in a chair close to the windows that looked onto the big grey Atlantic swells that scarcely moved the vengeance's ponderous hull. He sensed an awkwardness in the cabin, and he judged that there was a disagreement between Wigram and Elphinstone, a judgment that was confirmed when the tall engineer leant towards him. It's all bloody madness, Sharp. Marines have got the pox, so they want you instead. The comment, ostensibly made in a confiding voice, had easily carried to the far end of the table where Bamfile sat. The naval captain frowned. Our marines have a contagious fever, Elphinstone, not the pox. Elphinstone snorted derision, while Colonel Wigram, on Sharp's left, opened a leather-bound notebook. The middle-aged Wigram had the manner of a man whose life had been spent in an office, as though all his impetuosity and enjoyment had been drained by dusty, dry files. His voice was precise and fussy. Yet even Wigram's desiccated voice could not drain the excitement from the proposals he brought to this council of war. One hundred miles to the north, and far behind enemy lines, was a fortress called the Teste de Bouche. The fortress guarded the entrance to a natural harbour, the Bassin d'Arrachon, which was just twenty-five miles from the city of Bordeaux. Elphinstone, at the mention of Bordeaux, gave a scornful grunt that was ignored by the rest of the cabin. The fortress of Teste de Bouche, Wigram continued, was to be captured by a combined naval and army force. The expedition's naval commander would be Captain Bamfald, while the senior army officer would be Major Sharp. Sharp, understanding that the chill, pedantic Wigram would not be travelling north, felt a pang of relief. Wigram gave Sharp a cold, pale glance. Once the fortress is secured, Major, you will march inland to ambush the high road of France. A successful ambush will alarm Marshal Sioux, and might even detach French troops to guard against further such attacks. Wigram paused. It seemed to Sharp, listening to the slap of water at the vengeance's stern, that there was an unnatural strain in the cabin, as though Wigram approached a subject that had been discussed and argued before Sharp arrived. It is to be hoped, Wigram turned a page of his notebook, that any prisoners you take in the ambush will provide confirmation of reports reaching us from the city of Bordeaux. Balderdash, Elphinstone said loudly. Your descent is already noted, Wigram said dismissively. Reports? Elphinstone sneered the word. Children's tales, rumours, Balderdash! Sharp, uncomfortably trapped between the two men, kept his voice very mild. Reports, sir? Captain Bamfald, evidently Wigram's ally in the disagreement, chose to reply. We hear, Sharp, that the city of Bordeaux is ready to rebel against the Emperor. If it's true, and we profoundly hope that it is, then we believe the city might rise in spontaneous revolt when they hear that His Majesty's forces are merely a day's march away. And if they do rise, Colonel Wigram took up the thread, then we shall ship troops north to Arcachon and invade the city, thus cutting France in two. You note, Sharp, Elphinstone was relishing this chance to stir more trouble, that you, a mere major, are chosen to make the reconnaissance. Thus, if anything goes wrong, you will carry the blame. 
Major Sharp will make his own decisions, Wigram said blandly, after interrogating his prisoners. Meaning you won't go to Bordeaux, Elphinstone said confidingly to Sharp. But you have been chosen, Major, Wigram's pale eyes looked at Sharp, not because of your lowly rank, as Colonel Elphinstone believes, but because you are known as a gallant officer unafraid of bold decisions. In short, Elphinstone continued the war across the table, because you will make an ideal scapegoat. The naval officers seemed embarrassed by the contretemps, all but for Bamfylde, who had evidently relished the clash of colonels. Now the naval captain smiled. You merely have to understand, Major, that your first task is to escalate the fortress. Perhaps, before we explore the subsequent operations, Colonel Wigram might care to tell us about the testated Bush's defences. Wigram turned pages in his notebook. <clears throat> Our latest intelligence demonstrates that the garrison can scarcely man four guns. The rest of its men have been marched north to bolster the Emperor's army. I doubt whether Major Sharp will be much troubled by such a flimsy force. But four fortress guns, Elphinstone said harshly, could slice a battalion to mincemeat. I've seen it, implying, evidently truthfully, that Wigram had not. If we imagine disaster, Banfield said smoothly, then we shall allow timidity to convince us into inaction. The comment implied cowardice to Elphinstone, but Banfield seemed oblivious of the offence he had given. Instead, he unrolled the chart onto the table. Wait the end of that, Sharp. Now, there seems to me just one sensible way to proceed. He outlined his plan, which was indeed the only sensible way to proceed. The naval flotilla, under Bamfal's command, would sail northwards and land troops on the coast south of the Pointe d'Acachon. That land force, commanded by Sharp, would proceed towards the fortress, a journey of some six hours and make an escalade while the defenders were distracted by the incursion of a frigate into the mouth of the Arcachon Channel. The frigate's bound to take some punishment, Bamfile said equably. I'm sure Major Sharp will overcome the gunners swiftly. The chart showed the great basin of Arcachon with its narrow entrance channel, and marked the fortress of Teste de Bouche on the eastern bank of that channel. A profile of the fort, as a landmark for mariners, was sketched on the chart, but the profile told Sharp little about the stronghold's defences. He looked at Elphinstone. What do we know about the fort, sir? Elphinstone had been piqued by Bamfile's discourteous treatment, and thus chose to use the technical language of his trade, doubtless hoping thereby to annoy the bumptious naval captain. It's an old fortification, sharp as square trace. You'll face a glacis rising to ten feet with an eight counterscarp into the outer ditch, a width of twenty and a scarp of ten. That's revested with granite, by the way, like the rest of the damn place. Climb the scarp and you're on a counterguard. I'll be peppering you by now, and you've got a forty-foot dash to the next counterscarp. The colonel was speaking with a grim relish, as if seeing the figures running and dropping through the enemy's plunging fire. That's twelve feet. It's flooded, and the enceinte height is twenty. The width of that last ditch? Sharp was making notes. Um, sixteen? Near enough. Elphinstone shrugged. We don't think it's flooded more than a foot or two. Even if the naval officers did not understand Elphinstone's language, they could understand the import of what he was saying. The testated bouche might be an old fort, but it was a bastard, a killer. Weapons, sir? Sharp asked. Elphinstone had no need to consult his notes. They've got six thirty-six pounders in a semicircular bastion that butts into the channel. The other guns are twenty-fours, wall-mounted. Captain Horace Bamfylde had listened to the technical language and understood that a small point was being scored against him. Now he smiled. We should be grateful it's not a Tanai trace. Elphinstone frowned, realizing that Bamfylde had understood all that had been said. Indeed. No, Lynette. Bamfylde's expression was seraphic. Caponier? Elphinstone's frown deepened. Citadels at the corners, but hardly more than Garit. Bamfylde looked to Sharp. Surprise and speed, Major. They can't defend the complete enceinte, and the frigate will distract them. So much it seemed for the problems of capturing a fortress. The talk moved on to the proposed naval operations inside the Bassin d'Arcachon, where more chasse marais awaited capture. But Sharp, uninterested in that part of the discussion, let his thoughts drift. He didn't see Bamfile's plush, shining cabin. Instead, he imagined a rising grass slope, scythed smooth, called a glacis. Beyond the glacis was an eight-foot drop into a granite-faced, sheer-sided ditch twenty feet wide. 
At the far side of the ditch, his men would be faced with a ten-foot climb that would lead to a gentle inward-facing slope, the counterguard. The counterguard was like a broad target displayed to the marksmen on the inner wall, the enceinte. Men would cross the counterguard, screaming and twisting as the balls thumped home, only to face a twelve-foot drop into a flooded ditch that was sixteen feet wide. By now the enemy would be dropping shells or even stones. A boulder dropped from the twenty-foot high inner wall would crush a man's skull like an eggshell. Yet still the wall would have to be climbed with ladders if the men were to penetrate into the testé de bouche. Given a month and a train of siege artillery, Sharp could have blasted a broad path through the whole trace of ditches and walls. But he did not have a month. He had a few moments only in which he must save a frigate from the terrible battering of the fort's heavy guns. Major? Abruptly the image of the twenty-foot wall vanished, to be replaced by Bamfile's quizzically mocking smile. Major! Sir? We are talking, Major, of how many men would be needed to defend the captured fortress while we await reinforcements from the south. Uh, how long will the garrison have to hold? Sharp asked. Wigram chose to answer. A few days at the most. If we do find that Bordeaux's ripe for rebellion, then we can bring an army corps north inside of ten days. Sharp shrugged. Two hundred? Three? But you'd best use marines, because I'll need all of my battalion if you want me to march inland. It was Sharp's first trench and statement, and it brought curious glances from the junior naval officers. They had all heard of Richard Sharp, and they watched his weather-darkened, scarred face with interest. Your battalion? Wigram's voice was as dry as old paper. A brigade would be preferable, sir. Elphinstone snorted with laughter, but Wigram's expression did not change. And what leads you to suppose, Major, that the Prince of Wales' own volunteers are going to Arcachon? Sharp had assumed it because he'd been summoned, and because he was the de facto commander of the battalion. But Colonel Wigram now disabused him brutally. You are here, Major, because you are supernumerary to regimental requirements. Wigram's voice, like his gaze, was pitiless. Your regimental rank, Major, is that of captain. Captains, however ambitious, do not command battalions. You should be apprised that a new commanding officer of due seniority and competence is being appointed to the Prince of Wales' own volunteers. There was a horrid and embarrassed silence in the cabin. Every man there, except for the young Captain Bamfield, knew the bitter pangs of promotion denied and each man knew they were watching Sharp's hopes being broken on the wheel of the army's regulations. The assembled officers looked away from Sharp's evident hurt, and Sharp was hurt. He had rescued that battalion. He had trained it, given it the Prince of Wales's name, then led it to the winter victories in the Pyrenees. He had hoped, more than hoped, that his command of the battalion would be made official. But the army had decided otherwise. A new man would be appointed. Indeed, Wigram said the new commanding officer was daily expected on the next convoy from England. The news, given so coldly and unsympathetically in the formal setting of the Vengeance's cabin, cut sharp to the bone. But there was no protest he could make. He guessed that was why Wigram had chosen this moment to make the announcement. Sharp felt numbed. Naturally, Bamfile then forward, the glory attached to the capture of Bordeaux will more than compensate for this disappointment, Major. And you will rejoin your battalion as a major when this duty is done, Wigram said, as though that was some consolation. Though the war, Bamfile smiled at Sharp, may well be over because of your efforts. Sharp stirred himself from the bitter disappointment. Single-handed effort, sir? Your marines are pox. My battalion can't come. What am I supposed to do? Train cows to fight? Bamfile's face showed a flicker of a frown. There will be marines, major the Biscay squadron will be combed for fit men. Sharp, his belligerence released by Wigram's news, stared at the young naval captain. It's a good thing, is it not, that the malady is not spread to your sailors, sir. You seem to have a full ship's company as I came aboard. Banfowl stared like a basilisk at Sharp. Colonel Elphinstone gave a quick, sour laugh, but Wigram slapped the table like a timid schoolmaster, calling a rowdy class to order. You will be given troops, Major, in numbers commensurate to your task. How many? Enough, Wigram said testily. The question of Sharp's troops was dropped. Instead, Bamfile talked of a brig sloop that had been sent to watch the fortress, 
and to question any local fisherman who put to sea. The presence of the American privateer was discussed, and Banfile smiled as he spoke of the punishment that would be fetched on Cornelius Killick. We must regard that doomed American as a bonus for our efforts. Then the talk went to naval signals, far beyond Sharp's competence to understand, and again he wondered about that fortress. Even undermanned, a fortress was a formidable thing, and no one in this wide cabin seemed interested in ensuring that he was given a proper force. At the same time, as the voices buzzed about him, he tried to assuage the deep pain of losing the command of his battalion. Sharp knew the regulations disqualified him from commanding the battalion, but there were other battalions commanded by majors, and the regulations seemed to be ignored for those men, but not for Sharp. Another man was to be given the superb instrument of infantry that Sharp had led through the winter's battles, and once again Sharp was adrift and unwanted in the army's flotsam. He reflected bitterly that if he'd been a Northamptonshire Sharp, or a Wiltshire Sharp, with an honourable tag to his name and a park about his father's house, then this wouldn't have happened. Instead, he was a Middlesex Sharp, conceived in a whore's transaction and whelped in a slum and thus a fit whipping boy for boars like Wigram. Colonel Elphinstone, sensing that Sharp was miles away again, kicked the rifleman's ankle, and Sharp recovered attentiveness in time to hear Bamfield inviting the assembled officers to dine with him. I fear I can't. Sharp didn't want to stay in this cabin where his disappointment had shamed him in front of so many officers. It was a petty motive, pride-born, but a soldier without pride was a soldier doomed for defeat. Major Sharp, Bamfield explained with ill-concealed scorn, has taken a wife so we must forego his company. I haven't taken a wife, Elphinstone said belligerently, but I can't dine either, your servant, sir. The two men, Sharp and Elphinstone, travelled back to Saint-Jean-de-Luz in Bamfile's barge. Elphinstone, swathed in a vast black cloak, shook his head sadly. Bloody madness, Sharp, utter bloody madness. It began to rain. Sharp wished he was alone with his misery. You're disappointed, aren't you? Elphinstone remarked. Yes. Wigram's a bastard, Elphinstone said savagely. And you're to take no bloody notice of him. You're not going to board her. Those are orders. Sharp, stirred from his self-pity by Elphinstone's ferocious words, looked at the big engineer. So why are we taking the fort, sir? Because we need the chasse marais. Why else? Or were you dozing through that explanation? Sharp nodded. Yes, sir. The rain fell harder as Elphinstone explained that the whole Arcachon expedition had been planned simply to release the three dozen chasse marais that were protected behind the fortress guns. I need those boats sharp, not to waltz into bloody Bordeaux, but to build a bloody bridge. But for Christ's sake, don't tell anyone it's a bridge. I'm telling you because I won't have you gallivanting off to Bordeaux, you understand me? Entirely, sir. Wigram thinks we want the boats for a landing, because that's what the pier wants everyone to think. But it's going to be a bridge, Sharp, a damn great bridge to astonish the bloody frogs. But I can't build a bloody bridge unless you capture the bloody fort and get me the boats. After that, enjoy yourself. Go and ambush the high road, then go back to Bamfield and tell him the frogs are still loyal to Boney. No rebellion, no farting about, no glory. Elphinstone stared gloomily at the water which was being pocked by the cold rain into resemblance of dirty, heaving gunmetal. It's Wigram who's got this bee in his bonnet about Bordeaux. The fool sits behind a bloody desk and believes every rumour he hears. Is it a rumour? Some precious Frenchman pinned his ear back. Elphinstone plucked his cloak even tighter as the barge struggled against the current sweeping about the sandbar. Michael Hogan didn't help. He's a friend of yours, isn't he? Yes, sir. Elphinstone sniffed. Oh. <laughs> Damn shame he's ill. I can't understand why he encouraged Wigram, but he did. But you're to take no notice, Sharp. The pier expects you to take the fortress. Let bloody Bamfield extract the boats, then come back here. Sharp stared at Elphinstone and received a nod of confirmation. So Wellington was not unaware of Wigram's plans, but Wellington was putting his own man, Sharp, into the operation. Was that, Sharp wondered, the reason why he'd lost his battalion? It wouldn't matter, Elphinstone went on, except that we need the bloody navy to carry us there, and we can't control them. Bamfile thinks he'll get an oldham out of Bordeaux, so stop the silly bugger dead. No rising, no rebellion, no hopes, no glory, and no bloody oldham. Sharp smiled. There'll be no fortress unless I have decent troops, sir. You'll get the best I can find, Elphinstone promised, but not in such numbers that might tempt you to invade Bordeaux. Indeed, sir. 
The oarsmen were grunting with the effort of fighting the tide's last ebb as the barge rounded the harbour's northern mole. Sharp understood well enough what was happening. A simple cutting-out expedition, necessitating the capture of a coastal fort, was needed to release the Chasse Marais. But ambitious officers, eager to make a name for themselves in the waning months of the war, wished to turn that mundane operation into a flight of fancy. Sharp, who would make the reconnaissance in land, was ordered to blunt their hopes. The steersman pointed the boat's prow towards a flight of green slime steps. The white-painted barge, in smooth water now, cut swiftly towards the quay. The rain became tempestuous, slicking the quay's stones darker and drumming on the top of sharp shako. In oars! the steersman shouted. The white-bladed oars rose like wings and the craft coasted in a smooth curve to the foot of the steps. Sharp looked up. The harbour wall, sheer and black and wet, reared above him like a cliff. How high is that? he asked Elphinstone. The colonel squinted upwards. Eighteen feet? Then Elphinstone saw the point of Sharp's question and shrugged. Let's hope Wigram's right, and they've stripped the tested bush of defenders. Because if the fort's ensemble was defended, Sharp would have no chance. None. And his men would die so that the naval officer could blame the army for failure. That was a chilling thought for a winter's dusk, in which the rain slanted from a steel-grey sky to pursue Sharp through the alleys to where his wife sewed up a rent in his old jacket, his battle jacket the green jacket that he'd wear to a fortress wall that waited for him in Arcachon. Chapter 3 I suppose, Richard Sharp said harshly, that the army couldn't find any real soldiers. That's about the cut of it, the rifle captain replied. Mind you, I suppose the army couldn't find any real commanding officers either. Sharp laughed. Colonel Elphinstone had done his best, and that best was very good indeed, for if Sharp could not take his own men into battle, then there was no unit he would rather lead than Captain William Fredrickson's men of the 60th Rifles. He took Fredrickson's hand. I'm glad, William. We're not unhappy ourselves. Fredrickson was a man of villainous, even vile appearance. His left eye was gone, and the socket was covered by a mildewed patch. Most of his right ear had been torn away by a bullet, while two of his front teeth were clumsy fakes. All the wounds had been taken on the battlefield. Fredrickson's men, with a clumsy and affectionate wit, called him Sweet William. The 60th, raised to fight against the Indian tribes in America, was still known as the Royal American Rifles, though half the company were Germans, a quarter were Spaniards, enrolled during the Long War, and the rest were British, except for a single harsh-faced man who alone justified his regiment's old name. Sharp had fought alongside this company two years before, and, seeing the bitter face, the name came back to him. That's the American. Taylor, isn't it? Yes. Fredrickson and Sharp stood far enough from the two paraded companies, so their voices could not be overheard by the men. We might come up against some Jonathans, Sharp said. There's some bugger called Killick skulking in Arcachon. Would it worry Taylor if he has to fight his countrymen? Fredrickson shrugged. Leave him to me, sir. Two companies of the green-jacketed riflemen had been given to Sharp. Fredrickson commanded one, a Lieutenant Minver the other, and together they numbered 123 men. Not many, Sharp thought, to assault a fortress on the French coast. He walked further along the quay with Fredrickson, stopping by a fish cart that dripped bloody scales into a puddle. Between you and me, William, it's a mess. I thought it might be. We leave tomorrow to capture a fortress. It isn't supposed to be heavily defended, but no one's sure. After that, God knows what happens. There's a madman who wants us to invade France, but between you and me, we're not. Fredrickson grinned, then turned and looked at the two companies of riflemen. We're capturing a fort all by our little selves. The Navy says a few Marines might be well enough to help us. Hmm, that's very decent of them. Fredrickson stared at the great bulk of the vengeance. Barges, propelled by huge sweeps, were taking casks of water from the harbour to the huge ship. You'll draw extra ammunition, Sharp said. The first division's paying for it. I'll rub the bastards blind, Fredrickson said happily. And tonight, you'll do me the honour of dining with Jane and myself. I'd like to meet her. Fredrickson sounded guarded. She's wonderful, Sharp said it warmly, 
and Fredrickson, seeing his friend's enthusiasm, hoped that a new wife had not sat Sharp's appetite for the bloody business that lay ahead at Arcachon. Commandant Henri Lassin thought he detected sleet in the dawn, but he could not be sure until he climbed to the western bastion and saw how the flakes settled briefly on the great cheeks of his guns before melting into cold rivulets of water. The guns were loaded, as they always were, but their muzzles and vent holes were stoppered against the damp. Good morning, Sergeant. Sir. The Sergeant stamped his feet and slapped his hands against the cold. Lassans orderly climbed the stone ramp with a tray of coffee mugs. Lassan always brought the morning guard a mug of coffee each, and the men appreciated the small gesture. The commandant, they said, was a gentleman. Children ran across the courtyard, and women's voices sounded from the kitchens. There should not be women in the fort, but Lassan had let the families of his gun crews take up the quarters vacated by the infantry who had gone to the northern battles. Lassan believed his men were less likely to desert if their families were inside the defences. There she is, sir. The sergeant pointed through the sleeting rain. Lassan looked over the narrow Arcachon channel where the tide raced across the shoals. Beyond the sandbanks, the surging grey waves were torn by wind into a maelstrom of broken white water, amidst which, beating southwards, was a little ship. The ship was a British brig sloop with two tall masts and a vast driver sail at her stern. Her black and white banded hull hid, Lassan knew, eighteen guns. Her sails were reefed, but even so she seemed to plunge through the waves, and Lassan saw how high the spray fountain from the brig stem. Our enemies, he said mildly, are having a disturbed breakfast. Yes, sir, the sergeant laughed. Lassan cradled his coffee mug. There was something vulnerable about his face, a drawn and frightened look that made his men protective of him. They knew Commandant Lassan wished to become a priest when this war ended, and they liked him for it but they also knew that he would fight as a soldier until the last shot of the war had been fired. Now he stared at the British brig. You saw her last night? At sundown, sir. The sergeant was certain. And there were lights out there at night. He's watching us, isn't he? Lassan smiled. He's seeing what we're made of. The sergeant slapped the gun as a reply. Lassan turned to stare thoughtfully into the fort's courtyard. A warning had come from Bordeaux that he was to prepare for a British attack. But Bordeaux had sent him no men to reinforce his shrunken garrison. Lassan could man his big guns, or he could protect the landward walls, but he couldn't do both. If the British landed troops and sent warships into the channel, then Lassan would be trapped between the hammer and the anvil. He turned back to stare at the British brig. If Bordeaux was right, that inquisitive craft was making a reconnaissance, and Lassan must deceive the watchers. He must make them think the fort was so thinly defended that a landing by troops would be unnecessary. Lieutenant Gerard came yawning from the green-painted door of the officer's quarters. Lassan hailed him. Lieutenant! Sir? No flag today, and no washing hung to dry on the barracks roof. Not that anyone was likely to dry washing in this weather. Gerard, his blue jacket unbuttoned above his braces, frowned. No flag, sir. You heard me, Lieutenant. And no men in the embrasures, you hear? Sentries in the citadels only. I hear you, sir. Lassan turned back to see the brig sloop tack into the rain-sodden wind. He saw a shiver of sails, a spume of foam, and he imagined the cloaked officers, their braid tarnished by salt, staring at the grey crouching fort through their spyglasses. He knew that such little ships, sent to spy on the French coast, often stopped the fishing boats that worked close inshore. Today, then... And every day for the next week, only those fishermen whom Henri Lassan trusted would be allowed past the guns of the Teste de Bouche. They'd be encouraged to take English gold, and encouraged to drink a glass of dark rum in English cabins, and encouraged to sell lobsters to blue-coated Englishmen, and in return they would tell a plausible lie or two on behalf of Henri Lassan. Then, with a roar from those great passive guns that waited for employment, Henri Lassan would strike a blow for France. He smiled pleased with his notion, and went to breakfast. Before dinner, Sharp faced a miserable and unhappy few moments. The answer, he repeated, is no. Regimental Sergeant Major Patrick Harper stood in the small parlour of Jane's lodgings and twisted his wet shako in thick, strong fingers. 
I talked with Mr. Dallin Ward, sir, so I did, and he said I could come. I mean, we're only sitting around like washerwomen in a bloody drought, so we are. There's a new colonel coming, Patrick. He needs his RSM. Harper frowned. Needs his major, too. He can't lose both of us. Sharp didn't have the power to deny the Prince of Wales' own volunteers the services of this massive Irishman. And if you come, Patrick, the new man will only appoint a new RSM. You wouldn't want that. Harper frowned. I'd rather be in a scrap if one's going, sir. And Mr. Fredrickson wouldn't take me amiss, nor would he. Sharp could not be persuaded. No! The huge man, four inches taller than Sharp, six feet, grinned. He could take sick leave, sir, so I could. You have to be sick first. But I am! Harper pointed to his mouth. I've got a toothache something desperate, sir. Here! He opened his mouth, jabbed with his finger, and Sharp saw that Harper did indeed have a reddened and swollen upper gum. Does it hurt? That's dreadful, so it is. Harper, sensing a chink in Sharp's armor, became enthusiastic about his pain. It's, it's more of a throb, sir, on and off, on and off, like a great drum beat in your skull. Desperate it is. Then see a surgeon tonight, Sharp said unsympathetically, and have it pulled, then get back to battalion where you belong. Harper's face dropped. Truly, sir, I can't come. Sharp sighed. I'd rather have you along, RSM, than any dozen other men. That was true a thousand times over. Sharp knew of no man he would rather fight beside, but it could not be at Arcachon. I'm sorry, Patrick. Besides, you're a father now. You should take care. Harper's Spanish wife, just a month before, had given birth to a son that had been christened Richard Patricio Augustin Harper. Sharp had found the choice of Richard an embarrassment, but Jane had been delighted when Harper saw permission to use the name. And I'm doing you a favor, RSM, Sharp went on. How would that be, sir? Because your son will still have a father in two weeks. Sharp was seeing that black, sheer, wet wall, and the image of it made his voice savage. Then he turned as the door opened. My dear, Jane, beautiful in a blue silken dress, smiled delightedly at Harper. Sergeant Major, how's the baby? Just grand, ma'am. Harper had formed a firm alliance with Mrs. Sharp that seemed aimed at subverting Major Sharp's authority. And as a matter of fancy for the linen. You've got a toothache, Jane frowned with concern. Your cheek's swollen. Harper blushed. Oh, it's only a wee ache, ma'am, nothing at all. You must have oil of cloves. There's some in the kitchen. Come along. The oil of cloves was discovered, and Harper sent disconsolate into the night. You can't come. Sharp said after dinner, when he and Jane walked back alone through the town. Oh, poor Patrick. Jane insisted on stopping at Hogan's lodgings, but there was no news. She had visited earlier in the day and thought the sick man was looking better. I wish you wouldn't risk yourself, Sharp said. You've said so a dozen times, Richard, and I promise I heard you each time. They went to bed, and just four hours later the landlady hammered on their door. It was pitch dark outside and bitterly cold inside the bedroom. Frost had etched patterns on the small window panes, patterns that were reluctant to melt, even though Sharp revived the fire in the tiny grate. The landlady had brought candles and hot water. Sharp shaved, then pulled on his old and faded rifleman's uniform. It was the uniform in which he fought, stained with blood and torn by bullet and blade. He wouldn't go into action in any other uniform. He oiled his rifle's lock. He always carried a long arm into battle, even though it had been ten years since he'd been made into an officer. He drew his heavy cavalry sword from its scabbard and tested the foredge. It seemed odd to be going to war from his wife's bed. Odder still not to be marching with his own men or with Harper. And that thought gave him a flicker of unrest, for he wasn't used to fighting without Harper beside him. Two weeks, he said. I shall be back in two weeks, maybe less. It will seem like an eternity, Jane said loyally. Then, with an exaggerated shudder, she threw the bedclothes back and snatched up the clothes that Sharp had hung to warm before the fire. Her small dog, grateful for the chance, leapt into the warm pit of the bed. You don't have to come, Sharp said. Of course I'll come. It's every woman's duty to watch her husband sail to the wars. Jane shivered suddenly, then sneezed. A half hour later they went into the fish-smelling lane, and the wind was like a knife in their faces. Torches flared on the quayside where the Amélie rose on the incoming tide. A dark line of men, 
weapons gleaming softly, filed aboard the merchantman that was to be Sharp's transport. The Amelie was no jewel of Britain's trading fleet. She'd begun life as a collier, taking coal from the Tyne to the smoke-thick Thames, and her dark timbers still stank thickly of coal dust. Casks and crates and nets of supplies were slung on board in the pre-dawn darkness. Boxes of rifle ammunition were piled on the quayside, and with them were barrels of vilely salted and freshly killed beef. Twice-baked bread was wrapped in canvas and boxed in resinous pine. There were casks of water for the voyage, spare flints for the fighting, and whetstones for the sword bayonets. Rope ladders were coiled in the Amelie scuppers, so that the riflemen, reaching the beach where they must disembark, could scramble down to the longboat sent from the vengeance. A smear of silver grey marked the dawn and flooded slowly to show the filthy littered water of the harbour. Aboard the Scylla, a frigate moored in the harbour roads. Yellow light showed from the stern cabin, where doubtless the frigate's captain took his breakfast. I wrapped you a cheese. Jane's voice sounded small and frightened. It's in your pack. Thank you. Sharp bent to kiss her and wished suddenly that he wasn't going. A wife, General Crawford used to say, weakens a soldier. Sharp held his wife an instant, feeling her ribs beneath the layers of wool and silk. Then, suddenly, her slim body jerked as she sneezed again. Oh, I'm catching a cold. She was shivering. Sharp touched her forehead, and it was oddly hot. You're not well. I, I hate rising early. Jane tried to smile, but her teeth were chattering and she shivered again. And I'm not certain the fish was entirely to my taste last night. Go home when you're gone. Sharp, even though a hundred men watched him, kissed his wife again. Jane, my dear, you must go, but it's only a cold. Everyone gets a cold in winter. Sir, Sweet William saluted Sharp and bowed to Jane. Good morning, ma'am. Somewhat brisk. Indeed, Mr. Fredrickson. Jane shivered again. Everyone's aboard, sir. Fredrickson turned to Sharp. Sharp wanted to linger with Jane. He wanted to reassure himself that she hadn't caught Hogan's fever. But Fredrickson was waiting for him. Men were holding the ropes that would swing the gangplank away, and he couldn't stay. He gave Jane a last kiss, and her forehead was like fire. Go home to bed. I, I will. She was shaking now, hunched and clenched against the bitter wind. Sharp paused, wanting to say something memorable, something that would encompass the inchoate, extraordinary love he felt for her. But there were no words. He smiled, then turned to follow Fredrickson onto the Amelie's deck. The daylight was thin now, seeping through the hilly landscape behind the port and making the streaked, bubbling, heaving water of the harbour silver. The gangplank crashed onto the stones of the quay. Far out to sea, like some impossible mountain forming on the face of the waters, an airy structure of dirty grey sails caught the morning daylight. It was the vengeance getting under way. She looked formidably huge, a great floating weapon that could make the air tremble and the sea shake when she launched her full broadside. But she'd be useless in the shoal waters by the Teste de Bouche fort. That would have to be taken by men and by handheld weapons. He's signalling. Tremgar, master of the Amelie, spat over the side. Means they'll be moving us off. Stand by for it! He bellowed the last words. A topsail dropped from the nearby Scylla's yards, and the movement suggesting an imminent departure made Sharp turn to the quay. Jane, swathed in her powder-blue cloak, was still there. Sharp could see her shivering. Go home! A voice shouted. Wait! Wait! The accent was French, and the speaker a dully dressed man, evidently a servant, who rode a small horse and led a pack horse on a leading rein. Amélie, wait! Bloody hell! Tremgar had been packing a pipe with dark tobacco that he now pushed into a pocket of his filthy coat. Behind the servant and pack horse, and stately as a bishop in procession, rode a tall, elegant man on a tall, elegant horse. The man had a delicate, sensitive face, a white cloak clasped with silver, and a bicorn hat shielded with oiled cloth against the rain. The gangplank was rigged again, and the man with a faint shudder as though the stench of the Amelie was too much for a gentleman of his fastidious tastes, came aboard. I seek Major Sharp, he announced in a French accent to the assembled officers who had gathered in the ship's waist. I'm Sharp, Sharp spoke from the poop deck. The newcomer turned in a movement that would have been elegant on a dance floor, 
but seemed somewhat ludicrous on the battered deck of an erstwhile collier. He took a quizzing glass from his sleeve and, with its help, inspected the tattered uniform of Major Richard Sharp. He bowed, somehow suggesting that he should have been the recipient of such an honour himself, then took off his waterproofed hat to reveal sleek silver hair that was brushed back to a black velvet bow. He held out a sealed envelope. Orders! Sharp had jumped down from the poop and now tore open the envelope. To Major Sharp, the bearer of this note is the Comte de Macaire. You will render him every assistance within your power, Bertram Wigram, Colonel. Sharp looked into the narrow face that had been powdered pale. He suddenly remembered that Hogan, in his sick ramblings, had mentioned the name Macaro, meaning pimp, and he wondered if the insult was a nickname for this elegant, fastidious man. You're the Comte de Macaire? I have that honour, monsieur, and I travel to Arcachon with you. De Macaire's cloak had fallen open to reveal the uniform of the Chasseurs Britanniques. Sharp knew that regiment's reputation. The officers were Frenchmen loyal to the Ancien Regime, while its men were deserters from the French army and all unmitigated scoundrels. They could fight when the mood took them, but it was not a regiment Sharp would want on his flank in battle. Captain Fredrickson, four men to get the Frenchman's baggage on board. Quick now! De Macaire tugged at his buttoned kidskin gloves. You have quarters for my horse? And the pack horse? No horses, Sharp said sourly, which only tossed the Comte de Macaire into a sulky fit of protests in which the name of the Duc d'Angoulême, Louis the Eighteenth, and the Lord Wellington featured prominently. In the meantime, an angry message came from the Scylla demanding to know why the Amélie had not slipped her moorings at the flood tide, and finally Sharp had to give way. Which meant another delay, as the Comte's two horses were coaxed aboard, and a section of Fredrickson's riflemen were moved out of the forward hold to make way for the beasts. Trunks and cases were carried up the gangplank. I cannot, of course, the Comte de Macaire said, travel in this ship. Why not? Sharp asked. A wrinkle of the nostril was the only answer, and a further delay ensued while a message was sent to the Scylla, which demanded that His Excellency the Comte de Macaire be allowed quarters on board the frigate, or preferably the Vengeance. Captain Grant of the Scylla, doubtless under pressure from the Vengeance, returned a short answer. The Comte, disgusted, went below to the cabin he would now have to share with Fredrickson. The light was full now, dissipated by clouds and showing the filth that floated yellow and black in the grey harbour. A dead dog bumped against the Amelie's hull as the forward cables were released. Then the aft splashed free, and from overhead came the menacing sound of great sails unleashing to the wind's power. A gull gave its lonely, harsh cry that sailors believed was the sound of a drowned soul in agony. Sharp stared at the golden-haired girl in the cloak of silver blue, and he blamed the wind for the tears in his eyes. Jane had a handkerchief to her face, and Sharp prayed that he had not seen the first symptoms of the fever in her. He tried to convince himself that Jane was right, and that she merely suffered from eating bad fish the night before. But God damn it, he thought, why did she have to visit Hogan? Go home! He shouted across the widening gap. Jane shivered but stayed. She watched the Amélie claw clumsily out beyond the bar, and Sharp, staring back to the harbour, saw the tiny signal of her white waving handkerchief get smaller and smaller, and finally disappear as a rain squall seethed and hissed over the broken sea. The vengeance loomed over the other ships. The Amélie, pumps already working, took station astern, while the Scylla, fast and impatient, leapt ahead into the squalls. The brig sloops closed behind the Amélie, and the shore of France was nothing but a dark smear on a grey sea. A boy, tarred black and marking God alone knew what hazard in this empty waste, slipped astern, and thus the expedition to Arcachon, amidst chaos and uncertainty, was underway. Chapter 4 All day Commandant Henri Lasson watched the ships pass. He watched from within one of the fort's covered citadels, and with the help of a brass barrel telescope that had belonged to his grandfather, no flag flew from the fort. One of the local fishermen, trusted by Lasson, had taken his small boat to the Lacanor Shoals, where the British brig had taken the smack's wind and invited the captain aboard. Rum had been served, gold paid for fish, and the fishermen had solemnly informed the enemy that the fort was deserted entirely of its old garrison. They'd gone north, he said, to serve the emperor, and only a few local militia now patrolled the ramparts. If the lie was believed, then Lassan might entice the British into the range of his heavy guns. 
and he had cause to think the lie had worked, for the brig had flattened her sails into the wind and gone southwards. Now, instead of the brig, a vast line of grey sails flecked the western horizon. Commandant Lasson guessed the ships were eight or nine miles out to sea, and he knew that he watched a British convoy carrying men and weapons and horses and ammunition to their army to the south. The sight made Henri Lasson feel lonely. His emperor was far away, and he was alone on the coast of France, and his enemy could sail with impunity down that coast in a massive convoy that would have needed a fleet to disrupt. Except there were no more French fleets. The last had been destroyed by Nelson nine years before, and what ships were left rotted in their anchorages. A few privateers, American and French, sailed the ocean, but they were like small dogs yapping at the heels of a vast herd. Even Cornelius Killick, in his splendid Thuella, could not have taken a ship from that convoy. Killick would have waited for a straggler, perhaps, but nothing less than a fleet could have broken that vast line of ships. It was painful to see the enemy's power so naked, so unchallenged, so ponderous. In the great holds of those hull-down ships were the instruments that would bring death to Sue's army in the south, and Lassan could do nothing. He could win his small battle, if it came, but the greater struggle was beyond his help. That thought made him chide himself for lack of faith, and in penitence he went to the fort's small chapel and prayed for a miracle. Perhaps the emperor, marching and countermarching his men along the frost-hardened roads of the north, could win a great victory and break the alliance that ringed France. Yet the emperor's desperation was witnessed by the fort's emptiness. France had been scraped for men, then scraped again, and many of the next class of conscripts had already fled into the woods or hills to escape the sergeants who came to take cannon fodder, still not grown to manhood. A clash of boots, a shout, and the squeal of the gate hinges, which, however often greased, insisted on screeching like a soul entering purgatory, announced a visitor to the fort. Basson pocketed his beads, crossed himself, and went into the twilight. The bastards! The double-crossing bastards! Good evening, Henri! Cornelius Killick, his savage face furious, nodded to the commandant. Bastards! Who? Bordeaux! No copper, no oak! What am I supposed to do, paste paper over the bloody holes? Perhaps you'll take some wine, Lasson suggested diplomatically. I'll take some wine. The American followed Lasson into the commandant's quarters that looked more like a library than a soldier's rooms. That bastard Duco, I'd like to pull his teeth out through his backside. I thought, Lasson said gently, that the coffin maker in Arcachon had given you some elm. Given? The bastard made us pay three times the price, and I don't like sailing with a ship's ass made out of dead man's wood. Ah, a sailor's superstition. Lasson poured wine into the crystal glasses that bore his family's coat of arms. The last Comte de Lasson had died beneath the guillotine, but Henri had never been tempted to use the title that was rightfully his. Did you see all those fat merchantmen crawling south? All day, Killick said gloomily. Take one of those and you make a small fortune. Not as much as an Indiaman, of course. He finished the glass of wine and poured himself more. I told you about the Indiaman I took. Indeed you did, Henri Lasson said politely. Three times. And was her whole crammed with silks, with spices, with treasures of the furthest east, with peacock's plumes and sapphires blue? Ho, ho! Killick gave his great whoop of a laugh. No, my friend. She was crammed to the gunnels with saltpeter. Saltpeter to make powder, powder to drive bullets, bullets to kill the British. It's kind of our enemies, is it not, to provide the powers of their own destruction. He sat beside the fire and stared at the thin, scholarly-faced Lasson. So, my friend, are the bastards coming? If they want the chasse marée, Lasson said mildly, they'll have to come here. And the weather, the American said, will let them land safely. The long Biscay shore that could thunder with tumbling surf was this week in gentler mood. The breaking waves beyond the channel were four or five feet high, frightening enough to landlubbers, but not high enough to stop ships' boats from landing. Lasson, still hoping that his deception would persuade the British that they had no need to land men on the coast of the south, nevertheless acknowledged the possibility. Indeed. And if they do come by land, Killick said brutally, they'll beat you. Lasson glanced at the ebony crucifix that hung between his bookshelves. Perhaps not. The American seemed oblivious of Lasson's appeal to the Almighty. 
And if they take the fort, he went on, they'll command the whole basin. They will, indeed. And they'll take the Thueller. Killick said it softly, but in his imagination he was seeing his beautiful ship captured by mocking British sailors. The Thueller would be sailed to England as a prize, and a sleek New England schooner, made to ride the long winds of empty oceans, would become an unloved coasting ship carrying British trade. By God, they'll not take her. We'll do our best, Lassan said helplessly, though how four gun crews could resist a British attack was indeed a problem that called for a miracle. Lassan did not doubt that his guns could wreak damage, but once the British discovered the guns were manned, they would soon land their marines and surround the fort. And Lassan, because the Emperor had been greedy for men, could not defend the seaward and the landward walls at once. The grim news made the American silent. He stared at the small fire, his hawk's face frowning, and when he finally spoke, his voice was oddly tentative. What if we fought? You! Lassan could not hide his surprise. We can fight, Henri, Killick grinned, and we've got those damn twelve-pounder guns in our hold. He was suddenly filled with enthusiasm, seizing a map from Lassan's table and waiting its corners with books. They'll land south of Point Arcachon. Undoubtedly. And there are only two routes they can take north, the path by the beach or the road. Killick's face was alight with a thought of action, and Lassan saw that the American was a man who reveled in the simple problems of warfare. Lassan had met other such men, brave men, who made their names famous throughout France and written pages of history through their love of violent action. He wondered what would happen to such men when the war ended. You're a sailor. Lassan said gently, and fighting on land is not the same as a sea battle. But if the bastards aren't expecting us, Henri, if the pompous bastards think they're safe, then we ambush them. Killick was certain his men, trained gunners, could handle the French artillery, and he was seeing in his hopeful imagination the grape shot cutting down marching files of British marines. By God, we can do it, Henri! Lassan held up a thin hand to stop the enthusiastic flow. If you really want to help, Captain Killick, then put your men into the fort. No. Killick knew only too well what the British would do to a captured privateer's crew. If Killick fought to save the Thuella, then he must have a safe retreat in case he was defeated. Yet in his plan to ambush the British on their approach march, he couldn't see any chance of defeat. The enemy marines would be surprised, flayed by grape shot, and the Thuella would be safe. Henri Lassan, staring at the map, wondered whether the American's plan delineated the miracle he had prayed for. If the British didn't capture the fort, they could not take the Chasse Marais, and without the Chasse Marais, they were trapped behind the rivers running high with winter's floodwaters. Trapped. And perhaps the Emperor, blooding his northern enemies, would march south and give the British army a shattering defeat. For though Wellington had conquered every French marshal or general sent to fight him, he had never faced the Emperor's genius. Lassan wondered if this big, handsome American had found the small answer that would hold up the British just long enough to let the Emperor come south and teach the Godams a lesson in warfare. Then a pang of realism forced Lassan's mind to contemplate failure. What will you do, mon ami, if the British win? Killick shrugged. Dismass the Tueller and make her look like a wreck. Then pray that the British ignore her. And you, Commandant? What will you do? Lassan smiled sadly. Burn the chasse marais, of course. By so doing, he would condemn the two hundred men of the crews and their families to penury. The mayor and curé had begged him to preserve the boats, which, even in French defeat, would give life and bread to the communities of the Biscay coast. But in defeat, Henri Lassan would do his duty. Let's hope it doesn't come to that, he said. It won't. Killick brandished his cigar to leave an airy trace of smoke, like that made by the burning fuse of an arcing mortar shell. It's a brilliant idea, Henri, so let the buggers come, eh? Huh? They drank to victory in a winter's dusk, while far to the south, where they crossed the path of a great convoy tacking the ocean, Richard Sharp and his small force came north to do battle. It snowed in the night. Sharp stood by the stinking tar-coated rat lines on the Amelie's poop deck and watched the flakes whirl round the riding light. The galley fire was still lit forward, 
and it cast a great sheet of flickering red on the foresail. The galley's smoke was taken northwards towards the lights of the Vengeance. The Amelie was making good time. The helmsman said so. Even Captain Tremgar, grunting out of his bunk at two in the morning, agreed. Never known the old sow to sail so well, sir. Can you not sleep now? No. I'll be having a drop of rum with you. No, thank you. Sharp knew that the merchant captain was offering a kindness, but he didn't want his wits fuddled by drink as well as sleeplessness. He stood alone by the rail. Sometimes, as the ship lent to a gust of wind, a lantern would cast a shimmering ray onto a slick, hurrying sea. The snow whirled into nothingness. An hour after Tremgar's brief conversation, Sharp saw a tiny spark of light, very red, far to the east. Another ship? he asked the helmsman. Lord love you, no, sir. The snow-bright wind whirled the helmsman's voice in snatches to Sharp. That be land! A cottage? A soldier's fire? Sharp would never know. The spark glimmered, sometimes disappearing altogether, yet then flickering back to crawl at its snail's pace along the dark horizon. And the sight of that far anonymous light made Sharp feel the discomfort of a soldier at sea. His imagination that would plague him in battle saw the Amelie shipwrecked, saw the great seas piling cold and grey on breaking timbers, among which the bodies of his men would be whirled like rats in a barrel. That one small red spark was all that was safe, all that was secure, and he knew he'd rather be a hundred miles behind the enemy lines and on firm ground than be on a ship in a treacherous sea. You cannot sleep, nor I. Sharp turned. The ghostly figure of the Comte de Macaire, hair as white as the great cloak that was clasped with silver at his throat, came towards him. The Comte missed his footing as the Amelie's blunt bow thumped into a larger wave, and the tall man had to clutch Sharp's arm. Oh, my apologies, Major. Steady by Sharp, the Comte rested his backside on one of the small cannon that had been issued to the Amelie for its protection. The Comte, his hair remarkably sleek for such an hour of the morning, stared eastwards. France! He said the name with reverence, even love. St. Jean de Luz was in France, Sharp said in an ungracious attempt to imply that the Comte's company was not welcome. The Comte de Macaire ignored the comment, staring instead at the tiny spark as though it was the grail itself. I have been away, Major, for eighteen years, he spoke with a tragic intonation, waiting for liberty to be reborn in France. The ship dipped again and Sharp glimpsed a whirl of grey water that was gone as swiftly as it had been illuminated. The snow melted on his face. Everyone spoke of liberty, he thought, the monarchists and the anti-monarchists, the republicans and the anti-republicans, the bonapartists and the bourbons, all carried the word around as if it was a genie trapped in a bottle, and they were the sole possessors of the world's corkscrew. Yet if Sharp was to go down to the hold now, and wake up the soldiers who slept so fitfully and uncomfortably in the stinking tween decks of the Amelie, and if he was to ask each man what he wanted in life, then he knew, besides being thought mad by the men, that he wouldn't hear the word liberty used. They wanted a woman as a companion. They wanted cheap drink. They wanted a fire in winter and fat crops in summer. And they wanted a patch of land or a wine shop of their own. Most would not get what they desired. But nor would Sharp. He had a sudden, startlingly clear vision of Jane lying sick sweating in the cold shivers of the killing fever. The image, so extraordinarily real in the freezing night, made him shiver himself. He tried to shake the vision away, then told himself that Jane suffered from nothing more than an upset stomach and a winter's cold. But the superstition of a soldier suddenly gripped Sharp's imagination, and he knew with an utter certainty that he sailed away from a dying wife. He wanted to howl his misery into the snow-dark night, but there was no help there, no help anywhere. She was dying. That knowledge might have been vouchsafed by a dreamlike image, but Sharp believed it. Damn your bloody liberty! Sharp spoke savagely. The Major? The Comte, hearing Sharp's voice but no distinct words, edged down the ship's rail. Jane would be dead and Sharp would return to the coldly heaped soil of her grave. He wanted to weep for the loss. Did you speak, Monsieur? The Comte persisted. Sharp turned to the Comte then. The rifleman had been distracted by his thoughts, but now he concentrated on the tall, pale aristocrat. Why are you here? Here, monsieur. 
De Marquet was defensive. For the same reason you are here, to bring liberty to France. Sharp's instincts were alert now. He was sensing that a new player had entered the game, a player who would confuse the issues of this expedition. Why? he persisted. De Marquet shrugged. My family is from Bordeaux, Major, and a letter was smuggled to me in which they claim the citizens are prepared to rebel. I am ordered to discover the truth of the letter. God damn it, but his instincts were right. Sharp was supposed to discover the mood of the French, but Wigram, knowing that Sharp would return a gloomy answer, had sent this aristocrat at the very last moment. Doubtless de Marquet would give Wigram the answer he wanted, the answer that would lead to madness. Sharp laughed sourly. You think two companions of riflemen can provoke Bordeaux into rebellion? No, monsieur. The Comte de Marquet paused as a wave lurched the ship sideways. I think two companies of riflemen, with the help of some marines, can hold the fort at Arcachon until more men are carried north by Chasse Marais. Isn't that why the boats are being collected? To make an invasion? And we're better off to invade than at Arcachon? Sharp did not reply. Elphinstone had ordered him to scotch Wigram's desk-born ambitions, but now this foppish Frenchman would make that task difficult. It would be simpler, Sharp thought, to tip the man overboard now. But if the city of Bordeaux is ready for rebellion, de Marquet was happily oblivious of Sharp's thoughts, then we can topple the regime now, Major. We can raise insurrection in the streets. We can humble the tyrant. We can end the war. Again, Sharp made no reply, and the Comte stared at the tiny glimmer of light in the cold darkness. Of course, the Comte continued, if I do succeed in raising the city against the ogre, I shall expect your troops to come to my aid immediately. Startled, Sharp twisted to look at the pale profile of the Comte de Marquet. I have no such orders. The Comte also turned, showing Sharp a pair of the palest, coldest eyes imaginable. You have orders, Major, to offer me every assistance in your power. I carry a commission from your Prince Regent, and a commission from my King. When ordered, Major, you will obey. Sharp was saved from a reply by the harsh clang of the ship's bell. He wondered irritably why sailors did not just ring the hour like other folk, but insisted on sounding gnomic messages of indeterminate meaning upon their bells. Feet padded on the deck as the watch was changed. The binnacle lantern flared bright as the lid was lifted. Your first duty, Major, the Count ignored the dark figures who came up the poop deck ladders, is to safely put my horses ashore. Sharp had taken enough. My first duty, my lord, is to my men. If you can't get your horses ashore, then they stay here, and I won't lift a goddamn finger to help you. Good day. He stalked across the deck, a gesture somewhat spoiled by the need to stagger, as the Amelie creaked onto a new course in obedience to lights that flared suddenly from the vengeance's poop. The dawn crept slow from the grey east. The snow stopped and Sharp could see in the half-light that none had settled on the land that proved surprisingly close. A brig was close inshore, and signal flags hung bright from her mizzen yard. She wasn't with us yesterday. Sweet William, looking disgustingly well-rested, nodded towards the signalling brig. He brought Sharp a mug of tea. She must have been poking around the fortress. Sleep sound? No sleep. Sharp cradled the mug and sipped the hot, sour liquid. The shore looked barren. Sand dunes were grey behind the flicker of surf, and beyond the dunes were the dark shapes of stunted pines. No houses were visible. Far inland there were the low, humped shapes of hills, and to the north there was a promontory of low, shadow ground that jutted into the bleak waters. Captain Tremgar pointed to the headland. Point Arcachon! He turned away from the two rifle officers and bellowed orders through a speaking trumpet. Sharp heard the thumping rumble as the anchor cables snaked and whipped out of the hawse holes. Sails that a moment before had been filled with wind flapped like monstrous bat wings as the topmen furled the stiff canvas onto the yards. The vengeance, looming vast in the morning light, was already anchored and already launching her first boats. Christ on his cross! Sweet William vented a sudden anger. He was staring at the boats that huddled beside the vengeance. Sharp took his spyglass from the sleeve pocket on his overalls and extended the ivory barrels. The glass had been a gift from the Emperor of the French to his brother, the King of Spain, 
but the gift had been lost among the loot of Vittoria and was now carried by an English rifleman. Jesus Christ! Sharp echoed Fredrickson's blasphemy. The Vengeance had launched three longboats, and each was filling with red-jacketed marines. There must be a hundred of them! He watched the men gingerly descend the tumble home to step into the rocking boats. The sea, miraculously, was gentle this morning, heaving with the long swells of the ocean, but not broken into white caps. Sharp raised the glass, cursing because the small movements of the Amélie made training the telescope difficult, and he saw yet more red-coated marines waiting on the Vengeance's main deck. That bastard didn't need us at all. Well, not to take the fort, perhaps, sweet William lit a cheroot. But a force of trained riflemen will be damn useful for the march on Bordeaux. Damn his bloody soul, Sharp understood now. Wigram had sent de Marquet to force a decision, and Bamfald had secreted the marines to implement the decision. Come hell or high water, Wigram and Bamfald wanted to take Bordeaux, and Sharp was caught in the middle. He watched the packed longboats pull towards the breaking surf, and he felt a bitter anger at Bamfald, who had lied about a malady, so that he could have trained skirmishes for his madcap scheme. Even the sun, showing through the clouds for the first time in weeks, could not alleviate Sharp's anger. It's my belief, Fredrickson said, that he wanted you personally. Me? He probably had an exalted view of your ability, Fredrickson said dryly. If the celebrated Major Sharp fails, then no reasonable man could expect Captain Bamfile to succeed. On the other hand, of course, who better than yourself to guarantee success? Bugger Bamfylde, Sharp said. The longboats landed their red-coated troops, then were launched back through the surf. The oarsmen, tugging against wind and tide, jerked like small marionettes to pull the heavy boats free of the shore's suction. They didn't come to the Amélie. Instead, they went to the Vengeance, where still more marines waited for disembarkation. The morning ticked on. A breakfast of gravy-dipped bread was passed around the riflemen who waited on the Amélie's deck. Those marines already ashore formed up in ranks, and, to Sharp's astonishment, a half-company was marched off the beach towards the shelter of the dark pines. Sharp himself was supposed to command the land operations, yet he was being utterly ignored. Captain Tremgar? Sir? Your boat can put me ashore? Tremgar, a middle-aged man wrapped in a filthy tarpaulin jacket, knocked the dottle from his pipe on the brass binnacle cover that was covered with tiny dents from just such treatment. I ain't got orders to do it, Major. I'm giving you orders. Tremgar turned. One of the longboats was pulling away from the vengeance and carrying, instead of marines, a group of blue-cloaked naval officers. Tremgar shrugged. Don't see why not, Major. It took twenty minutes to lower the Amelie's small tender into the water, and another five before Sharp was sitting uncomfortably on the stern thwart. The Comte de Macaire, seeing a chance to escape from the stinking collier, had insisted on sharing the boat. He had exchanged his British uniform for a suit of brown cloth. From the Amelie's deck the sea had appeared benign, but here in the tiny boat it swelled and threatened and ran cold darts of fear up Sharp's back. The oars spattered him with water. The waves heaved towards the gunnels, and at any moment Sharp expected the small rowboat to turn turtle. The Comte, wrapped in his cloak, looked seasick. Sharp twisted. The Amelie's tar and salt-stained hull reared above him. A cook jettisoned a bucket of slops over the side, and gulls, screaming like banshees, swooped from the air between the yards to fight over the scraps. The Comte, offended by Sharp's cavalier treatment in the small hours, said not a word. Slowly, oar tug by oar tug, the four boatmen dragged the small craft away from the Amélie, and the grumble of the surf, like the roar of a far-off, relentless battle, grew louder. Sharp instinctively touched his weapons. His rifle was muzzle-stopped against seawater splashes, while the lock was wrapped in an old rag for protection. His sword was clumsy in the confines of the tiny boat. A surge heaved the boat up and ran it forward towards the breaking surf that betrayed itself to Sharp as a spume of spray being whipped from a curling wave by the wind's flick. Then the boat dropped into a valley of sliding, glassy grey water that was flecked with floating seaweed. This was the point of danger. This was the moment when the small boats must go from the sea's cradle into the broken forces where the waves battered at the shore. Years ago, on a beach like this in Portugal, Sharp had watched the longboats broach in the combers and spill their men like puppets into the killing sea. The bodies, he remembered, had come ashore white and swollen, uniforms split by the swelling flesh, 
and dogs had worried at the corpses for days. Ball! the bosun shouted. Ball, you bastards! The oarsman pulled, and like a wagon loaded with cannon shot, the boat fought the upward slope of the wave. The oars bent under the strain. Then the vast power of the sea caught the boat's transom, and it was running suddenly free of all constraint, and the bosun was shouting at the men to ship oars and was leaning his full weight on the tiller behind Sharp. The bosun's shout seemed like a prolonged bellow that melded with the roar of the surf. The world was white and grey, streaked bottle green at his heart, for the wave broke to carry the tiny boat surging forward. Sharp's right hand was a cold and bloodless white, where it gripped the gunwale. Then the boat's bow was dipping, falling, and the water was smashing around Sharp's ears in scraps of freezing white, and still the shout echoed in his ears, and he felt the panic of a man caught in a danger that is uncontrollable. The bow caught, the boat twisted and shuddered, and suddenly she was running amidst bubbling sea streaks beneath which the sand made a hissing noise as tons of beach were drawn backwards by the sucking water. Now! the boatswain shouted. Now, you heathens! And the bowmen were overboard, up to their knees in churning water and dragging the small boat towards the safety of the shelving beach. There, Major, that was easy, the boatswain said calmly. Sharp, trying not to show the terror he'd felt, stepped forward over the thwarts. The two remaining oarsmen, grinning at him, helped his unsteady progress. Another wave, breaking and running up the beach, lifted the boat and shifted it sideways, so that Sharp fell heavily onto a huge black man who laughed at the soldier's predicament. Sharp stood again, balanced himself at the prow, then leapt into the receding wave. No firm ground, no lush soil of the most peaceful village green in England had ever felt so good to him. He splashed to dry sand, breathing a silent thanks for safety, as at last his boots crunched the small ridge of seaweed shells and timber scraps that marked the height of the winter tides. Major! A voice hailed him. Lieutenant Ford, Bamfile's aide, walked through the clinging sand. Welcome ashore. You're precipitate, are you not, sir? Precipitate? Sharp, taking the rag off his rifle lock, had to shout over the noise of wind and surf. You had not been ordered ashore, sir. Ford spoke respectfully, but Sharp was certain the young lieutenant had been sent by Bamfile to deliver this reproof. The captain himself, resplendent in blue, white, and gold, directed affairs fifty yards down the strand. Let me remind you, Lieutenant, Sharp said, the proceedings ashore are under my command. The Comte de care, looking grey beneath the powder he had put onto his face, brushed at his cloak, then stumped through the sand towards Bamfylde. Ford glanced at the Comte, then back to Sharp. You can see, sir, the Lieutenant could not hide his embarrassment, that our Marines have had a miraculous recovery. Indeed. There must have been hundreds of Marines on the beach, and Sharp had seen at least another fifty march inland. The captain feels, Ford had carefully placed himself in a position that made it impossible for Sharp to walk towards Banfield, that we can safely look after the matter ourselves. He smiled as though he had brought splendid news. Sharp stared at the young, nervous lieutenant. The matter? Oh, the capture of the Teste de Bouche. Ford still smiled as if he could infect Sharp with his good tidings. Sharp stared at Ford. You're standing in my path, Lieutenant. Oh, uh, my apologies, sir. Ford stepped aside. Bamfar was greeting the Comte de Macaire with evident familiarity, but seeing Sharp approach, he gestured for the Frenchman to wait, then stepped briskly towards the rifleman. Morning, Sharp. Quite a clever one, what? Clever, sir. The weather. God smiles on sailormen. A gust of wind picked up particles of sand and rattled them against Sharp's tall boots. Lieutenant Ford, sir, tells me you don't require my services. A lot of the tested at Bush, certainly. One of our brigs quizzed a fisherman yesterday, Sharp. Seems the frogs have abandoned the ford. How about that, eh? There's a few fencibles left there, but uh, I can't see you need to bother yourself with that sort of scum. I think the prudent thing, Major, is for you to march inland. Inland, sir. Well, weren't you planning to ambush the high road? I want you back here with your report by the forenoon on Thursday. Is that clear? Sharp looked past the plump, confident Bamfile to see the Marines being paraded on the sand. They were in light order, having left their packs and greatcoats on the vengeance. They also seemed to be in fine fettle, and the sight angered Sharp. Your men made a miraculous recovery, Captain. Did they not, Major? 
Bamfald, in the heartiest of moods, smiled. A ruse de guerre, Major, you understand? Sharp contained his fury. A ruse, sir? Oh, we didn't want enemy agents in saint jean de Luz to suspect our plans. They'll have reported sick marines and a tiny force of soldiery. Scarce sufficient to run up a herd of sheep, let alone march on board her. Bamfald saw Sharp's disbelief and smiled at it. I've got more marines afloat, Sharp, if they're needed. To capture Bordeaux? Sharp's voice was mocking. If Macaro says it can be done, then we shall. He's riding direct to Bordeaux, Sharp. Brave fellow, what? Your advice will be invaluable, of course, but uh, Macro will be the judge of failure or success. Bamfald, on the brink of his triumph, was trying hard to be affable. Macro, sir. Ah, the Comte de Macaire. You mustn't use his nickname, Sharp. It's not polite. Bamfald laughed. But you're on the verge of great events, Major. You'll be grateful for this opportunity. Sharp's gratitude was lost in anger. Bamfald had lied consistently. He had wanted Sharp and the rifleman for his dreams of glory, and now, on a cold French beach, Sharp was exposed to the madness against which Elphinstone had warned him. I thought, sir, that the decision about Bordeaux was my responsibility. And we've spared you that decision, Major. You can't deny that de Macaire will be a more cogent witness. Bamfylde paused, sensing Sharp's anger. Well, naturally, I shall take your advice, Major. Bamfylde opened the lid of his watch, as if to demonstrate that Sharp was delaying his advance. Be back by Thursday, Major. That's when Macaro should bring us the good news from Bordeaux. Remember now, speed and surprise, Major. Speed and surprise. Bamfylde turned away, but Sharp called him back. Sir, you believe the fisherman? Bamfylde bridled. Is it your business, Sharp? Well, you'll send pickets ahead, sir. Bamfal snapped his watch lid shut. If I wish for lessons in the operations of military forces, Major, then I shall seek them from my superiors, not my inferiors. My boats will fetch your men now, Major Sharp, and I'll bid you good day. Bamfal walked away. He didn't need Sharp to capture the fort, so he wouldn't dilute his victory by having Sharp's name mentioned in the dispatch he would send to the Admiralty. That dispatch was already taking shape in Bamfal's head. A dispatch that would be printed in the Naval Gazette and tell, with a modesty that would be as impressive as it was transparent, of a fortress carried, of a bay cleared, and of a victory gained. But that small victory would be but a whisper compared to the trumpeted glory when Bordeaux fell. Thus Bamfal walked through the cloying, crunching sand, and his head was filled with dreams of triumph, and the sweeter dreams of victory's rewards that were fame and wealth beyond measure. Chapter 5 Cornelius Killick spat coffee grounds into the fire that had been lit beneath the pine trees. The wind was chill, but at least it wasn't raining, though Killick suspected the lull in the foul weather wouldn't last. Some of his men slept, some clenched muskets, others played cribbage or dice. They were nervous, but they took comfort from their captain's blithe confidence. Killick's confidence was a pretense. He was as nervous as any of his men, and regretting his impulsive offer to defend the fort's landward approaches. It was not that the American was afraid of a fight, but it was one thing to fight at sea, where he knew the meaning of every cat's paw on the water, and where he could use his skill at the Thuella's helm to run confusion about his enemies, and quite another to contemplate a fight on dry land. It was, as his Irish lieutenant would say, a horse of a different colour, and Cornelius Killick was not sure he liked the colour. He hated the fact that the land was such a clogging, cloying platform for a fight. A ship moved guns much faster than wheels, and there was nowhere to hide at sea. There, in the clean wind, a fight was open and undisguised, while here any bush could hide an enemy. Killick was keenly aware that he'd never trained as a soldier, nor even experienced a battle on land, yet he'd made the offer to Commandant Lasson, and so in this chill wind he was preparing to offer battle if the British Marines came. Yet if Cornelius Killick had doubts to plague his confidence, he also had compensating encouragements. With him were the six twelve-pounder guns that had been swung out of the Thuella's hold and mounted on their carriages. Their solidity gave Killick an odd comfort. The guns, so beautifully designed and yet so functional in their appearance, offered an implicit promise of victory. The enemy would come with muskets and be faced with these weapons that Napoleon called his beautiful daughters. 
They were Griebeval, 12 pounders, brute killers of the battlefield, massive. To serve those guns, Killick had 60 men, all of them trained in the use of cannon. The American knew well what fate the British might give to a captured privateer's crew, so Killick had not ordered his men to give battle, but had instead invited their help. Such was their faith in him, and such their liking for him, that only two dozen men had declined this chance. Thus Killick would be served this day by volunteers, fighters all. How, Killick asked himself, could impressed troops led by arrogant, dandified officers defeat such men as these? A wind stirred the pines and drifted the fire's smoke towards the village. No one was visible on the far ramparts of the fort, nor did any flag show. Maybe the bastards won't come today. Lieutenant Doherty poured himself some of the muddy coffee. Maybe not. Killick leant to the fire and lit a cigar. He felt a sudden pang that he should be forced to this unnatural fight or else lose his ship. He couldn't face losing the Thuella. But if they do come, Liam, we'll shock the bastards out of their skins. That was Killick's third advantage, that he had the surprise of ambush on his side. An hour later, the first message arrived from Point Arcachon. Killick had posted four scouts, each one mounted on a lumbering cart horse, and the news came clumping northwards that Marines had landed safely and were already advancing along the tangle of sandy tracks that edged the beach. Did they see you? Killick asked the gun captain who brought the message. No. The man was scornful of the Marines' watchfulness. Killick stood and clapped his hands. We're moving, lads. We're moving. The Fuelis crew had waited with the guns at a point midway between the beach paths and the inland road. Now Killick knew which route the British were taking, and so the guns had to be manhandled westwards to bar that route. Other messages came as the guns were shifted. A hundred and fifty Marines had landed. They had neither artillery nor horses, and all marched north. Other men had followed the Marines ashore, but they had stayed on the beach. The scouts, all four of them, came back to the ambush site. Henri Lassan had chosen the place and chosen well. The guns were sighted at the edge of a pine wood that topped a shallow ridge that jutted into a spreading, flat expanse of sand that edged the dunes of the beach. Two cottages had stood in the sandy space, but both had burned down in the last few years, and their charred remains were all that broke up the area across which the Marines must march. The gun emplacement also offered Killick's men protection. The twelve-pounders were shadowed by the pines, so that the grape shop would blast, obscene and sudden, out of the darkness into the light. And even if the Marines were to counterattack and brave the maelstrom of fire that would be slashing diagonally towards the sea, they must climb a crumbling bank of sand that was six feet high and steep enough to demand the help of hands if it was to be negotiated. Twenty men went back for the gun limbers, while the rest of Killick's men prepared the big guns for battle. The barrels had to be shifted on the carriages from their travelling position into the fighting stance. Then trunnions must be clamped with iron cap squares as powder and grape shot were rammed into cold muzzles. The grape shot was adapted from the stocks taken from the Thuella's magazine, and each canvas-wrapped bundle of balls would be propelled by four pounds and four ounces of French powder that came in a surge bag shaped to the cannon's breech. Vent prickers slid into touch holes to break the powder bags. Then tin tubes filled with finely mealed powder were rammed down to carry the fire to the charge. Killick stooped at the breech of one gun. He squinted through the tangent sights, set for point-blank range, then gave the brass handle of the elevating screw a quarter turn. Satisfied, he went to each of the other guns and stared down the sights to imagine the tangling death he would cause to flicker above the clearing sand. The gun's mute promise of terrible power gave Killick a welcome surge of confidence. The Commandant thanks you, Cornelius. Lieutenant Liam Doherty had warned Commandant Lasson that the British had landed. He wishes you joy of the meeting. Killick gave his swooping, bellowing laugh, as if in anticipation of victory. They'll not be here for six hours yet, Liam. He paused to light a cigar. But we'll kill the sons of devils when they do come, eh? We will indeed. For Liam Doherty, the coming battle would be one tiny shard of the vengeance he took on the British for their savagery in suppressing the rebellion of the United Irishmen. Doherty's father had been hanged as a rebel in Ireland, casually strung up beside a peat-dark stream with as little ceremony as might attend the death of a rabid dog. And the boy's mother, rearing him in America, would not let him forget. Nor did Liam Doherty wish to forget. He imagined the redcoats coming into the clearing 
and he relished the savage surprise that would be unleashed from the six gun barrels. Some villagers, made curious by the strange happenings to the south, had come into the trees to watch the Americans prepare. Cornelius Killick welcomed them. In the night he'd been besieged by fears, by imaginings of disaster. But now, when the shape of the enemy's approach was plain, and the skillful placing of his ambush apparent, he felt sure of success, and was glad that this victory would be witnessed by spectators. I wonder what they'd say in Marblehead if they could see us now, he said happily to Doherty. Liam Doherty thought that few people in Marblehead would be astonished by this new adventure of Killick's. Cornelius Killick had always had the reputation of being a reckless rogue. Maybe they'll name a street after you. A street? Why not rename the bloody town? Only one thing remained to be done, and that was done with a due solemnity. Cornelius Killick unfurled the great ensign that he'd fetched from the Thuella. Its thousand stripes had been sewn together by a committee of Marblehead ladies, then blessed by a Presbyterian minister who had prayed that the flag would see much slaughter of the Republic's enemies. This day, Killick promised himself it would. The flag, drooping in the windless space beneath the trees, would be carried forward at the first gunshot, and it would stand proud as the gunners worked and as the enemy fell. Cornelius Killick and the men of the Thuella were ready. The beach was strangely deserted when the Marines were gone. The wind was cold as Sharp's men tumbled uncertainly through the surf to drag their packs, greatcoats, and weapons to the dunes. One more boat, sir, Fredrickson said unnecessarily. Sharp grunted. The clouds had hidden the sun again, and he could see little inland through his telescope. On one far hill, a track seemed to wind uncertainly upwards, but there was no visible village or church that might correspond to the scanty map that Fredrickson spread on the sand. The captain said we were three miles south of Point Arcachon here. Sharp knew the map by heart and didn't bother to glance down. There are no roads eastwards. Our quickest route is up to Arcachon, then use the Bordeaux road. Follow the webfoots on the beach. Christ, no. Sharp didn't care if he never saw Bamfald again. We'll take the inland road. He turned. The Comte was standing disconsolate by the tide line, watching as his two horses, each given a long lead rope, were unceremoniously dumped overboard. The horses would have to swim now, tethered to the Amelie's boat, and the Count feared for their loss. Fredrickson still stared at the map. How are you going to stop Bamfald invading France? By refusing to believe that pranked up bastard, Sharp nodded towards the Frenchman. I should have heaved him overboard last night. I could have an accident with a rifle, Fredrickson offered helpfully. It was a cheerful thought for a cold morning, but Sharp shook his head before turning to watch a working party of riflemen wrestling supplies through the surf. We can jettison the bloody ladders, Sharp said sourly. He wondered how Bamfile proposed crossing the ditches and walls of the Teste de Bouche without scaling ladders, then dismissed the problem as irrelevant now. Sharp's job now was to go inland, ambush a military convoy on the great road that led southwards, and try to discover the mood of Bordeaux from the captives he would take. We'll split the supplies between the men, but we can't carry, we leave. Yes, sir. Fredrickson folded the map and pushed it into his pouch. You'll uh, leave the order of march to me. But Sharp didn't reply. He was staring at a group of seated riflemen who sheltered from the icy wind in a fold of the sand dunes. You! he bellowed. Come here! The riflemen's faces, bland with the innocence that always greeted an officer's anger, turned to stare at Sharp. But one man stood, shook sand from his green jacket, and started towards the two officers. Did you know? Sharp turned furiously on Fredrickson. No! Fredrickson lied. Sharp looked towards the man he'd summoned. You stupid bloody fool! Sir! Jesus Christ, I make you a bloody RSM, and what do you do? You throw it away! Patrick Harper's cheek was even more swollen from the toothache, and as though it explained all, he touched the swelling. That was this, sir. The reply took the wind from Sharp's anger. He stared at the huge Irishman, who gave him a lopsided grin in return. Your tooth? Sharp asked menacingly. 
I went to the surgeon to have the tooth pulled, so I did, sir. And he gives me some rum against the pain, so he does, sir. And I think I must have taken a drop too much, sir. And the next thing I know is I'm on a ship, sir, and the bastard still hasn't touched the tooth, nor has he, sir. And the only explanation I can possibly think of, sir, is that in my legally inebriated condition, some cane soul presumed I was one of the Captain Fredrickson's men had put me onto the Amelie. Harper paused in his fluent practice lie. That was the very last thing I wanted, sir. Honest. You lying bastard, Sharp said. Maybe, sir, but it's the truth, so help me God. Patrick Harper, delighted with both his exploit and explanation, grinned at his officer. The grin spoke the real truth, that the two of them always fought together, and Harper was determined that it should stay that way. The grin also implied that Major Richard Sharp would somehow avert the righteous wrath of the army from Harper's innocent head. So your tooth still isn't pulled? Sharp asked. That's right, sir. Then I'll damn well pull it now, Sharp said. Harper took a step backwards. He was four inches taller than Sharp's six feet, with muscles to match his size, while on his shoulders was slung a rifle and his fearful seven-barrel gun. But over his broad, swollen face there suddenly appeared a look of sheer terror. You'll not pull the tooth, sir. I damn well will. Sharp turned to Fredrickson. Buy me some pincers, Captain. Fredrickson's hand instinctively went to the pouch at his belt, he then checked. I'll, uh, ask the men, sir. Harper blanched. Lester Sharp, sir, please. Quiet! Sharp stared at the huge Ulsterman. In truth, he was relieved that Harper was here, but the army was the army, and the relief could not be betrayed. You're a damn fool, RSM. What about your son? He's a bit too young to fight yet, sir. Harper grinned, and Sharp had to look away so that he didn't return the grin. No pincers, sir. Fredrickson sounded disappointed, though Sharp suspected Sweet William had made no kind of real search for the implement. You'll want us underway, sir. Inland. Sergeant Harper. Sir. Attach yourself to Captain Fredrickson's company and assume whatever rank he sees fit to give you. Sir. Like beasts of burden, the riflemen shouldered packs, canteens, weapons, greatcoats, and supplies. They went eastwards into the trees, then northwards on the country road that straggled between the few marsh hamlets of this barren coast. It wasn't much of a road, merely a rutted cart track that wound between brush and pine and edged past great swamps where long-legged wading birds flapped slowly into the winter air as the riflemen passed. The green jackets marched fast, as they were trained to march, and always a quarter mile ahead, the pickets signalled back towards Sharp that the road was clear. It seemed strange to be this deep in France. This was the land of Bonaparte, the enemy land, and between Sharp and Bordeaux, indeed between Sharp and Paris, there were no friendly troops. A single squadron of enemy cavalry could cut this march into butcher's offal. Yet the Green Jackets marched undisturbed and unseen. If we go at this pace, Fredrickson said, we'll overtake the Marines. It had occurred to me, Sharp said mildly. The eye-patched man stared at Sharp. You're not thinking of taking... No, Sharp interrupted. If Bamfar wants to take the fort, he can. But if the map's right, we have to go close to Arcachon, so we might take a look at the fort before we turn eastwards. Patrick Harper carried the pickets, packs, and coats as punishment, but the extra weight made no difference to his marching pace. His tooth bothered him, and the pain of that was far and throbbing, but he had no other cares in the world. He'd followed Sharp because it was unthinkable to stay behind when Sharp went off on his own. Harper had seen that happen before, and the Major had nearly killed himself in Burgos Castle as a result. Besides, Jane Sharp, giving him the oil of cloves, had suggested he stowed away. Isabella had insisted he stay with the Major, and Captain Fredrickson had turned his blind eye to Harper's presence. Harper felt he was in his proper place, with Sharp and with a column of riflemen marching to battle. Their green jackets and dark trousers melded with the cloud-darkened pines. The 60th had been raised for just such terrain, the American wilderness, and Sharp, turning sometimes to watch the men, could see how well chosen the uniform was. At a hundred paces, an unmoving man could be invisible. For a moment, Sharp felt the sudden pride of a rifleman. The rifles, he believed as an article of his soldier's faith, were simply indisputably the finest troops in all the world. They fought like demons, 
and were made more deadly because they were trained, unlike other infantry, to fight independently. These men in danger would not look to an officer or sergeant for instruction, but would know, thanks to their training, just what to do. They were mostly squat and ugly men, toothless and pinched-faced, villainous and foul-mouthed, but on a battlefield they were kings, and victory was their common coin. They could fight, and they could march. God, but they could march. In 09, trying to reach the carnage of Talavera, the Light Division had marched 42 hilly miles in 26 hours and had arrived in good order, weapons primed and ready to fight. These men marched fast now. They did it unthinkingly, not knowing that the pace they unconsciously assumed was the fastest marching pace of all the world's armies. They were riflemen, the finest of the best, and they were going north to war. While to their west, on the less happy trails that edged the tumbled dunes, the marines faltered. It wasn't their fault. For months now, on a diet of worm-infested biscuit, rotting meat, foul water and rum, they had been immured in the forecastles of the great ships that weathered the Biscay storms. They weren't hardened to marching, and the sand they crossed gave treacherous footing and chafed their boots on softened skin. Their muskets, all of the heavy sea service pattern, seemed to grow heavier by the mile. Their chest straps, whitened and taut, constricted labouring lungs. It was a cold day, but sweat stung their eyes, while the muscles at the back of their legs burnt like fire. Some of the men were burdened by ropes and grapnel hooks that they would use to scale the fort's wall, instead of the long ladders that Bamfylde had deemed unnecessary for the marines. We shall call a halt. Captain Bamfylde didn't do it for the men's benefit, but his own. If they laboured, he suffered. His handmade boots had rubbed his right heel raw and raised blisters on his toes. The leather band of his bicorn hat was like a ring of steel, and his white breeches were cutting into his crutch like a sawhorse. The captain was regretting his intrepidity. He'd been eager to lead these men into battle. And that could not be done from the deck of the Vengeance any more than it could be done from the quarter-deck of the Scylla. That frigate, under Captain Grant, would nose into the Arcachon Channel to draw the fire of what few defenders might infest the fort's bastions. Once those defenders were occupied with the frigate, and while their gaze was fastened seawards, the marines would assault the empty landward ramparts. It was that assault which would capture the imagination of the British public when it was printed in the Naval Gazette, not the old story of a ship bombarding a battery. Captain of Marines Palmer saluted Bamfylde. We're behind time, sir. God damn it, Palmer, if I require your contribution, then I shall ask for it. Sir. Palmer was unmoved by Bamfylde's anger. Neil Palmer was ten years older than Bamfylde, and so experienced they worried by the petulance of yet another ambitious young captain, who resented the fame gained by Nelson's band of brothers. I'll put pickets out, sir. Do it! Bamfylde subsided against the trunk of a tree. He wanted to haul off his precious boots and dabble his sore feet in the shallows of the sea, but he dared not betray such weakness in front of his men. Water, sir. Lieutenant Ford offered a canteen. After you, Ford. Bamfylde knew such behaviour was proper, and he was a man eager to be seen to behave heroically in all things. He consoled himself that his discomfort was a small price to pay for the renown that he'd win this day. The marines might come late to the fortress, but the fortress would fall just the same, and the blisters on his feet would be forgotten in the blaze of glory. He opened his watch, saw they'd already rested ten minutes, but decided a few more minutes wouldn't hurt. He stretched out tired legs, tipped his hat forward and polished the news of victory that he'd write this night. While a hundred yards away, standing on a sudden rise of sandy soil that made a bare ridge through the thin pines, Captain Palmer stared at the countryside through a heavy ancient telescope. Far to the north, beyond the fading ridges of sand and conifers, a rainstorm misted the land like a vast curtain. The rain lifted for a brief instant and Palmer thought he saw the malevolent, dark shape of the fort hull down on the horizon. But as the rain closed again on his view, he couldn't be certain of what he had seen. He swung the glass inland. Two miles away, suddenly visible where the trees gave way to a stretch of marshy, glistening ground, he saw the tiny shapes of green-jacketed riflemen marching forward. Palmer was envious. He wished he was with them and not tied to Bamfar's apron strings. But then a bark of command from the dunes made him collapse his glass and turn back towards his men. We'll attack, Bamfile told Ford and Palmer, at dusk. Yes, sir. Both men knew that the Scylla had been ordered into the channel two hours before sundown, 
but there was no hope of meeting that rendezvous. They must just march, on blistering, aching feet, and be consoled that the night would bring them victory, supplies from the ships, and blessed rest in the shelter of a captured stronghold. In the Teste de Bouche, Commandant Henri Lasson told his beads, yet somehow couldn't shift from his thoughts, a line from an essay by Montaigne that he'd read the night before. It had said something about a whole man's life being nothing more than an effort to build a house of death, and he feared, without letting that fear affect his behavior, that the Teste de Bouche might be his house of death this day. He told himself that such fears were entirely natural in a man facing battle for the first time. He knelt in the tiny whitewashed chapel that in the early heady years of the revolution had been turned first into a temple of reason and then into a storeroom. The small red light of the eternal presence that Lassar himself had caused to be placed in this shrine when he restored it as a chapel took his thoughts back to prayer. If he should die today in this miserable damp fort on the edge of France, then that life was a sure promise of salvation. Beneath it a simple wooden crucifix stood on an altar that bore a frontal of plain white. It was an Easter frontal, used only because the fort had no other to put on the table beneath. Yet somehow the Easter promise of resurrection was comforting to Commandant Henri Lasson as he rose from his knees. He went into the courtyard. Rain had puddled the cobbles and streaked the inner walls dark. The fort seemed strangely empty. Lasson had sent the families of the garrison to the village so that no woman or child should be struck by enemy fire. The trickler that had not flown these past days was wrapped onto the halyard ready to be hoisted when the first cannon slammed back on its carriage. Sir? Lieutenant Gerard called from the western rampart. Lassan walked up the stone ramp that made it easy for heated shot to be carried from the furnace to the guns. Not that he had enough men left to tend the fire, but cold shot should be sufficient for any vessel that tried to brave the narrow, shoal-ridden waters of the channel. There, sir! The lieutenant pointed seawards, where, westering from the horizon, came a British frigate. The warship's new topsails were as white as the bone in her teeth that was flashing bright as the wind drove the boat towards the channel entrance. That's the frigate that pursued the Thuella, isn't it? Lassan asked. Yes, sir, Gerard said. Silla. Beyond the frigate were other ships. One, Lassan could see, was a ship of the line, one of the great vessels that had put a noose around the Emperor's conquests. Lassan would rather be pouring his shot into that great belly than into the frigate's slender and fragile beauty. But the Commandant would take what targets he could in this day's fight for God and the Emperor. Wait till she passes the outer mark. Sir. The Scylla moved closer. The gillwork of her figurehead gleaming, and Lassar knew the frigate had come to make him look one way while the marines came from his rear. But he had an American warrior hidden in the woods, and Lassar must put his trust in that unexpected ally. He knew that no marine could pass Killick without shots being fired, and even if the Americans were pushed back, then the noise of their battle would give Lasson a chance to man the ramparts by the fortress gate. For the moment, that rampart was only garrisoned by three sick men. If the Scylla's attack was timed properly, Lasson thought, then the Marines must be close. Lasson looked south, but could see nothing untoward beyond the village. Then he turned back seawards, in time to watch the frigate's flying jib shiver as it turned towards the channel. At the same time, the Scylla's great battle ensign unfurled from an upper yard. Lasson's men crouched by their guns. Their portfires seeped grey smoke into the air, and Lasson knew how dry their mouths were and how fragile their bellies felt. On the frigate's forepeak, he could see men clustered around the chasing guns. The officers on the quarterdeck, Lasson knew, would have donned their best uniforms in honour of their enemy, while deep in the frigate's bowels, the surgeon would be waiting by his razor-sharp scalpels. The fortress waited. A corporal stood by the flagpole ready at the first bellow of the guns to hoist the standard of France. A gull, wide wings still, rode the soft wind above the channel. Lassant imagined the red coats of marines in the Americans' gun sights, then forgot what happened to his south because the frigate's graceful profile was changing, and the white wave at her bows was cutting into the fretted, churning tide race of the channel. The frigate seemed to shudder as she met the full force of the Arcachon ebb. Then the bellying sails plunged her onwards, and the long-reaching spar of the Scylla's bowsprit bisected the tarred elm pole that marked the inner shoal, and Lieutenant Gerard's voice, harsh and proud, shouted the order to fire. 
The French gunners touched Port Bias de Vence, and the Battle of Arcachon had begun. Chapter 6 The bellow of the guns rolled like thunder over the rain-sodden land. Instinctively, without any orders, the rifleman knelt as if to shelter from artillery. Sharp ran. His metal scabbard flapped at his side. His rifle slipped from his shoulder to dangle at his elbow, and his pack thumped onto the small of his back. Sergeant Rossner, leading the small picket that spied the route ahead, was crouching by a straggle of firs that lined the roadside at the crest of a gentle rise. He gave a Germanic grunt, a sharp drop beside him, then a jerk of his half-shaven chin to indicate the source of the thunder. Not that Sharp needed any such indication. Darkly streaked smoke billowed from the landscape a mile and a half ahead, and to Sharp's left. Directly ahead of him, and reaching across the whole view, lay the silvered waters of the Arcachon Basin, made visible suddenly by this rise in the road. But Sharp stared only at the fortress, seemingly half buried in the encroaching sand and at the white sail frigate that coughed her own billow of whiter smoke to melble the fort's darker gusts. Marines, eh? The German sergeant showed his disgust by spitting onto the road. Sharp took out his telescope as Fredrickson crouched beside him. From this landward side, the Teste de Bouche fort looked hardly formidable. It was built low within its protective glacis of packed earth and sand, off which, as Sharp watched, the small shot of the frigate bounced like cricket balls. The smoke from the fort's guns drifted northwards, leaving the channel clear for the gunner's aim. Four guns only were working, but they were served with a quick skill that betrayed the presence of real gunners. God damn Bamfowl's fisherman, Sharp thought, for the Teste de Bush was lethal still. It was doing the cellar damage, while the frigate could make small impression on its massive walls. Sharp trained the telescope left. He paused as he saw a throng of people, drably dressed, then realized from the heavy skirts worn by most of the crowd that he watched the villagers, who in turn watched the uneven battle from the crests of the dunes beside the channel. Sharp looked further south, seeking the bright coats of the marines, then checked the glass again. He saw another small crowd of people, but these were not watching the frigate struggle, but instead seemed to be crowded at the edge of a group of dark pines. Some, a few, had strolled further north to watch the battle in the channel, but they had chosen a poor vantage point to witness a sight that must be rare in their harsh lives. Why? he spoke aloud. Sir? Fredrickson asked. Sharp was wondering why villagers, witnessing a contest that would be told to their grandchildren as a great happening in their village's history, chose such a strange place to watch the event. Most of the villagers had gone to the dunes seeking the best view, yet a sizable few were huddled there at the wood's edge. He stared at them, making out a shape beneath the tree shadows. William, that wood where the people are, tell me what you see. Fredrickson took the precious glass and trained it. He stared for twenty seconds, then shook his head. Mm, looks like a bloody limber. Doesn't it? Sharp took the glass back, and his guess, reinforced by Fredrickson's puzzled confirmation, saw more clearly the box shape slung between the high wheels. He had seen those objects before, the small carts that carried the ready ammunition to French guns. Bloody Bamfile, he said as he stared at the shape beneath the trees, has been wrong about everything. The fort is defended, they're not bloody militia, and I'll wager you a year's pay they've got a damned ambush waiting for the Webfoots. Sharp swept the telescope right again to look at the fort. He could just see the gunners working on the water bastion. Above them, sluggish in the falling breeze, the trickler was bright while closer, on the ramparts above the fort's gate, he could see no one. He lowered the glass a fraction. It was hard to tell from this low vantage point, but the approach to the fort seemed to go through a humped landscape of wind-drifted dunes. One thing was certain, which was that all French eyes were glued seawards. I think we ought to have a snap at it. Fredrickson grinned. No ladders. He mentioned it not to discourage Sharp, but to encourage a solution. Sharp raised the glass. They've kept the drawbridge down. Where the approach road crossed the inner ditch, a solid wooden bridge was suspended by chains. It led to a closed gate. The fact of the drawbridge being down reinforced Sharp's suspicion that another French force was hidden in the woods. If that force was pushed backwards by the Marines, then their horses would drag the field guns over the bridge and into the fort's safety. Sharp closed the telescope and slid the brass shutters over its lenses. What he planned was risky, even foolhardy. 
but the Marines marched into ambush, and the fort would never again be so unprepared for a surprise attack. Once the hidden field guns opened fire, then the garrison would know the enemy was at their rear, and men would hurry to the land defences and slide their muskets over the wall. The road ahead dropped to a stone mill that stood beside a small stream. Beyond that were pale, poor meadows where broken bars served a handful of thin cattle. Beyond that again were the masts of the coastal shipping huddled where another village, betrayed by smoke from its chimneys, lay at the basin's edge. The riflemen must cross the stream, slip through the scant cover of the meadows, then work their way into the sandy waste about the fort. Sharp smiled. To be truthful, I don't know how we get over the bloody wall. Knock on the front door, Fredrickson suggested. Sharp pushed his telescope into the tin box that protected it from harm, then into his pocket. Send two good men south to warn Bamfield. Then we go down the slope in small groups. Open order. Rendezvous at the first cattle shed. He had a growing suspicion that this was a task best left to a small group, a very small group. Sharp turned. Sergeant Harper? The huge Irishman, grinning with anticipation, loped up the road. Sir? You wanted to be killed, so come with me. Yes, sir. Sharp and Harper were going to war. The guns of the Teste de Bouche fired shot weighing 36 pounds, each shot propelled by 10 pounds and 2 ounces of black powder. The iron balls striking the sillar splintered oak like matchwood through cannon barrels off carriages and made carnage among the gun crews. They were deadly weapons that graced Lassan's semicircular water bastion. Each was mounted on a traverse and slide. The traverse was hinged at the embrasure in the fort's wall and wheeled at its rear so that the crew could swivel the whole gun to face anywhere within its designated arc of fire. The traversing wheels, iron-bound, had ground deep, semicircular grooves into the stone. For this battle, the guns were slewed right to fire southwest, and the Sans men had hammered iron pegs into holes drilled in the curving grooves so that the traverses, under the gun's recoil, didn't swing out of true. The recoil was soaked up by the slide. A field gun, or a gun aboard a ship, was mounted on wheels, and the hammer of the shot's explosion in the breach would drive the weapon fiercely backwards. After each shot, the crew must manhandle a gun forward again, aim it again, and all the time the crews were swabbing out and reloading. But not with these guns. Lassan's great weapons also had wheels, but the wheels fitted over wooden ramps that sloped up towards the rear of the traverse. The recoil slammed the guns backwards, and gravity ran them down into place again. And again. And again, and another thirty-six-pound ball of iron shivered the sillar as Lassan's monsters belched flame and smoke across the waters of the channel. The smoke of the guns drifted northwards, but in that strange phenomenon that all gunners knew and none could ever explain, the very firing of the guns seemed to still the wind. The smoke thickened before the embrasures, making a filthy-smelling fog that obliterated the target from the gunner's view. The blinding fog didn't matter. Henri Lassan had thought long about the science of gunnery, and had ordered white lines painted on the granite bastions. A similar pattern of lines were painted on the barracks roof, from where, unobstructed by the smoke, a sergeant watched the target and shouted out the alignment. Three! he bellowed, and three! the gun captain shouted and four handspikes wrenched the eye-pins from the drilled holes, and four other handspikes levered the traverses about until the iron wheel was flush with the white line marked with the numeral three. Then the pins were dropped into new holes, and the guns, despite the fog of war, hammered their shot with deadly accuracy. Two! The shout told Lassan that the target was moving, and he guessed correctly that the frigate was bearing away. He walked southwards, away from his gun smoke, to see the two-deck Vengeance raise her gun ports. That battleship was beyond Cap Ferrat and far beyond range. He watched. The great slab side, checkered black and white, disappeared in one great clap of smoke. But, as Lasson had suspected, the broadside fell uselessly into the sea. Keep firing! One! The sergeant shouted from the roof, and the crews levered at the vast guns as the boys ran up the stone ramp with more charges. A ball from the frigate rumbled overhead. Another struck the stone of the embrasure nearest Lassan with a crack that made his heart pulse warm fear through his chest. But most of the frigate shots were uselessly striking the seawall or glancing off the southern glasses. She's gone! the sergeant shouted. Cease fire! Lassan shouted, and the thunder ended suddenly. 
The smoke cleared with painful slowness to show that the frigate, sorely wounded, had gone south beyond the arc of the big guns. Lassar contemplated manning some of the twenty-four pounders on his southern ramparts, then saw the shot-torn foresails fill with air again, and knew that the British captain, under orders to keep the fort's gunners busy, was heading back into the channel. The sight of those torn sails and flying severed cables made Lassan think that some of his shots had been going high. Law the barrels, Lieutenant! Lassan wanted to pump his shots into that fragile hull. The Silla's guns were run out, ready to fire when the frigate wore, but the bow chasers, long lines, barked defiance. The balls cracked on the bastion stone, doing no damage. Then the sergeant on the barrack roof again had the enemy in his line of aim. One! the sergeant shouted. Fire! Gerard bellowed. The great barrels jerked back and up, the wheels rumbled as they rolled back down the slide, and the smoke that stank like rotten eggs pumped again into the cold air. Lassan's garrison might have been stripped to the bone. He might not even have crews for every gun, but he'd do his duty, and he'd show the British that an undermanned fork could still hurt them, and still by the grace of the good God, and in the service of the French Emperor, win battles. The handcarp was made of splintered, fragile wood that was held to uncertain unity by bent, rusted nails and with lashings of thin, frayed black twine. Some of the wheel spokes were broken. Sharp pulled the handcart out of the cattle bar and listened to the ghastly screech of the wooden axle that ran through two ungreased wooden blocks. He supposed that the carp was used to take hay from these meadows into the village, or perhaps bedding straw to the fort. But it had been abandoned through the frost months to lie in this bar, where the spiders had made thick webs on its spokes and handles. It could work. Sharp tested the small bed of the cart, and it seemed solid enough. Except we don't speak French. Sweet William, though, sir, Harper said. Then, seeing Sharp's face, corrected himself. Uh, Captain Fredericks and Crooks, Frog, sir. A group of armed men approaching a fort invited hostility. But two men, pushing a wounded comrade on a handcart, posed no threat. Jesus! Fredrickson's voice was awed when, arriving at the cattle bar, he heard Sharp's plan. We're supposed to walk up and ask for a bloody sawbones? You suggested knocking on the front door, Sharp said. So why not? The riflemen still drifted down the gentle slope. They came in scattered groups, spread out in the chain formation they would use in battle, and no alarm had been raised at the sight. Sharp doubted whether any Frenchman had even seen the dark shapes flit down the slope. Once on the lower ground, over the tiny stream and hidden by the ditches that were edged by straggling blackthorn hedges, the riflemen were invisible. The fort still thundered its huge noise. What we need, Sharp said, is blood. He was reckoning that the fort would not refuse entry to a mortally wounded man. But mortal wounds were usually foul with blood, and in search of it, both officers looked instinctively to Patrick Harper, who stared back with a slow and horrified understanding. No! Holy Mother, no! It has to come out, Patrick. Sharp spoke in a voice of sweet reason. You're not a surgeon, sir, besides. Harper's swollen face suddenly looked cheerful. Ha, there's no pences, remember? Sweet William unbuckled his pouch. The barber surgeons of London, my dear sergeant, will pay six shillings and six pence for a ten-ounce bag of sound teeth taken from corpses. You'd be surprised how many fashionable London ladies wear false teeth taken from dead frogs. Fredrickson flourished a vile-looking pair of pincers. They're also useful for a spot of looting. God save Ireland! Harper stared at the pincers. Captain Fredrickson smiled. You'll be doing it for England, Sergeant Harper, for your beloved king. Christ, no, sir! Strip to the waist, Sharp ordered. Strip! Harper had backed into the corner of the filthy bar. We need to have your chest soaked in blood, Sharp said, as though this was the most normal procedure in the world. As soon as the tooth's pulled, Patrick, let the blood drip under your skin. It won't take long. Oh, Christ and his heaven! Harper crossed himself. It doesn't hurt, man. Fredrickson took out his two false teeth and grinned at Harper. See? That was done with a sword, sir, not bloody pincers. We could do it with a sword, Sharp said it helpfully. Oh, Mary, Mother of God, Christ! Harper, seeing nothing but evil intent on his officers' faces, 
knew that he must mutiny or suffer. You'd be giving me a wee drink first. Brandy? Fredrickson held out his canteen. Harper seized the canteen, uncorked it, and tipped it to his mouth. Not too much, Fredrickson said. That's not your bloody tooth, with respect, sir. Fredrickson looked at Sharp. Do you wish to play the surgeon, sir? I've never actually drawn a tooth. Sharp, in front of the curious rifleman who had gathered to watch Harper's discomfiture, kept his voice very formal. Fredrickson shrugged. We should have a screw claw, of course, but uh, the pincers work well enough on corpses. Mind you, there is a knack to it. A knack? You don't pull. Fredrickson demonstrated his words with graphic movements of the rusted pincers. You push the tooth towards the jawbone, twist one way, the other, then slide it out. It's really not hard. Jesus! The big Irish sergeant had gone pale as rifle cartridge paper. I think, Sharp said it with some misgivings, that as Sergeant Harper and I have been together so long, I ought to do the deed. Push, twist and pull. Precisely, sir. It took five minutes to persuade and prepare Harper. The Irishman showed no fear in battle. He had gone grim-faced into the carnage of a dozen battlefields and come out victorious. But now, faced with the little business of having a tooth pulled, he sat terrified and shaking. He clung to Fredrickson's brandy as if it alone could console him in this dreadful ordeal. Show me the tooth, Sharp spoke solicitously. Harper eventually opened his mouth and pointed to an upper tooth that was surrounded by inflamed gum. There! Sharp used a handle of the pincers, and, as gently as he could, tapped the tooth. That one! Jesus Christ! Harper bellowed and jerked away. Bloody kill me, you will! Language, Sergeant! Fredrickson was trying not to laugh, while the other riflemen were grinning with keen enjoyment. Sharp reversed the pincers. The jaws, somewhat battered and rusted, were sawtooth for better purchase. It was a handy instrument, for burglary, and doubtless ideal for the procurement of false teeth from mangled corpses, but whether it was truly suitable for a surgical operation, Sharp could not yet say. It can't be worse than having a baby, he said to Harper, and Isabella didn't make this fuss. Women don't mind pain, the Irishman said. I do. Don't grip the fang too hard, Fredrickson observed helpfully, or you might smash it, sir. It's the devil of a job to fetch out the remnants of a broken tooth. I saw it happen to Jock Calloway before Salamanca, and it quite spoiled Jock's battle. You remember, Jock, sir? The 61st, Sharp asked. Died of the fever next winter, poor fellow. Fredrickson stooped to see what was happening. The word fever shot through Sharp's head like a death knell. But this was no time for such thoughts. Open your mouth, Sergeant. You'll be gentle. Harp's voice was sullen and mutinous. I will be as gentle as a newborn lamb. Now open your bloody gob. The huge mouth with its yellow teeth opened. The Irishman's eyes were wary, and a faint groan, half a moan, escaped as Sharp brought the pincers up. Slowly, very slowly, doing his utmost not to jar the offending tooth, Sharp closed the vicious jaws on that part of the tooth not hidden by the swollen gum tissue. That's not too bad, is it? he asked soothingly. He gripped the handles tight, but not too tight, and felt a faint tremor run through the huge man. Ready? He pushed upwards. He could smell Harper's breath and feel the rank fear from the man. He sympathized with it. Sharp had once had a tooth pulled in India, and he remembered the pain as vividly as any wound taken in battle. He pushed harder. The tooth didn't move, though Harper quivered as he loyally tried to push against Sharp's pressure. Harder, Fredrickson muttered. Sharp pushed harder. The metal jaws slipped up into the swollen gums, and the pincers were wrenched away as Harper bellowed and flailed to one side. Jesus on his bloody saints Christ! The sergeant had his hands to his mouth and was trickling blood. God in heaven! He was keening with a sudden agony. It slipped, Sharp said in apologetic explanation. Bloody near kill me! Harper swallowed more brandy then spat a potent mixture of blood and alcohol onto the ground. Jesus! Perhaps I should try, Fredrickson offered. Lieutenant Mimver, like his men, grinned. God damn all officers! All! Harper was in a blaze of anger now. Bloody murdering bastards! 
He picked up the pincers, opened his mouth and probed with a finger. He flinched. Sharp drew back. The rifleman, no longer laughing, watched as the huge, bare-chested man put the pincers over his own tooth. The big hand closed and Harper's blue eyes seemed to grow wider. He pushed and Sharp heard a distinct crack, like gristles snapping. Then the pincers were being twisted right and left. Harper was moaning and again there were the tiny sounds of tissue parting or bone grating. Sharp held his breath. No one moved. A French child of ten could have taken these prize troops captive at this moment, as the bare-chested harper, shaking with the pain and cold, began to pull. The Irishman's hand trembled. A bead of blood pulsed at his lower lip. Another, then in a great groan and a gush of pus and blood, the huge tooth tore free. Scraps of flesh were attached to its branching roots, but blood, bright red blood, was pouring onto Harper's chest in great rivulets that steamed in the cold air. Get him onto the wagon, Sharp ordered. Christ and there's oven! The pain had brought tears to Harper's eyes. He stood coughing blood, a fearful sight. He was weeping now, not out of weakness, but in anger and pain. He was blood smothered, steaming with warm blood, coughing blood, his face and chest soaked in blood. You shouldn't go. Fredrickson said to Sharp, meaning that it was foolish for the two senior officers to risk themselves at the same time. Sharp ignored the well-meant advice. Lieutenant Minver, as soon as we have the gate open, you charge. Swords fitted. Sir. The lieutenant, a thin dark man, smiled nervously. Harper lay on the cart, shivering. Take your men to the edge of the sand, Sharp said as he took off his pack, his officer's sash, snake buckle belt, his rifleman's jacket and his shako. Fredrickson was doing the same. Sergeant Rossner, you bring this equipment. Sir. Harper's seven-barrel gun, loaded and primed, was put beside the Irishman's blood-stained right hand. His rifle was on the left side of the cart, where Sharp's sword, drawn from the scabbard, lay easily to hand. Sharp wanted to give the impression of three men bringing the victim of an accident from the ambush party. Yet success depended on the French guards seeing only the dreadful blood on Patrick Harper. Harper, lying belly up on the cart, was in danger of choking on his own blood. He spat a thick gob, turned his head and spat again. Spit onto your chest, don't waste it, Sharp said. Harper growled in mutiny, then spat a satisfying lump of blood down to his navel. Sharp took one handle of the cart, Fredrickson the other, and Sharp nodded. Move. The firing from the fort had stopped which meant, Sharp knew, that either the frigate was out of range or else was sinking. There was no sound from the ambush site. The cart screeched foully on the rough track that led past scrawny alders towards the Teste de Bouche. Far away, over the houses and beyond the dunes, Sharp saw a shiver of white, which he knew must be the frigate's topsails, then heard a bellow of thunder and saw a blossom of smoke which told him Grant had opened fire again. Captain Grant, at least, was doing his duty. Even at the cost of his ship and men, he was drawing the fort's fire, and his success was measured by the sudden clap of thunder as the huge fortress guns opened their own fire again. The cart axle screeched fit to wake the dead, bounced on the uneven road, and Harper groaned. His right hand, streaked with bloody rivulets, groped for his seven-barrel gun, and Sharp, seeing the movement, knew the huge Irishman was recovering. Well done, Sergeant. I don't mean to be rude to you, sir. Harper choked on blood as he said the words. Yes, you did, Fredrickson cheerfully answered for Sharp. So would any man. Now shut up. You're supposed to be dying. Patrick Harper said nothing more as the cart slewed round a corner, over a muddy rut, and up onto the harder track that led straight to the bridge over the forts in a ditch. The wind gusted, bringing the stench of powder smoke in its cold touch. No sound came from the south, and Sharp knew the marines were still far from Arcachon. If the sitter was to be saved from further punishment, then the rifles would have to do the job. They were already within cannon range of the fort, but no gunners stared from the deep embrasures. Run, Sharp said. Run as if he's dying. He is, Harper groaned. Sharp had to push hard to keep up with Fredrickson's pace, and he saw a head appear on the fortress wall. He saw the trickler lift to the smoke-fouled wind. Then Sweet William beside him was shouting in breathless French, and Sharp knew it was madness for three men to take on one of the coastal forts of Maiden France. But he was committed now, inside musket range, and all they could do was push on, pray, then fight like the soldiers that they were. The best. 
Chapter 7 They stopped ignominiously on the sand-gritted planks of the drawbridge. The gates didn't open. They could go no further. And Sharp and Fredrickson, chests heaving and breath misting into great plumes from the effort of pushing the obstinate cart with Harper's weight, could only stare up at a puzzled face which appeared on the ramparts. Fredrickson shouted to the sentry in French. An answer was made. And Harper, fearing a sudden musket blast from above, groaned horribly on the cart. The blood on his huge chest was drying to a cracked crust. He wants to know, Fredrickson spoke to Sharp with astonishment in his voice, whether we're the Americans. Yes! Sharp shouted. Yes, yes! Attende! The guard's head disappeared. Sharp turned to look through the notch made where the approach road cut through the glasses. He stared at the place where the villagers stood by the trees, and where he dimly discerned the shape of a gun's limber among the pines. The Americans are manning those guns? He too sounded astonished. Fredrickson shrugged. Must be. Sharp turned back, his boots making a hollow sound on the thick planks of the drawbridge. To right and left the flooded inner ditch stretched. The ditch water, fed by a rivulet from the mill stream, seemed shallow enough, but it would still be a cloying obstacle to men trying to assault the gaunt, rough-faced wall of the fort on sand. The fortress guns bellowed to Sharp's left, jetting smoke and flame towards the frigate that was now beyond Cap Ferrat. The battle had become a long-range duel as Grant teased the fort, and doubtless cursed the land force for their late arrival. What's that crap old bastard doing? Harper growled softly. Gone to fetch the officer of the guard? Sharp guessed. Harper shivered. The light was dying in the west. A cold evening promised frost in the night, and the huge Irishman was stripped to the waist. Not long now, Sharp said, the words spoken more in nervousness than for comfort. Suddenly a bolt clanged, scraped, then a bar thudded to the ground from its brackets. Christ! Fredrickson's voice betrayed relief that their ruse, so quickly devised, and then made possible by Harper's pain, was working. Wait for my word, Sharp said it softly as he saw Harper's muscles beneath their crazed and shivering quilt of dry blood suddenly tense. The hinges of the gate squealed like a tormented soul. Lieutenant Minver, two hundred yards away, would see the huge door leafing open and should already be moving. Now, Sharp said. The French guard was eager to help the wounded man. The guard himself was injured, his legs setting in plaster, and he gestured at the cast as if to explain the slowness with which he tugged the huge iron studded gate open. Harper, rolling from the cart, didn't see the thick plaster on the man's leg, nor did he see the welcoming, reassuring smile. He only saw a man in an enemy jacket, a man who barred a door that must be opened. And Harper came up from the roadway with a sore bayonet in his right hand, and the Frenchman gave a horrid, pathetic sigh as the twenty-three-inch blade held like a long dagger ripped into his belly. Sharp saw the blood spilling like water on the cobbles of the archway as he pushed his full weight onto the half-opened gate. Harper twisted the bayonet free and left the guard bleeding and twitching on the drawbridge. He kicked the man's musket into the ditch, then fetched his rifle and seven-barrel gun from the cart. Fredrickson, sword in hand, dragged the empty handcart into the tunnel that pierced the ramparts. No one had seen them. No one raised the alarm. They had taken the garrison utterly by surprise. Sharp bolted both doors open. His rifle was slung, his sword naked, and at any second he expected a shout of alarm or a musket shot. But the three riflemen were undetected. They smiled at each other, made nervous by success. Then their ears were punched by the shattering pulse of air as the fortress guns fired towards the Scylla. Harper hefted his seven-barrel gun. I'll teach those bastards how to fire guns. Sergeant, Sharp called, but Harper was already running gun-cocked towards the courtyard. A shout sounded from the sand dunes, and at the same instant two muskets coughed above Sharp. He realized there must be other guards on the gate's roof, men who could see Mimber's assault approaching, and Sharp looked for a route that would take him to the ramparts. A low, arched doorway lay to his right, and he ducked through it. He found himself in a guard room. A wooden musket rack, varnished and polished, held eight muskets upright. A table was littered with playing cards before a black-leaded, pot-bellied stove that silted smoke from an ill-fitting chimney pipe. Stairs climbed through an arch on the far side of the room, and, exchanging his sword for the rifle, Sharp took the steps at a rush. 
he could hear above him the rattle of ramrods in barrels. The stairs turned a right angle. The sky was grey overhead. Then a moustached face, just ten feet away, turned towards the sound of feet on the stairs, and Sharp pulled the rifle's trigger and saw the man twitch backwards. More blood. A movement to his left as he cleared the stairs made Sharp twist round. A second man was desperately pulling a ramrod free of his musket's long barrel. Then, seeing that he couldn't free his weapon of the encumbrance, the Frenchman just raised the gun to his shoulder. Sharp fell and rolled to his right. The musket banged and flamed, and the ramrod, which could have impaled Sharp like a skewer, cartwheeled across the inner courtyard to clang against the stone ramp. No! No! The man was backing away now, as Sharp unscathed rose from the stones with his sword in his right hand. No! The guard dropped his musket, raised his hands, and Sharp accepted the man's surrender by the simple expedient of tipping him over the ramparts into the flooded ditch twenty feet below. Mimber's riflemen, pouches, scabbards, canteens and horns flapping as they ran, were on the road now, the fastest men already close to the glasses. Sharp turned towards the sound of the fortress guns. He could see an empty wall on which vast, cold guns stood mute. At the wall's end was a small stone citadel, little more than a covered shelter for sentries, and beyond that was a semicircular bastion that jutted into the waters of the Arcachon Channel, and from which the heavy guns fired. The French artillerymen, stunned, deafened, and half-blinded by their own firing, had still not seen the small slaughter at the gate. They swabbed and charged their vast weapons, intent only on the frigate that dared to defy them. Then a voice screamed defiance at them. Some turned, the others, losing the rhythm of their tasks, twisted to see what had interrupted the work. Patrick Harper had shouted at them in a voice that would have silenced hell itself. A voice that had called battalions to order across the vast spaces of windy parade grounds, and the gunners stared with astonishment into the courtyard below, where a blood-bolted giant seemed to hold a small cannon in his hands. Bastards! Harper screamed the word, then pulled the seven-barrel gun's trigger. The half-inch balls frayed up and out, fanning to strike the left-hand gun crew. Two men fell, then Harper dropped the massive gun and unslung his rifle. Patrick! Sharp had seen a Frenchman on the barrack roof who knelt carbine in hand to aim downwards. Cover! Harper rolled right, looked up, and ran. A French officer commanding the big gun battery stared at the blood-streaked giant, then to Sharp, and the rifleman saw the look of sheer surprise on the thin, pale face. Fredrickson, sword in hand, was crossing the yard, careless of the carbine above him, and shouting to the gunners to surrender. The French officer suddenly jerked, as though waking to find a nightmare real and shouted at his men to forsake their cannons and snatch their carbines from racks beside the embrasure. Sharp had forgotten how French gunners carried long arms, and he bellowed at Fredrickson to take cover, then saw the flicker of movement as the Frenchman on the roof changed aim. Sharp twisted away, knowing the shot was aimed at himself. He had a glimpse of the foreshortened stab of flame with its aureole of smoke, then the carbine ball slashed across his forehead. One half-inch closer, and he would have been dead killed by fragments of skull driven into his brain, but instead he staggered, stunned, and his vision was suddenly sheeted with scarlet as he twisted, fell, and heard the sword clang as it bounced on the rampart stones. His head felt as if a red-hot poker had been slashed across his face. He was blind. A pitiless stab of pain lanced in his head, making him moan. The blindness was making him panic, and his dizziness wouldn't let him stand. He slumped against the wall and tasted thick, salty blood on his tongue, he scrabbled vainly for his fallen sword. A French shout of command made him turn his face left, but he could see nothing. Carbines fired, a ball fluttered overhead, another slapped the wall beside him. Then a baker rifle's quick crack, that Sharp had heard a million times before, sounded to his right, and he could hear the scrape of boots on stone as the rifleman came into the courtyard. Another crack, a scream, and another baker rifle had found a victim. Then Fredrickson was shouting orders. A volley splintered the dusk, sparking pricks of flame from rifle muzzles. Then half the green jackets went forward, their comrades covering them, and the long saw bayonets were carried up the stone ramp, and Sharp heard them cheer and knew that the fort was taken. He was blind. Slowly, fearfully, Sharp raised a hand to his throbbing head and gouged at his right eye. He scraped blood away and saw a shimmer of light. His eyes were thick with blood, sealed by it, 
and he spat on a filthy hand and scraped at the gore to clear his right eye, and dimly saw Fredrickson's men scarring the water bastion with their bayonets. He felt a pang of relief, clear as spring water, that he could see. He could see the enemy leaping from the embrasure, abandoning fort and guns, and he saw a shot from the cellar that had been firing vainly for ninety minutes take the head from a rifleman on the western ramparts. The body, streaming blood like a squirting wine bag, tumbled down onto the courtyard's cobbles. Get the flag down! Sharp bellowed it. He was on his hands and knees, blood soaking his shirt and threatening to close his right eye again. The flag! Lieutenant Minver, understanding, cut the halyard with his sword so that the trickler fluttered down. That would stop the Silla's guns. Close the gate! Sharp shouted again, and the effort lanced such quick agony through his skull that he sobbed. He shook his head, trying to clear the pain, but it pulsed like a needle of fire behind his eyes. A massive volley sounded to the south, and Sharp, his head hurting with every move, twisted round to see the blossom of smoke from the grove of trees. Captain Fredrickson! Captain Fredrickson! Fredrickson took the stairs to the upper rampart three at a time. Jesus! He stooped beside Sharp and tried to wipe the blood away from his face, but Sharp, still on his hands and knees, twisted away. Members, come for to the ramparts. Take yours and clear those damned American guns. He saw Fredrickson hesitate. Go! Fredrickson went and Sharp, the pain suddenly dreadful, realized that the Scylla had ceased fire and that the field guns had ended their fusillade. He leant against the wall, closed his good eye and let the pain come. He had captured a fort. Cornelius Killick could have happily taken Nicolas Leblanc and wrung his damned French neck. It was Leblanc's factory at Saint-Denis near Paris that manufactured the potassium nitrate that was mixed with charcoal and sulphur to make gunpowder. It was not that Cornelius Killick had ever heard of Nicolas Leblanc, but the American knew powder, and he knew the instant that his guns fired that French powder was fit only for July the 4th firecrackers. The potassium nitrate, saltpeter, was at fault. For that again, Killick could not know. But he did know when a gun coughed instead of banged. He had charged the guns as he would his own guns, and as if he was using American powder, but he should have elevated the guns to compensate for the poor quality of the charges. He had elevated the barrels slightly, knowing that the first shots fired through cold metal would go low, but he could never have guessed how low. The first blast of grape shot, instead of taking the red-coated marines in a storm of metallic death, spattered into the sand. Some of the balls bounced upwards, but Killick did not see a single body struck by grape. Killick swore, for his troubles multiplied. The bastards must have known he was there. He had seen the first red jackets ten minutes before, and waited for them to march unsuspecting into the clearing, but instead they had lined the trees at the far side, and Killick, tired of the delay, had fired his opening volley at that tree line and he'd wasted it. He swore again. His men were sponging out, ramming and levering the guns back into their positions. A British musket fired, and Killick heard the ball flicker through the pines above. Then more flames stabbed from the shrubs at the clearing's far side, and the musket balls thudded into the sandy bank, or thumped on trees, or rained pine needles down onto the gunners. Killick ran left. If the marines were to attack him, they would come this way, flitting through the trees, and the dusk would make their scarlet coats hard to see. He shouted at the left-hand gun to slew round and cover the approach, then stared into the gathering darkness. He could see nothing. Cornelius Killick was nervous. His men were nervous. This was not warfare as he knew it. Killick's war was out where the wind gave the advantage to the better man, and where the dead went to the cleansing sea. It was not in this damn veil of shadows where the enemy could skulk and hide and creep and murder. A twig cracked. He twisted, but it was only Marie from the village who stared with huge, worried eyes at him. Go back! Killick barked. The thought, Marie said. What about it? Killick was searching the southern shadows, watching for the flicker that might betray an enemy movement. The flag's gone, Marie said. Shot away, Killick said, then ignored the girl's news because British muskets sparked and the far tree line was puffed with clouds of powder smoke. Go back, Marie, back! Some of the Thuella's crew fired back, using the French muskets that were sold so widely in America. If only the bastards would show themselves, Killick thought. Then his six guns could tear the guts out of them. Liam! Liam! he shouted. Sir? You see anything? 
Killick ran through dead pine needles towards his main battery. Only their bloody smoke! Bastards won't show themselves! A soldier, Killick thought, would know what to do at this point. Perhaps he should throw men into the trees, cutlasses and muskets ready. But what good would that do? They would simply become meat for the Marines' muskets. Perhaps, he thought, another volley would stir the bastards up. Liam, aim high and fire! Sir! The brass elevating screws returned, and the port fires touched vent tubes, and the fire slipped down to the coarse powder that hammered more grape shot to slice into the undergrowth across the clearing. A bird squawked and flapped heavily away from the shredded trees, but that was the only visible result of the volley. Smoke drifted over the clearing. Good sense told Cornelius Killick that this was the moment to run like hell. He had lost his greatest weapon, surprise, and he risked losing much more. But he was not a man to admit failure. Instead, he imagined victory. Perhaps he thought the bastards had gone. No muskets fired across the clearing now, no redcoats moved, nothing showed. Perhaps, astonished and shredded by the volleys of grape, the yellow-bellied bastards had turned and run. Killick licked dry lips, testing the surprising thought, and decided it must be the truth. We've beaten the bastards, lads! Not these bastards, you haven't. Killick turned with the speed of a snake, then froze. Standing behind him was a one-eyed man whose face would have terrified an imp of Satan. Captain William Fredrickson, in grim jest, always removed his eye patch and false teeth before a fight, and the lack of those cosmetics, added to the horror that was his eye socket, gave him the face of a man come from a stinking and rotting grave. The rifle officer's voice, Killick noticed in stunned astonishment, was oddly polite, while behind him, and moving with fast confidence, Green-jacketed men, whose guns were tipped with long brass-handled bayonets, slipped between the trees. Killick put a hand to his pistol's hilt, and the one-eyed man shook his head. It would distress me to kill you. I have a certain sympathy for your republic. Killick gave his opinion of Fredrickson's sympathy in one short and efficacious word. It's the fortune of war, Fredrickson said. Sergeant Rosner, I want prisoners, not dead uns. Sir. The rifleman, taking the Americans from the rear, and coming so unexpectedly with weapons ready, gave the Thuella's crew no chance to fight. Doherty drew his sword, but Taylor's bayonet touched the Irishman's throat, and the feral eyes of the rifleman told the lieutenant just what would happen if he raised the blade. Doherty let it fall. Some of Thuella's crew, unable to retreat into the clearing that was covered by the Marines' muskets, dropped their weapons and ran to shelter with the startled villagers. Who the hell are you? Killick asked. Captain Fredrickson, Royal American Rifles, you're supposed to offer me your sword. Killick succinctly gave his view of that suggestion, and Fredrickson smiled. I can always take it from you. Do you command here? What if I do? Killick's truculence only made Fredrickson more patient. If you want to fight, my lads, then I assure you they'll welcome the chance. They've been fighting for six years, and about the only consolation our army offers to them is the plunder from dead enemies. Shit, said Killick. There was no fight to be had, for the riflemen were already herding his gun crews back. One of the green-jacketed bastards, the one who had taken Liam Doherty prisoner, was folding the stars and stripes into a bundle. Some of his men, Killick saw, were edging away with the villagers, but they'd abandoned their weapons so as not to be taken for combatants. Cornelius Killick felt the impotence of a sailor doomed to fight out of water. He could have wept in anger and impotence, and for the shame of seeing his flag taken. Instead, clinging to a shred of dignity, he plucked his sword from his scabbard and offered it hilt first to Fredrickson. If you'd fought me at sea, Killick began, I would be your prisoner. Fredrickson politely finished the sentence. And if you give me your word that you'll not attempt to escape, then you may keep your sword. Killick dutifully slid the blade back into its scabbard. You'll have my word. Fredrickson took a silver whistle from the loop on his crossbelt and blew six blasts on it. Just to let our web-footed friends know that we've done their job. He opened his pouch and took out an eye patch and false teeth. You'll forgive my vanity, Fredrickson asked as he tied the eye patch in place. Shall we go back now? Back? Well, to the fort, of course. As my prisoner, I can assure you that your treatment will be that of a gentleman. Killick stared at the rifleman, whose face, even with patch and teeth restored, was hardly reassuring. Cornelius Killick expected a British officer to be a supercilious poltroon, all airs and graces and high-spoken delicacies, 
and he was somewhat shaken to be faced with a man who looked as hard-bitten as this rifleman. You give me your word we'll be treated properly? Fredrickson frowned as though the question were indelicate. You have my word as an officer. He smiled suddenly. I can't speak for the food tonight, but doubtless there'll be wine in abundance. This is, after all, the Medoc, and the harvest was good this year, or so I believed, Sergeant. He gave a shrug of apology to Killick for thus turning away. Leave the guns to the Webfoots. Back to the fort. Sir. Cornelius Killick, who had hoped to be as successful on land as he was at sea, had met a rifleman, and all he could do was light a cigar and console himself that, for a sailor, there was no disgrace in being bested ashore. But it irked all the same. God, how it irked! And the Arcachon Basin, in which the Thuella was stranded, had fallen. Henri Lassan, seeing his men cornered in their bastion, and recognising the import of the feared green jackets and their long glittering bayonets, had known there was no future in fighting. Over! Over! He pointed over the bastion and down to the strip of wind-drifted sand that edged the fort's western ramparts. Here, on the fort's seaward-facing flank, there was no flooded ditch, for the tidewater was better than any moat, and his gunners leapt from the embrasure to tumble heavily on the sand. Lassan, as he jumped, felt a sudden keen pang for the loss of his books. Then the wind was driven from him by the jar of his landing. Two of his men twisted their ankles, but they were safely helped into the dune's cover, from where, the wounded men assisted by their comrades, Lassan led his men north. Two rifle bullets followed them, but a bark of command ordered the ceasefire. The fortress had fallen, not to marines, but to green jackets, and Lassan wondered how they'd come so silently, and how they'd pierced the defences without his knowledge. But that was useless speculation today, when he'd failed in his task. He had lost the Teste de Bouche, but he could yet frustrate his enemy. He supposed they'd come for the Chasse Marais, and Lassan, stumbling in the clawing sand, would go to the Moulot and there burn the boats. Falling night brought cold rain to pit the sand with tiny dark craters. The track wound through dunes past discarded fish traps and the black ribs of rotted boats. The fishing village lay two miles north, and Lassan could see the dense tangle of masts and yards where the chasse marais had been moored by his orders. The owners of the boats mostly lived aboard, waiting and grumbling until they could be released back to their trade. Vestiges of cannon smoke sifted north with Henri Lassan. The tide, he saw, was turning. Tiny waves rolled over the beds where mussels and oysters thrived. No more would the women bring him the flat baskets of shellfish and stop to gossip about the prices in the Arcachon town market or to whisper with pretended shock of the bedtime exploits of the American captain. Lassan wondered what had happened to Killick, but that speculation was as useless as wondering how the Teste de Bouche had fallen. Commandant Henri Lassan, sword at his waist and pistol in his belt, had a task to do, and he went north in the gathering darkness to perform it. And at Le Moulo, the Chasse Marais crews mutinied. They gathered outside the white-painted customs house, disused these many years because of the Royal Navy blockade, but still manned by two uniformed men who opened their heavy door to listen to the commotion outside. Behind the crews were the wooden pilings that edged the sheds where the shellfish were broken open and where the murmur swelled into an angry protest. The ships were their livelihoods. Without the ships they would starve, their children would starve, and their women would starve. Lassan's men, embarrassed by their predicament, stared at the ground. Torches flared in brackets on the customs house facade, casting a red light on angry faces. Rain spat from the south. Lassan, a reasonable and kind man, raised his hands. My friends! He explained why the boats were needed how the English would use the craft to make a bridge or to land their army north of the Adour. What of your children then? What of your wives, eh? Tell me that. There was silence, except for the running of the tide and the hiss as rain hit the torches. The faces were suspicious. Lassan knew that the French forces were disliked by the French peasantry, for the Emperor had decreed the French troops could take what rations they wanted and not pay for them. Lassan himself had refused to obey that decree, for the disobedience had been funded from his own pocket. Some of these men knew that, knew that Lassan had always been a decent officer, but still he threatened them with hunger. The English, a voice shouted from the anonymity of the crowd, are offering twenty francs a day, twenty! The murmur started again, grew, and Lassan knew he would have to use force to keep these men from interfering with his duty. 
He had tried reason, but reason was a feeble weapon against the cupidity of peasants. So now he must be savage in his duty. Lieutenant Gerard. Sir, you will fire the boats. Start at the southern moorings. A jeer went up, and Lassant instinctively reached for his pistol, but his sergeant touched his arm. Sir, the sergeant's voice was sad. A creak sounded, then another. There was the squeak of an oar in its foe. Then there were splashes, and Lassant could see in the darkness the white marks of blades touching water. He still watched, and in the glistening darkness, where the torchlight touched the water into ripples, he saw the ghostly shapes of white-painted boats. On the flowing tide, the British had rowed up channel, and Lassant, listening to the ridicule of his countrymen, saw the blue-jacketed sailors, cutlasses in their hands, swarming from their longboats onto the chasse marais. The French crews, welcoming English gold, applauded. Lassant turned away. We go east, Lieutenant. Sir. Henri Lassant, with his little band of gunners, stumbled away from the village. He would follow the Arcachon on southern shore, then head inland to Bordeaux to report to his superiors that he had failed, that Arcachon was lost, and that the British had taken their boats. And thus, the Battle of Arcachon, that had begun with such high hopes for its defenders, ended in a rain-cold night of bleak defeat. Chapter 8 Five French dead and one dead rifleman were laid in the fort's chapel, not out of reverence, but simply because it was the most convenient place for the corpses to lie until there was time to bury them. Lieutenant Minver stripped the white frontal from the altar and ordered two of his men to tear it into strips for bandages. Then, being a well-trained young man, who had been told constantly by his parents never to leave a light burning in an empty room, he pinched out the flame of the eternal presence before going back to the courtyard. The teste de bouche was in chaos. Riflemen manned the ramparts, while marines and sailors seethed in the courtyard. The six field guns, with their limbers, had been dragged into the fort, where they were the objects of much curiosity to the seamen. The Scylla, her flanks riven by the heavy shot, was moored beneath the silent guns. The marines' packs and supplies were being ferried from a brig anchored below the Scylla, then slung over the fort's wall by a system of ropes and pulleys. The marines had marched in light order, but had still reached the fort two hours after Sharp's riflemen. I must thank you, Major Sharp. Captain Bamfile limped on blistered feet into the room where Sharp was being bandaged by a naval surgeon. Bamfile flinched at the sight of so much blood on Sharp's face and shirt. My dear fellow, permit me to say how sorry I am. The surgeon, a drunkard of morose disposition, answered in place of Sharp. It's nothing, sir. Head wounds bleed like a stuck pig. He finished the bandaging and gave Sharp's head a light buffet. I warrant you've got a head like a bloody bass drum, though. If the man meant painful, then he was right, and the friendly tap had not helped. But at least Sharp's sight had come back as soon as the blood was washed from his eyes. He looked up at Bamfylde, whose young, plump face looked tired. The fort wasn't exactly deserted. So it seems. Bamfylde crossed to the table and examined a bottle of wine abandoned by the French garrison. He plucked out the cork and poured a little into a convenient glass. He smelt it, swelled it around, examined it, then sipped it. Mmm, very nice. A trifle young, I'd say. He poured more wine into the glass. Still, no bones broken, eh? I lost one man dead. Bamfylde shrugged. Scylla lost sixteen. He said it as if to show that the Navy had taken the greater punishment. And the Marines? Sharp asked. Two men were scratched, Bamfile said airily. I always thought that clearing was the most likely place for an ambuscade shot. If they want to catch the likes of us, sir, they'll have to show a livelier leg one. He laughed. Bamfile was a lying bastard, Sharp thought. The two riflemen sent by Fredrickson had warned the Marines of the field guns, and Marine Captain Palmer had already thanked Sharp for the service. But Bamfile was speaking as though he had both detected and defeated the ambush, whereas the bloody man had done nothing. Bamfile finished the wine. Some of the Americans escaped. He made the question sound like an accusation. So I believe. Sharp didn't care. Bamfile had thirty American prisoners to send to England, and surely that was enough. The fort was taken, seamen from the Scylla had gone up channel to find the Chasse Marais, and no man could have expected more of the day. So you'll go inland in the morning, Sharp. Bamfile peered at Sharp's head wound. That's only a scratch, isn't it? 
Nothing to slow your reconnaissance. Sharp did not reply. The fort was taken. Elphinstone would get the extra chasse he needed, and the rest of the operation was farcical. Besides, he didn't care whether Bordeaux was seething with discontent or not. He only cared that Jane should not die while he was away. Sharp twisted round to look at the surgeon. What's the first symptom of fever? The surgeon was helping himself to the wine. A black spot, yellow, swamp, Valkyrie, witch fever. Any fever, Sharp growled. The surgeon shrugged. Ah, uh, heated skin, uncontrolled shivering, the looseness of the bowels. I can't say you have any pyretic symptoms yourself, Major. Sharp felt a horrid dread. For a second he felt a temptation to claim that his wound was incapacitating, and to demand that he was returned to Saint-Jean-de-Luz by the first ship. Well, Sharp? Bamfarb was offended that Sharp had ignored his questions. You will be marching inland? Yes, sir. Sharp stood. Anything rather than endure this bumptious naval captain. Sharp would march inland, ambush the road, then return and refuse to have any further part of Bamfarb's madness. He knew he should dry his sword if it was not to have rust spots by morning, but he was too tired. He hadn't slept last night, he'd marched all day, and he'd taken a fortress. Now he would sleep. He pushed past Bamfald and went to find a cot in an empty room of the barracks. There, surrounded by the small belongings of a gunner, evicted by his green jackets, he lay down and slept. It was night now, a cold night. Sentries shivered on the ramparts, and the flooded ditch had a skin of thin ice. The wind dropped, the rain had died and the clouds thinned to leave a sky pricked by cold, white, winter-bright stars above the shimmering, glittering, ice-edged marshes. Across those silent marshes, and from the silvered, steel-flat waters of Arcachon, a glimmer of mist was born. The mist skeined slow in a still night, a night of frost and white vapour beyond a fort where the blood spilt in a skirmish froze hard in the darkness. Torches fled in the courtyard of the Teste de Bouche, breath smoked to vapour. Frost touched the cobbles white and rhymed the gun barrels on the ramparts. Bamfalt had ordered the green jackets to rest, and replaced them with marines whose scarlet coats and white cross belts seemed bright in the starlit night. Nine French prisoners, one of them the sergeant who had fired at Sharp from the barrack roof, were locked in an empty ready magazine. They would be taken by Bamfalt's ships to the rotting prison hulks in the Thames, or else to the new stone jail built by French prisoners in the wilds of Dartmoor. The other prisoners were locked in the spirit store that Bamfald had ordered emptied of its brandy and wine. Thirty men were crammed into a space fit for no more than a dozen. They were the Americans. At least they claim they're Americans. Bamfald, his bootless feet propped on an ammunition box, sat in front of a fire that had been lit in Lassan's old quarters. But I'll warrant half of them are our deserters. Indeed, sir. Lieutenant Ford knew that American ships, both Navy and civilian, were heavily crewed by seamen who had run from the harsh discipline of the Royal Navy. So have the bastards out one at a time. Bamfal paused to bite into a chicken leg that should have been a part of Henri Lasson's dinner. He sucked the bone clean, then tossed it at the fire. And talk to them, Lieutenant. Use two reliable bosun's mates, understand me? Aye, aye, sir. Ford understood very well. Any man you believe is a deserter, put in a separate room. The real Americans can go back to the store. Aye, aye, sir. Bamfile poured more of the wine. It might be a young vintage, but it was very, very hopeful. He made a mental note to have all the crates shipped to the vengeance. He'd also found some fine crystal glasses incised with a coat of arms that would look very fine in his Hampshire house. You think I'm being too particular with the American prisoners, Ford? Ford did. They're all going to hang, sir. True, but it's important that they hang in the proper manner. We can't have a pirate flogged, can we? That would be most uncivil. Bamfile laughed at his small jest. Those crewmen of the Thuella who were suspected of being British seamen and deserters would face the worst fate. They would be placed in a ship's boat and rowed past all the ships of Bamfile's command. In front of each ship, under the gaze of the crews, they would be lashed with the cat and nine tails as a visible bloody warning of the price a deserter must pay. The knotted thongs would flay their skin and flesh to the bone. But they'd be restored to consciousness before they were hanged from the vengeance's yardarm. The others, the Americans, would be hanged ashore, without a flogging, as common pirates. Lieutenant Ford hesitated. Captain Fredrickson, sir, he began nervously. Fredrickson, Bamfarr frowned. That's the fellow with the beggar's face, yes? Yeah? 
Indeed, sir. Uh, he did say they were his prisoners, that he'd guaranteed them honourable treatment. Bamfile laughed. Perhaps he thinks they should be hanged with a silken robe. They're privateers, Ford, pirates. That makes him the Navy's business, and you will oblige Captain Fredrickson to keep his opinions to himself. Bamfile smiled reassurance at his lieutenant. I shall talk to the American officers myself. Send me my bargeman, will you? The capture of Cornelius Killick had given Captain Bamfield a particular and keen pleasure. American seamen had twisted the Royal Navy's tail, winning single-ship battles with contemptible ease, and men like Killick had become popular heroes to their countrymen. The news of his capture, an ignominious death, would teach the Republic that Britain could lash back when it so wished. Their lordships of the Admiralty, Bamfield knew, would be well pleased with this news. Not many enemies still defied Britain on the waves, and the downfall of even one, even though he be a common pirate, would be a rare victory these days. I am not, Cornelius Kiddick said when he was brought into Bamfile's presence, a pirate. Bamfile's fleshy face showed ironic amusement. You're a common and vulgar pirate, Killick, a criminal, and you'll hang as such. I carry letters of mark from my government, and well you know it. Killick, like Lieutenant Doherty, had been stripped of his sword, and his hands were bound behind his back. The American was chilled to the bone, furious and helpless. Where, Bamfile looked innocently at Killick, are your letters of mark? I got him, sir. Bamfile's bosom produced a thick fold of papers that Killick had carried in a waterproof pouch on his belt. Bamfile took, opened and read the papers with scant interest. The government of the United States, in accordance with the customary laws, gave permission to Captain Cornelius Killick to wage warfare on the enemies of the Republic wherever on the high seas those enemies might be found, and extended to Captain Killick the full protection of the said government of the United States. I see no letters of Mark. Bamfile threw the documents onto the fire. Bastard. Killick, like every privateer, knew that such letters offered small protection, but no captain liked to lose his papers. Bamfile laughed. He was scanning the other papers that were certificates of American citizenship for the Thuella's crew. A fanciful name for a pirate ship, Thuella? It's Greek, Killock said scornfully. A mean storm cloud. An American educated in the classics? Bamfile mocked the fine-looking man. Ah, oh, what miracles this young century brings. Bamfile's boatswain, the man who governed the captain's private barge, elbowed Lieutenant Doherty in the ribs. This one's no Jonathan, sir. He's a bloody mick. An Irishman, Bamfield smiled. Rebelling against your lawful king, are you? I am an American citizen, Doherty said. Not any longer. Bamfield threw all the certificates onto the fire where they flared bright then shriveled. I smell the whiff of the Irish bogs on you. Bamfield looked back to Kiddock. So, where's the Thuella? I told you. Bamfire was not sure he believed Killick's story, that the Thuella was stranded, stripped, and useless. But tomorrow the Briggs could search the Bassin d'Arcachon and make certain. Bamfile also hoped that the rest of the privateer crew could be hunted down and brought to his justice. How many of your crew are British subjects? he asked Killick. None. Killick's face glared defiance. Fully one-third of his men had once served in the Royal Navy, and Killick well knew what ghastly fate awaited them if they were discovered. Not one. Bamfile took a cigar from his case, cut it, then held a twisted paper spill made of a page torn from Lassan's copy of Montaigne's essays in the fire. You're all going to hang, Killick, all of you. I could claim that you're all deserters, even you. He lit his cigar, then dropped the flaming spill. You fancy a thrashing, Killick? Or would you prefer to tell me the truth? Killick, whose cigars had been stolen from him by a marine, watched enviously as the British captain drew on the glowing tobacco. Piss on you, mister. Bamfile shrugged, then nodded to the bosun. There were seven bargemen, all favourites of their captain, and all strengthened by their time at the oars. They were also veterans of countless brawls in dockside taverns, and of the fights they'd won when part of a press gang, and two bound men, however strong, were no match for them. Bamfile watched impassively. To him, these two Americans were pirates, pure and simple, who wore no recognised uniform, and their fate did not disturb him any more than he might worry about the rats in the vengeance's bilge. He let his men hit them. He watched the blood smear from split lips and noses, 
And not until both men were on the floor with bloodied faces and bruised ribs did he raise a hand to stop the violence. How many of your men, Killick, are deserters? Before Killick could make any reply, the door opened. Standing there, and with taut fury on his face, was Captain William Fredrickson. Sir! Bamfile twisted in his chair and frowned at the interruption. He was not concerned that the rifleman should witness his beating, but it offended Bamfile that the man had not had the simple courtesy to knock first. It's Fredrickson, isn't it? Well, can't, can't it wait, man? It was evident that Fredrickson was struggling to control his temper. He swallowed, drew himself to attention, and forced civility into his face. I gave Captain Killick my word as a gentleman that he would be treated with respect and honour. I demand that my word is kept. Bamfile was truly astonished at the protest. They're pirates, Captain. I gave my word. Fredrickson stood his ground stubbornly. Then I, as your superior, have rescinded it. Bamfile's voice was suddenly infused with anger at this soldier's impertinence. They are pirates, and in the morning they will hang from a gallows. That is my decision, Captain Fredrickson, mine. And if you say one more word on it, just one, then by God, I will have you put under arrest like them. Now get out. Fredrickson stared at Bamfile. For a second he was tempted to dare Bamfile to make good his threat. Then, without a word, he turned and stalked from the room. Bamfile smiled. Shut the door, bosun. Now. Where were we, gentlemen? In the fort's yard, carpenters from the cellar hammered six-inch nails into beams. That, when all the work was done, would be raised to make a gallows for the morning, where Cornelius Killick, instead of dancing scorn about the navy, would dance attendance on a rope. Thomas Taylor, the rifleman from Tennessee, who had so far done his duty without murmur or protest, stopped Captain Fredrickson close to the busy hammers. Sir? It'll stop, Taylor, I promise you. Taylor, satisfied because of the fury on his captain's face, stepped back. The air about the fort was ghostly with a mist that blurred the stars and touched frigid on Fredrickson's scarred skin. He saw his own anger mirrored in Taylor's eyes and knew that loyalties were being stretched in this cold night. It will stop, he promised again, then went to wake Sharp. Sharp struggled out of a dream in which he saw his wife as a flesh-rotted skeleton presiding at a tea party. He groped for his sword, flinched from a stab of pain that seared in his bandaged head, then recognized the eye-patched face in the light of the horn lantern that Fredrickson carried. Dawn already? Sharp asked. No, sir. But they're beating the hell out of them, sir. Sharp sat up. It was piercingly cold in the room. They're doing what? The Americans. Fredrickson told how the seamen were being dragged before Ford, while the officers were being entertained by Captain Bamfield. Rifleman Taylor had woken Fredrickson with the news. Now Fredrickson woke Sharp. They've found two deserters already. Sharp groaned as his head split with pain. The deserters will have to hang. His tone conveyed that such men deserved nothing else. Fredrickson nodded agreement. But I gave my word to Killick that he would be treated like a gentleman. They're half killing the poor bastard. And they're all to hang, Bampal says, deserters or no. Oh, Christ! Sharp pulled his boots on, not bothering to tuck his overall trousers into the leather. He put his arms into his jacket, then stood. Bugger, Bamfylde. Page 9, paragraph 1 of the King's Regulations might be more appropriate, sir. Sharp frowned. What? Post captains, Fredrickson quoted, commanding ships or vessels that do not give post, rank only as majors during their commanding such vessels. Sharp buttoned his jacket, then buckled a snake hasp of his sword belt. How the hell do you know that? I took care to look up the respective pages before we left, sir. Jesus, I should have done that. Sharp snatched up his shako and led the way downstairs. But he's commanding the vengeance that gives post and makes him a full colonel. He's not on board, Fredrickson said persuasively. And the vengeance is a half mile offshore. If he commands anything, it's the Scylla, and frigates aren't post. Sharp shrugged. The quibbles seemed dubious grounds for taking command from Bamfield. Fredrickson clattered down the stairs behind Sharp. And may I remind you of the next paragraph? You're going to anyway. Sharp pushed open a door and went into the pitiless cold of the courtyard. The air stung his cheeks and brought tears to his eyes. Nothing in these regulations is to authorize any land officer to command any of His Majesty's squadrons or ships, nor any sea officer to command on land. Fredrickson paused, raised his heel and slammed it down on the ice cobbles. Land, sir. Sharp stared at Fredrickson. 
The carpenter's maul sounded like small cannons thumping to increase the throbbing agony of his skull. I don't give a damn, William, if they hang Killick. The bloody Americans shouldn't be butting into this bloody war anyway. And I don't give a tuppenny damn if we hang every mother's son of them. But you gave your word? I did, sir. So I give a damn that your word's kept. Sharp didn't bother to knock on Bamfile's door. Instead, he kicked it in, and the crack of the swinging wood slamming against the wall made Captain Bamfile jump in alarm. This time, there were two rifle officers, both scarred, both with faces harder than rifle butts, and both displaying an anger that was chilling in the fire-heated room. Sharp ignored Bamfile. He crossed the room and stooped to the fallen men who had been further punched and kicked since Fredrickson had left. Sharp straightened and looked at the bosun. Untie them. Major Sharp, Bamfile began, but Sharp turned on him. You will oblige me, Captain Bamfile, by not interfering with my exercise of command on land. Bamfile understood instantly. He knew a quotation from the regulations, and he knew a lost battle. But a battle was not a campaign. These men are the Navy's prisoners. These men were captured by the army on land, where they were fighting as auxiliaries to the Imperial French Army. Sharp was making it up as he went along. They are my prisoners, my responsibility, and I order them untied. This last was to the captain's barge crew, who, startled by the sudden shout, stooped to the bound men. Captain Bamfile wanted these Americans, but he wanted to preserve his dignity more. He knew there's no struggle over precedence, a struggle fueled by legalistic interpretations of the regulations he would barely survive. He also felt the disarming touch of fear in the presence of these men. Bamfile well knew what reputations came with Sharp and Fredrickson, and their ruffinly looks and scarred faces suggested that this was a battle Bamfile could not win by force. Instead, he would have to use subtlety, and in that knowledge he smiled. We shall discuss their fate in the morning, Major. Indeed we will. Sharp, somewhat surprised by the ease of his victory, turned to Fredrickson. Order the other Americans into proper confinement, Mr. Fredrickson. Use our men as guards, then clear the kitchen and ask Sergeant Harper to join me there. Bring them. He nodded at the American officers. In the kitchens, Sharp offered an awkward apology. Cornelius Killick, who was tearing a loaf of bread apart, cocked a bloodied eyebrow. Apologize? You were given an officer's word and it was broken. I apologize. Patrick Harper pushed open the kitchen door. Captain Fredrickson said you wanted me, sir. To be a cook, Sergeant, there's some frog soup on the stove. Pleasure, sir. Harper, whose face was almost back to its normal size, and who seemed remarkably well recovered from his self-inflicted surgery, opened the stove's firebox and threw in driftwood. The kitchens were blessedly warm. You're Irish? Lieutenant Doherty suddenly asked Harper. That I am. From Tangavenny and Donegal, and a finer piece of God's country doesn't exist. It's fish soup, sir, Harper said to Sharp. Tangavenny? The thin-faced lieutenant stared at Harper. Then you'd be knowing Cashel Naveen. On the road to Bally Boffy, where the old fort would be. Harper's face suddenly took on a look of magical happiness. I've walked that road more times than I remember, so I have. We farmed on the slopes there, before the English took the land. Doherty gave Sharp a sour, challenging look, but the English officer was leaning against the wall, apparently oblivious. Doherty! Doherty said to Harper. Harper? There was a Doherty, Harper said, who had a smithy in Mean Crumlin. My uncle! God save Ireland! Harper stared in wonder at the lieutenant. And you from America? Do you hear that, sir? He has an uncle that used to tinker my ma's pans. I heard. Sharp spoke sadly. He was thinking that he had stuck his neck out into small avail. He had saved these men for twelve hours, no more, and there were times, he thought, when a soldier should know when not to fight. Then he remembered how Duco, the Frenchman, had treated him in Burgos, and how a French officer had risked his career to save Sharp, and Sharp knew he couldn't have lived with his conscience if he had simply allowed Bamfile to continue his savagery. These men might well be pirates. They probably did deserve the rope, but Fredrickson had pledged his word. Sharp walked to the table. How are your wounds? My last at tooth. Killick grinned to show the bloody gap. That's a fashion these days, Harper said equably from the range. Sharp pulled a bottle of wine towards him and knocked the neck off against the table. Are you pirates? Private ear, Killick said it proudly, 
and legally licensed. Fredrickson, shivering from the cold in the yard, came through the door. I've put the rest of the Jonathans in the guardroom. Roster's watching them. He looked towards the seated Americans. I'm sorry, Mr. Killick. Captain Killick, Killick said without rancor. And thank you for what you did, both of you. He held out a tin mug for wine. When they dangle us at a rope's end, I'll say that not every Britisher is a bastard. Sharp poured wine into Killick's cup. I saw you, he said, at saint jean de Luz. Killick gave a great hoarse whoop of a laugh that reminded Sharp of Wellington's strange merriment. That was a splendid day, Killick said. We had them wetting their britches right enough. Sharp nodded, remembering Bamfile's fury in the dining room as a naval captain had watched the American. You did. Killick felt in his pocket, realized he had no cigars, and shrugged. Nothing in peace will offer such joy, will it? Sharp made no reply, and the American looked at his lieutenant. Perhaps we ought to become real pirates in peacetime, Liam. If we live that long... Doherty stared sourly at the rifleman. For an Irishman, Killick said to Sharp, he has an unnatural sense of reality. Are you going to hang us, Major? I'm feeding you. Sharp avoided the question. But in the morning, Killick said, the sailor men will want us, won't they? Sharp said nothing. Patrick Harper by the stove watched Sharp and took a chance. In the morning, he said softly. We'll be away from here, so we will. On more's the pity. Sharp frowned because the sergeant had seen fit to interrupt. Yet in truth, he had asked for Harper's presence because the good sense of the huge Ulsterman was something that he valued. Harper's words had served two purposes. First, to warn the Americans that the riflemen could not control their fate. And secondly, to tell Sharp that the consensus, among the green jackets at least, was that a hanging would not be welcome. The rifles had captured these Americans, had done it without bloodshed to either side, and they felt bitterly that the Navy should so high-handedly decide to execute opponents whose only fault had been to fight with unrealistic hopes. No one spoke. Harper, his pennyworth contributed, turned back to the stove. Doherty stared at the scarred, stained table, while Killick, a half-smile on his bruised face, watched Sharp, and thought that here was another English officer who did not match the image encouraged by the American news sheets. Fredrickson, still by the door, thought how alike Sharp and the American were. The American was younger, but both had the same hard, good-looking face, and both had the same savage recklessness in their eyes. It would be interesting, Fredrickson decided, to see whether such similar men liked or hated each other. Sharp seemed embarrassed by the encounter, as if he was uncertain what to do with this exotic and unfamiliar enemy. He turned to Harper instead. Isn't that soup ready? Not unless you want it cold, sir. A full belly... Killick said, to make us hang heavier? No one responded. Sharp was thinking that in the morning, once the riflemen were gone, Bamfile would string these Americans up like sides of beef. Ten minutes ago, that thought had not upset Sharp. Men were hanged in droves every day, and a hanging was prime entertainment at any time with a respectable-sized population. Pirates had always been hanged. And besides, these Americans were the enemy. There were good reasons, therefore, to let the Thuella's crew hang. Yet to reason thus, in cold blood, was one thing, and it was quite another to look across a tabletop and apply that chilling reason to men whose only fault had been to pick a fight with riflemen. There were French soldiers grown old in war who would have hesitated to take on green jackets. So should a seaman hang because of optimism? Besides, and though Sharp knew this was not a reasonable objection, he found it hard to think of men who spoke his own language as enemies. Sharp fought Frenchmen. Yet the law was the law and in the morning Sharp's orders would take him far from this fort and far from Cornelius Killick, who would, abandoned to Bamfile's mercies, hang. That, Sharp decided, was certain, and so, unable to offer any reassurance, he poured wine instead. He wished Harper would hurry with the damned soup. Cornelius Killick, understanding all of Sharp's doubts from the troubled look on the rifleman's bandaged face, spoke a single word. Listen. Sharp looked into Killick's eyes, but the American said nothing more. Well? Sharp frowned. Killick smiled. You hear nothing. No wind, Major. There's not a breath of wind out there. Nothing but frost and mist. So? So, we have a saying back home, Major. 
the American was staring only at Sharp. But if you hang a sailorman and still airs, his soul can't go to hell. So it lingers on earth to take another life as revenge. The American pointed at Sharp. Maybe your life, Major. Killick could have said nothing more helpful to his cause. His words made Sharp think of Jane, shivering in the cold sweat of her fever, and he thought with sudden self-pity that if she couldn't be saved, then he would rather catch the fever and die with her than be in this cold, ice-slicked fort where the mist writhed silent about the stones. Killick, watching the hard face that was slashed by a casual scar, saw a shudder go through the rifleman. He sensed that Doherty was about to speak, and rather than have their situation jeopardized by Irish hostility, he kicked his lieutenant to silence. Killick, who had spoken lightly enough before, knew that his words had struck a seam of feeling, and he pressed his advantage with a gentle voice. There's no peace for a man who hangs a sailorman in a calm. Their eyes met. Sharp wondered whether the American's words were true. Sharp told himself it was nonsense, a superstition as baseless as any soldier's talisman. Yet the thought was irresistibly lodged. Sharp had been cursed years before, his name buried on a stone, and his first wife had died within hours of that curse. He frowned. The deserters must hang. That's the law. No one spoke. Harper waited for the soup to seethe, and Fredrickson leant against the door. Doherty licked bloodied lips. Then Killick smiled. All my men are citizens of the United States, Major. What they were before is not your business, nor my president's business, nor the business of the bloody law. They all have citizens' papers. Killick ignored the fact that the certificates had been burnt by Bamfield. You give those scraps of paper to anyone who volunteers. Anyone, Sharp said mockingly. If a donkey could pull a trigger, you'd make it into a citizen of the United States. And what do you give to your volunteers? Killick retorted with an equal scorn. Everyone knows a murderer is forgiven his crime if he'll join your army. You expect us to be more delicate than your own service? There was no reply, and Killick smiled. And I tell you now that none of my men deserted the Royal Navy. Some may have fouled anchor tattoos, some may have English voices, and some may have scarred backs, but I tell you now that they are all, every last jack of them, free-born citizens of the Republic. Sharp looked into the hard, bright eyes. You tell me, or do you swear to me? I'll swear on every damn Bible in Massachusetts if you demand it. Which meant that Killick lied, but that he lied to protect his men. And Sharp knew that he himself would tell just such a lie for his own men. Thomas Taylor is American. Fredrickson observed mildly to Sharp. Would you approve of him being hanged if the tables were turned? And if he let them go, Sharp thought, then the Navy would complain to the Admiralty, and the Admiralty would huff and puff to the Horse Guards, and the Horse Guards would write a letter to Wellington, and all hell would break loose about Major Richard Sharp's head. Men like Wigram, the Boers who worshipped proper procedure, would demand explanations and decree punishments. And if he didn't let the Americans go, Sharp thought, then a girl might die and he would go back to Saint-Jean-de-Luz to be shown the fresh, damp earth of her grave. Somehow he believed, with the fervour of a man who would cling to any hope, that he could buy Jane's life by not hanging a sailorman in still airs. He had lost one wife by a curse. He couldn't risk it again. He was silent. The soup boiled, and Harper shifted it from the flames. Kiddick, as if he didn't care what the outcome of this meeting was, smiled. A flat calm, Major and the ice will mask our dead faces just because we fought like men for our own country. If I were to let you go, Sharp spoke so quietly that even in this night's uncanny silence, Killick and Doherty had to lean forward to hear his voice. Would you give me your word, as American citizens, that neither of you, nor any man in your crew, here or absent, will take up arms against Britain for the rest of this war's duration? Sharp had expected instant acceptance, even gratitude, but the tall American was wary. Well, suppose I'm attacked. Then you run. Sharp waited for a reply that did not come. Then, to his astonishment, found himself pleading with a man not to choose a hanging. I can't stop Bamfile hanging you, Killick. I don't have the power. I can't escort you into captivity. We're a hundred miles behind enemy lines. So the Navy has to take you away from here. And the Navy will string you up, all of you. But give me your word, 
and I'll release you. Killick suddenly let out a great breath, the first sign of the tension he'd felt. <sighs> you have my word. Sharp looked at the Irishman. And you? Doherty stared in puzzlement at Sharp. Y you let all of us go? All the crew? I said so. And how do we know... Harper spoke in sudden Gaelic. His words were brief, harshly spoken, and a mystery to every man in the room except to himself and Doherty. The American lieutenant listened to the huge Irishman, then looked back to Sharp with a sudden, unnatural humility. You have my word. Cornelius Killick held up a hand. But if I'm attacked, Major, and can't run, then by Christ I'll fight. But you won't seek a fight. I will not, Killick said. Sharp, his head splitting with pain from the bullet strike, leant back. Harper brought the cauldron to the table and splashed soup into five bowls. Fredrickson came and sat down. Harper sat beside him, and only Sharp didn't eat. He looked at Killick instead, and his voice was suddenly very weary. Your boat's wrecked? Yes. Killick told the lie glibly. Then I suggest you go to Paris. The American minister there can arrange passage home. Indeed. Killick smiled. He spooned soup into his mouth. So what now, Major? You finish your soup, collect your men and go. I'll make sure there's no trouble at the gates. You forfeit your weapons, of course, except for officers' swords. Killick stared at Sharp as though he couldn't believe what he was hearing. We just go? You just go, Sharp said. He pushed his chair back and walked to the door. He went into the yard, stared upwards, and sure enough, the Union flag that the sailors had raised to the flagpole's peak was hanging utterly limp in the still misting air. It was a flat calm, an utter stillness, no airs in which to hang a sailorman. And so Richard Sharp would let an enemy go, and he would say he did it for honour, or because the war was so close to ending that there was no need for more death, or because it was just his pleasure to do it. He felt tears in his eyes that had been earlier closed with blood, then walked to the gate to make sure that no man stopped the Thuella's crew from leaving. His wife would live, and Sharp, for the first time since the Amelie had sailed, felt that he, just like the Americans, was free. Chapter 9 Be pleased to acquaint the Lord's Commissioners of the Admiralty, wrote Captain Horace Bamfylde, as he drafted his first dispatch to the Secretary of the Admiralty, which gentleman would not only acquaint the Lord's Commissioners, but also the unlordly editor of the Naval Gazette, who was in a position to do much honour to Captain Bamfylde, that judging it to be of consequence that their Lordship should have as early information as possible of the defeat of the French forces in the basin of Arcachon, I have this day ordered the Lily Cutter to sail with this dispatch. The Lily was waiting in the roads outside. I had established, Bamfylde's quill squeaked on the thick paper, from pickets sent ahead, that an artillery fortification of breastwork, ditch and emplacements, in which six pieces of artillery were arrayed, which pieces were defended by musketeers, had been constructed against just such an approach as I had the honour to make. Bamfylde had decided not to reveal that the breastwork was manned by American sailors, for victory over such opponents would not be considered as praiseworthy as a triumph over French land forces. By default, therefore, Bamfylde would allow the Lord's Commissioners to believe that he had faced and overcome a part of Napoleon's army. He refought the battle with quill and ink, not as it had actually taken place, but as he was convinced it ought to have taken place. Indeed, in a manner that precisely described what Bamfylde believed would have happened if Major Sharp had not disobeyed his orders and assaulted the testated bush instead of marching inland. The quill paused, and Bamfylde persuaded himself that he did Major Sharp a favour by not writing a description of the rifleman's disobedience, and further persuaded himself that it might be better all round if Sharp's name didn't appear in the description of the fort's capture at all. Why raise the subject of a fellow officer's failure to follow orders? Going forward with a file of men under Lieutenant of Marines Fitch, Bampard resumed, I succeeded in drawing the enemy fire and thus marking the position of the skillfully hidden battery to my flanking force that was under the command of Captain Palmer. The guns were taken at point of cutlass and sword. Due to the temerity and masterful gallantry shown by the men under my command, 
Our losses were trifling. That seemed eminently just to Bamfylde. After all, the guns had been physically taken by the Marines, and it seemed hardly necessary to spell out the trifling point that the gun crews had already been captured. Guns were guns, and next to enemy flags were valuable trophies. That thought gave Bamfar pause. He had already sequestered the French tricolor that had flown over the testated bush, but his midshipmen had so far failed to find the American ensign. That must be diligently sought, Bamfar thought, as he bent again to his literary labours. At this time, the Scylla, Captain Duncan Grant, was, as per my orders, fully engaging the guns of the fort with her main batteries. Thus distracted, the defenders were disconcerted by the sudden appearance from the woods of my land force. Deeming the moment opportune, I went forward to the escalade. It is with the greatest pleasure and satisfaction that I make known to their lordships the very gallant behaviour of Lieutenant Ford, who, with the utmost intrepidity, was at the forefront of the attack. In the crossing of two ditches, two walls, and the enceinte of the enemy position, Lieutenant Ford showed a true British spirit, as did the Marines who followed us in the assault. Bamfylde frowned, wondering whether he had over-egged the pudding a little. But it was important that Ford, who had noble connections in London, should feel pleased with this dispatch. Bamfylde, still frowning, was concerned that their lordships would realise that Ford, who had been described as so very gallant, was at all times at Bamfylde's side, and that the enconium so generously penned should, in reality, be read as applying to the author. Captain Bamfylde was not certain that meaning was entirely plain, yet he knew their lordships to be subtle men, and he must trust to their perspicacity. Again he scanned his words as a test for truth. He and Ford had indeed crossed two ditches and walls, all of them thanks to the drawbridge which had been captured by Sharp's riflemen, but it would do no harm for the word escalade to suggest a desperate struggle. Taken in the rear, their defences broken, the enemy retreated to the inner galleries of their fortress, where, with fortitude and determination, the Marines I had the honour and happiness to command overpressed the foe. Great carnage was done upon the enemy before a surrender was accepted, whereupon I had the privilege of raising His Majesty's flag upon the captured mast. Bamfylde had indeed ordered the flag raised, and it handily gave the impression that he had been present when the fort was captured. And in all honesty, Bamfylde persuaded himself, he had captured the testé de bouche. It had been his plan his execution, and, though the rifles had undoubtedly reached the fort first and taken possession of the gate and ramparts, the marines, in exploring the labyrinthine tunnels and storerooms, had discovered six French gunners hiding in a latrine. The existence of those men proved that the rifles had not possessed all the fortress, and that it had been the marines under Bamfylde's command who had achieved that task. Captain Bamfylde felt certain that his account, far from being unfair, was a model of generous objectivity. Among the prisoners taken were the crew of the American privateer, Thuella, which crew included in their numbers some deserters from His Majesty's Navy. Writing that line gave Captain Bamfar particular satisfaction. Tomorrow he would have those men hanged. Sharp would be leaving, and when Sharp was gone, Captain Bamfar would show his men how a privateer's crew was treated. A knock sounded on the door. Bamfar scowled at the interruption, but looked up. Come! Sir? An astonished Lieutenant Ford stood there. They're letting them go, sir. The Americans. Go? Bamfylde stared with disbelief at his lieutenant. Gone, rather, sir. Ford shrugged helplessly. Major Sharp's orders, sir. Bamfylde felt a pulse of hatred so fierce and so deep that he thought that never could he assuage such a feeling. Then he knew he must try. Wait! He dipped his quill into ink and the nib emerged coated with vitriol. Those prisoners condemned for desertion or piracy were released without my knowledge nor consent by Major Richard Sharp, Prince of Wales' own volunteers, whom we'd conveyed to the Teste de Bouche together with a small force of soldiery for operations in the interior. As yet, with all the attendant duties that this victory brings, and in the business of anticipating the prizes that will lie open to His Majesty's ships tomorrow, I have had neither opportunity nor time to demand of Major Sharp his reasons for this. Bamfylde paused, then swooped. Betrayal. But be assured that such reasons will be sought and conveyed to their lordships by your most humble and obedient servant, 
Horace Bamfylde. He sanded the dispatch, folded it, then sealed it. Ford would wrap it in wax paper, then take it to the Lily to wait for the winds that would speed this message back to London, to the greater glory of Horace Bamfylde, and to the deserved damnation of Major Richard Sharp. The mist thickened slowly, just as the ice on the marshes thickened. There was no wind as dawn silvered the Bassin d'Arcachon, and as Cornelius Killick with his men finished their frozen march to the village of Goujon, where the Thuella was grounded. Liam Doherty was astonished by the night's events. First his life had been spared by an Englishman. Then, as he left the fort, a savage-faced rifleman had thrust a cloth bundle into his arms. That bundle proved to be the Thuella's ensign, and to Doherty a further proof that some supernatural force had given the Thuella's crew protection in the cold, still night. Cornelius Killick took their release more carelessly, as though he knew his time on this earth was not yet finished. There never was a saying, Liam, that hanging a sailorman in still airs brought revenge, but it seemed worth an attempt, huh? He laughed softly. And it worked. He stared up at his beached schooner, knowing that it needed days of work before it could float. We'll patch with the elm and hope for the best. At least the best is one finest in this mist, Doherty said hopefully. If the wind doesn't spring. Killick stared over the saltings beyond the creek and saw how the slow, creeping whiteness was thickening into a vaporous shroud that might yet be his schooner's salvation. But if we burn her, he said slowly, the British can't. Burn her? Doherty sounded appalled. Get the top mast down. I want the bowsprit off her. Make her look like a hulk, Liam. Killick, despite his sleepless night, was suddenly full of demonic energy. Then set smoke fires in the hold. He stared up at the sleek bulge of the careened hull. Streak it with tar, make her look abandoned, burned and wrecked. For if the British saw a canted, maskless hull seeping a smudge of smoke, they would think the Thuella beyond salvage. They wouldn't know that men carefully tended the smoke-rich fires, or that the topmast guns and sails were held safe ashore. Do it, Liam, fast now, fast! Killick grinned at his men, filling them with hope, then stalked back to the small tavern where Commandant Henri Lasson, wet and disconsolate, huddled before a smoking fire. You'll not stay with us, Henri? Lasson was wondering what fate had attended upon his small and valuable library. No doubt it would be burned. The British, in Lasson's grim view, were entirely capable of burning books, which made it all the more surprising that they had released the Americans. What was the name of the officer? Sharp. Killick, with relief, had found some of his cigars safe amongst the baggage stored at Goujon. He lit one now, noticing that the mist was thickening to fog. Sharp. Lasson frowned. A rifleman? Green jacket, anyway. Killick watched as Lasson scribbled in a small notebook. The French officer resting in Goujon on his eastward journey wanted to know all that Killick could tell him about the British force, and the American, considering the request, decided that the giving of information did not break his promise to Sharp. Does it matter who he is? If he's the man I think he is, yes. Blasson sounded dispirited by his defeat. You've met one of their more celebrated soldiers. He met one of America's more celebrated sailors, Killick said happily. He wondered if this unnatural calm presaged a storm. He saw Lasson's pencil pause and sighed. Let me think now. I'd guess a hundred riflemen, maybe a few more. Marines? Lasson asked. At least a hundred, Killick shrugged. Lasson looked through the window, saw the fog, and knew he must find a horse, any horse, and take his news to those who could best use it. The British should come, have won their victory but they had not yet left Arcachon. So Lassan would go to Bordeaux and there find the men who could organize revenge on a rifleman. The fog writhed about the low walls of the Teste de Bouche, utterly obscuring the ramparts from the courtyard where Sharp and the Dawn paraded his rifleman. He's not best pleased with you, Captain of Marines Palmer spoke hesitantly. Sharp replied with his brief opinion of Captain Bamfylde that made the tough Marine smile. I'm to give you this. Palmer handed Sharp a sealed paper. Sharp supposed the paper was a reprimand or protest from Bamfylde, but it was merely a reminder that Major Sharp was expected back at the Teste de Bouche by noon on Thursday. 
Doubtless Bamfarb was unwilling to face Sharp in person, and Sharp didn't care. His head was aching, sometimes pulsing with a stab of dark agony, and his mood was bleak. We're marching with you, Captain Palmer said. He had fifty marines on parade. He'd also taken two of the captured gun limbers, each harnessed behind a pair of cart horses that had been discovered in a meadow by the village, and which now drew the marines' packs and supplies. The men aren't hardened to marching, Palmer explained. You're attached to us? Sharp asked with surprise. Palmer shook his head. We're supposed to be hunting your Americans. Well, if they've got any sense, Sharp said, they'll be long gone. The gate squealed open, boots slammed on the cobbles, and the small force that was intended to cut the French supply road marched into the cold whiteness of the fog. If his map was ripe, Sharp reckoned they faced a full day's march. First they would follow the main road, keeping to its ruts in the blinding fog as far as a bridge at a village called Facture. There they would turn southeast and follow the river Lair until they reached the supply road. One day on the road to cause what chaos he could, then one day for the return journey. The riflemen again outstripped the marines. Gradually the sound of the horses' trace chains faded behind, and Sharp's men marched amidst the clinging soft wet fog as if in a silent cloud. Nothing stirred in Arcachon. The fog half obscured the buildings, the shuttered windows stayed shuttered, but the road led straight through the marketplace. I wanted to thank you, Fredrickson said, for your actions last night. Sharp had been lost in the private pain of a stabbing headache. He had to think to remember the events of the night. Then he shrugged. For nothing. I doubt the Bamfal feels it's nothing. Sharp gave a dutiful smile. He flinched as a dart of pain stabbed behind his bandaged forehead. Fredrickson saw the flinch. Are you well, sir? I'm well. It was said curtly. Fredrickson walked in silence for a few paces. I doubt Captain Palmer can find the fugitives in this fog. He spoke in the tones of a man who openly changed the subject. Vanfile's got the chasse Marais, Sharp said. What the hell else does he want? He wants the American schooner for prize money. Did you ever meet a naval captain who didn't want prize money? Fredrickson sounded scornful. The Webfoots fight a battle and spend the next ten years in litigation over the division of the spoils. The Navy's made the legal profession wealthy. It was an old army complaint. A naval captain could become rich forever by capturing an unarmed enemy merchantman, while a soldier could fight a score of terrible engagements and never see a sixpence for all the crammed warehouses he might capture. Sharp could hardly complain, for he and Harper had stolen their wealth off a battlefield. But the old soldier's envious habit of despising the Navy for legalizing theft persisted. The army did award prize money. A saddle horse, taken in battle, fetched three shillings and ninepence. But that sum shared between a company of infantry made no man wealthy and no lawyers fat. Sharp forced a smile and fed Fredrickson's resentment. You can't be rude about the Navy, William. They're the heroes, remember? Bloody webfoots. Fredrickson, like the rest of the army, resented that the Navy received so much acclaim in Britain while the army was despised. The jealous grousing, so well practiced and comforting, kept Fredrickson voluble through the long morning's march. In the afternoon, the riflemen marched clear of the fog, which hung behind them like a great cloud over the Bassin d'Arcachon. Wisps of mist, like outriders to the fog bank, still drifted above the flat, marshy landscape, over which the road was carried on an embankment shore by plaited hurdles. Widgeon, teal, and snipe flapped away from the marching men. Harper, who loved birds, watched them, but not so closely that he didn't see the twisted rope handle of an eel trap. Two eels were inside, and the beasts were chopped up with a saw bayonet and distributed among the riflemen. It was cold, but the march warmed them. By late afternoon, within sight of two small villages, they reached a miserable plank bridge rotting over a sluggish stream. I suppose this could be facture. Sharp stared at the map. Christ knows. He sent Lieutenant Mimber with six men to discover the names of the closest villages, and with them went a bag of silver French francs to buy what food could be prized from the peasants. The ten-franc silver coins were forgeries made of Wellington's command by counterfeiters recruited from the army's ranks. The peer insisted that all supplies in France were paid for with good coin, but French peasants would not touch Spanish silver, only French. So Wellington had simply melted the one down to make the other. The silver content was good, the coins indistinguishable from those minted in Paris, 
and everyone concerned was happy. They're bloody poor, sir, Minva returned with five loaves, three eels and a basket of lentils. And this is the river Lair, sir. No meat? Fredrickson was disgusted. Each of the riflemen carried three days' supply of dried beef in their packs, but Fredrickson, Sharp knew, was very fond of freshly killed pork. No meat, Minva said. Unless they're hiding it. Of course they're bloody hiding it, Fredrickson said scathingly. You want me to go, sir? He looked hopefully to Sharp. No. Sharp was staring back the way they'd come, where in the distance a straggle of redcoats appeared. Sharp was cold, his head was hurting like the devil, and now he had the marines on his coattails. Bloody hell! I was hoping you'd be here, sir, Palmer greeted Sharp. Hoping? If Killick went in land, which seems likely, then we're better following you, or going with you, Palmer grinned and Sharp realized that the marine captain had no intention of hunting Killick and only wanted to be a part of Sharp's expedition. Setting an ambush on a high road of France was, to Captain Palmer, a taste of real soldiering, while following some half-armed fugitives in a scramble over a cold marsh was just a waste of time. Palmer's lieutenant, a thin, vacant youth called Fitch, hovered close to his seniors to overhear Sharp's decision. I presume, Captain, Sharp said carefully, that you were given a free hand in your search for Captain Killick? Indeed, sir. I was told not to come back till I've found the scoundrel. But not till Thursday, anyway. Then I can't stop you accompanying me, can I? Fifty muskets would be damned useful, so long as the Marines could keep pace with the riflemen. We marched that way. Sharp pointed southeast into the damp water meadows that edged the lair. Palmer nodded. Yes, sir. They marched and if it hadn't been for his piercing, spiking headache, Sharp would have been a happy man. For three days he was free to cause chaos, to carry the war, which the French had carried throughout Europe, deep into the heart of France itself. He would dutifully question his prisoners, but Sharp already knew that if he wouldn't recommend an advance on Bordeaux, and if de Macaire returned with such a recommendation, Sharp, as senior land officer, would forbid the madness. He felt relieved of care. He was free. He was a soldier released from the leash to fight his own war, to which end, and reinforced with fifty footsore marines, he marched southeast to set an ambush. I expected an answer to my letter, Duco said. I hardly expected you to come yourself. The Comte de Macaire was chilled to the marrow. He had ridden across freezing marshland and through low vine-covered hills where the wind had been as bitter as a blade of ice, and all to be thus ungraciously received in a capacious room lit by six candles on a malachite table. My news is too important to be entrusted to a letter. So? A landing. De Marquere crouched by the fire, holding his thin hands to its small flames. At Arcachon. The thought's probably taken already, and more men can be shipped north within a week. He twisted to stare at Ducot's thin face. Then they'll march on Bordeaux. Now? In this weather? Ducot gestured towards the uncurtained windows, where the wind beat a sharp tattoo of freezing rain on the black glass. Only that morning Ducot had found three sparrows frozen to death on the balcony of his quarters. No one could land in this weather. They have already landed, de Macaire said. I was with them. And once they hold the Bassin de Rochon, they'll have sheltered waters to land a bigger force. The Comte thrust impotently at the glowing coals, trying to rouse fierce flames, then described how he was supposed to return to Bamfald with an encouragement for the British plans. If I say the city will rebel, then they'll ship their troops north. How many? The first division. Duco trimmed the wick of a smoking candle. How do you know all this? Through a man called Wigram, a colonel, on the staff of the British first division. Duco's knowledge of the enemy was encyclopedic, and he loved to display it. A painstaking man. Indeed. De Macaire shivered violently. And a man who will offer indiscretions in return for an aristocrat's company. Even a French aristocrat. De Macaire laughed softly, then twisted to face the table. Hogan's sick. How sick? Duco's interest was quickened by the news. He'll die. Good. Good. Pierre Ducot stared at his maps. He had the answer he'd so desperately sought.
but, like a man brought a priceless gift, he began to doubt the generosity of the giver. Suppose this news had been planted under Macaire. Suppose, after all, the British planned a bridge across the Adour, but wished the French to concentrate troops at Arcachon. Or suppose the invading force flooded ashore at the mouth of the Gironde. The answer had brought him no relief, merely more doubts. How many troops are already ashore? Three companies of marines, two of riflemen. That's all? Ducot snapped the words. They think it's enough, de Marquet said mildly. They plan to take the fortress, then ambush the supply road. Ambitious of them, Ducot said softly. They've got an ambitious bastard doing it, de Marquet said viciously. A real bastard. It would be a pleasure to bury him. Who? Ducot asked in polite interest. His attention was on the map where his finger traced the thin line of the river Lair. If such an ambush was planned, then that would be the closest stretch of road to the British landing. Major Richard Sharp, Prince of Wales on volunteers. He's really a rifleman. God knows why he fights in a line battalion. Sharp? Something in Ducot's voice made Macaire turn. Sharp? A spasm showed on Ducot's face, a twist of hatred that went almost as soon as it appeared, but was nevertheless a rare revelation of the real man behind the careful mask. Richard Sharp, the man who had mocked Ducot, who had once broken Ducot's spectacles, and who had destroyed all Ducot's careful plans in Spain. Sharp, a brute, a mindless barbarian whose sword had wrecked so many careful, elegant schemes. Sharp, whom Duco had once had at his mercy in Burgos Castle, except that the rifleman had filled a small room with blood from which Duco had fled in horror. Sharp. You know him? de Marquet asked tentatively. Know him? Did Duco know Sharp? If Pierre Duco had been a superstitious man, which he prided himself on not being, he would have believed that Sharp was his personal devil. How else did the rifleman crop up so often to ruin his meticulous plans? For Ducot was a man who laid careful, almost mathematical plans. He was a soldier whose rank bore no relation to his responsibility. A secretive man who drew together the strands of politics and soldiering, police work and spying, all to the Emperor's glory. Now, in Bordeaux, Ducot was responsible for defending France's southern flank by forecasting the enemy's plans, and, for once, the mention of Sharp's name brought him relief. If Sharp had been sent to Arcachon, then doubtless de Marquet's news was correct. Wellington wouldn't waste Sharp on a diversion. Ducot's enemy had been delivered into his hands. Sharp was doomed. The exultation in that thought made Ducot pace to the window. A few lights flickered in the city that the Major so despised. The merchants of Bordeaux were suffering from the British blockade. Their warehouses and quays were empty and doubtless they would welcome a British victory if it swelled their bellies again and filled their strong boxes. You've done well, Comte. The Marquis acknowledged the praise with a shrug. Duco turned. You leave tomorrow, find Sharp, I'll tell you where, and order him to Bordeaux. If he obeys, the Marquis sounded dubious. Duco laughed, a strange, sudden yelp of a sound. Will entice him? We'll entice him. Then go to Arcachon, give the very opposite message. You understand? De Marquet, huddled by the fire, smiled slowly. By telling Bamfald that there'd be no rebellion in Bordeaux, he'd spiked the British hopes for a landing, while at the same time he could maroon sharp in France. De Marquet nodded. I understand. Ducot repeated his odd laugh. General Calvé's demi-brigade was billeted in Bordeaux on their journey south to Sue's army. One half-battalion had already left with the cumbersome supplies, but Calvé must have at least two thousand men remaining who could destroy Sharp at Arcachon. Ducot would ruin the British hopes for a march on Bordeaux, and he would also hunt his own enemy, his own most hated enemy, to death on the marshes of France. Revenge, the Spanish said, was a dish best eaten cold. And this revenge, and this winter would be as cold and thorough as any man, even the implacable Pierre Ducot, could wish. Chapter 10 There was small sleep to be had that night for either riflemen or marines. The dawn was cold, bitter cold. 
Wraiths of mist drifted above the meadows, frosted crisply white. Sharp woke with a stinging headache behind his bandaged forehead. He sat with his back against a pollard of willow and felt a louse in his armpit that must have come from the Amelie, but he was too tired and too cold to hunt for it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus! Fredrickson, teeth chattering with the cold, crouched by Sharp. Nothing passed yesterday. Dim in the mist, a hundred yards upstream, a handsome stone bridge with carved urns marking the limits of its balustrades arched over the lair. Next to the bridge, and on the western bank down which Sharp and his small force had marched last night, there stood a stone-built house from which a trickle of chimney smoke tantalized the senses with its promise of a warm fire. It's a tall house, Fredrickson said, and the bugger wouldn't give us coffee. No doubt, Sharp reflected, the toll keepers of France were as disobliging as their English counterparts. There was something about that job to bring out the surliness in a man. If we had enough powder, we could break that damn bridge. We don't, Fredrickson said unhelpfully. Sharp struggled to his feet. Fredrickson had taken the last watch, and his pickets were set double strength about the margins of the water meadow where the small force had bivouacked. It had been a miserable bivouac. Some of the marines had sheltered beneath the scanty cover of the limbers, but most of Sharp's men had simply rolled themselves in greatcoats, pillowed their heads on packs, and shivered through the slow, small hours. A cow on the further bank bellowed softly and watched the two men who walked beside the river. A cow at pasture in February suggested a softer climate than England, but it was still damned cold. A swan, beautiful and ghostly, appeared beneath the bridge, followed a moment later by its mate, and the two birds, disdaining the unnatural movement in the fields, glided gently downstream. Luncheon, Fredrickson said. I never liked their taste, Sharp said, like stringy water weeds. He flinched as a sudden stab of pain lanced in his head. He wondered if a naval surgeon had been wrong, and if his wound was more serious than the mere bloody scrape of a carbine ball. He seemed to remember that Johnny Pearson of the Buffs had taken such a wound at Pasarco, sworn it was nothing, then dropped dead a week later. A rickety wooden fence, untended and draped with frost-whitened thorn, barred the steep embankment that carried this high road of France southwards. Sharp climbed to the carriageway that was formed of a white flinty stone which had been rammed hard to smoothness, but which was nevertheless rutted and puddled with ice. No weeds grew on the surface, which bespoke constant use. To the south, where the road disappeared in the mist, he could see the shapes of houses, a church, and tall bare poplars. The river curved here, and doubtless that small town was where the old road crossed the river, while this bridge, newer and wider, had been built in the meadows outside the town, so that the hurrying armies would not have to negotiate narrow medieval streets on their urgent journeys to Spain. Down this carriageway, for the last six years, the guns and men and ammunition and horses and blades and saddles and all the countless trivia of war had been dragged to feed the French armies. And up this same road, Sharp thought, those same armies would trudge in defeat. What's in the town? Fredrickson knew Sharp's question meant what enemy forces might be in the town. The tollkeeper says nothing. Sharp turned to look north. And up there? A stand of beaches a quarter mile up and an excuse for a farm. It'll do. Sharp grunted. He trusted Fredrickson absolutely, and if Fredrickson said that the beaches and farm were the best site for an ambuscade, then Sharp knew it would be pointless to look elsewhere. A violent screech, a flapping of wings, and a sudden curse betrayed that the swans had been purloined for food. Captain Palmer, scratching his crutch and yawning, climbed the fence. Morning, sir. Morning, Palmer, Sharp said. Cold enough for you? Palmer did not reply. The three officers walked towards the toll house that was marked by a white barred gate across the road. A black and white painted board, just like those on the toll houses of England, announced the crossing charges. There was a ford to the right of the bridge, but the ford had been half blocked with boulders so that no carriage or wagon could escape payment of the toll. The toll keeper, peg legged and bald, stood truculently by his gate. He spoke to Fredrickson, who in turn spoke to Sharp. If we haven't got the lace passe, then we have to pay six sous. Lacy passe? Sharp asked. I rather gave them to think we're German troops fighting for Bonaparte, Fredrickson said. The lacy passe allows us to escape all tolls. Tell them to go to hell. Fredrickson conveyed Captain Sharp's compliments to the tollkeeper, who answered by spitting at Sharp's feet. 
Trois hommes, the man said, holding up three fingers in case these heathen German troops didn't understand him. Six sous. Bugger him. Sharp raised the black-painted metal latch that held the gate shut, and from above him a click sounded, and he looked up to see the tollkeeper's wife leaning from an upper window. She was a woman of squat, startling ugliness, her hair bound with a muslin scarf, and more to the immediate point, armed with a vast brass-barrel blunderbuss that covered the three officers. Six sous, said the tollkeeper stoically. Life held few surprises for tollkeepers, and strange troops were nothing new to him. Captain Palmer, who held Major Richard Sharp's reputation in some awe, was now astonished to see the rifleman grudgingly take out a ten-franc silver piece. A delay ensued while the tollkeeper went indoors, unlocked his iron-bound chest, found the right change, then gave Sharp a written receipt, which Fredrickson explained would enable reimbursement to be made at the district headquarters in Bordeaux. I can't have that bugger charging for all of us, Sharp said. Rather than disarm his grenadier, William, we'll march the men through the ford. Yes, sir. Fredrickson was highly amused by the whole transaction. Shouldn't we... Palmer began hesitantly. No, Sharp said. We're under orders not to agitate civilians, Captain. No stealing, no raping. If anyone breaks that order, he'll be hanged by me instantly. His headache had made him speak more sharply than he'd intended. Yes, sir. Palmer sounded subdued. They walked to the stand of beaches that Fredrickson had patrolled in the night. It's the right place, Sharp said grudgingly. If anything travels today, which I doubt, any sensible man would stay indoors on this cold day. The beaches lay to the right of the road, the farm to the left. The farm was a miserable hovel of a place, merely a mud wall cottage surrounded by frosted slush, with two dilapidated outbuildings where chickens lived in filthy straw. A pigsty lay beyond a low hedge. Sharp broke a piece of cat ice with his heel, then swiveled to look where the road passed between the beaches and the farm's hedgerow. We use your marines there, Palmer. You stop them, and the rifles will kill them. Palmer, not wanting to show any lack of understanding, nodded. Fredrickson understood instantly. By using the marines with their heavy firepower of quick-loading muskets as a stop in the bottle, Sharp would force an enemy to scatter left and right to outflank the roadblock. On those flanks, they would run into the hidden riflemen. It would be quick, bloody, and effective. What if they come from the south? Leave them. Sharp knew that any northward-bound convoy would be travelling empty. It took two hours to set the trap. No one could be visible, and so Minver's company of riflemen and Palmer's marines were somehow crammed into the tiny farm buildings. Fredrickson's company, drawing the short straw because Sharp trusted their officer, were in the more exposed beechwood. Harper, with two of Fredrickson's riflemen, was a half-mile to the north as lookout. The farmer, with his wife and daughter, crouched in a corner of their kitchen that was filled with big, stinking men armed with their heavy sea-service muskets. The daughter was waif-like, and beneath her stringy, dirty hair, pretty in a winsome and frightened way, the marines, starved of women for months, eyed her hopefully. One flicker of trouble, Sharp warned Palmer, and I'll kill the man responsible. Yes, sir. Sharp visited the rifleman in the small barn. The barn's outside end wall, as in England, served as the countryman's museum. A stoat was nailed to the wood, its old dry fur pricked with frost. Ravens decayed there, and an otter skin hung empty. The riflemen, despite their cold breakfast and shivering night, grinned at Sharp. He walked north along the hedgerow. He saw two men strolling down the road with a dog at their heels. A quarter of an hour later, a woman drove a skeletal cow north doubtless to sell the beast at market to raise enough cash to see the winter through. None of them saw the rifleman. It seemed extraordinary to Sharp that he could be there, deep in France, unchallenged. Only the Navy, he supposed, could make such a thing possible. The French, bereft of a fleet, could never set such a trap on a Hampshire road. But Sharp could come here, strike like a snake, and be gone by the next sundown, while Bamfal's flotilla, riding at the mouth of the Arcachon Channel, was as safe as if it was anchored in the River Hamble. Sharp turned back towards the farm. The cold weather and the emptiness of the road made him doubt whether any convoy would travel today. His head hurt foully, and, safe from any man's gaze, he flinched with the pain and rubbed a cautious hand over his bandaged forehead. Johnny Pearson, he remembered, had just pitched forward into a dish of hot tripe. No warning, no sound, just stone dead a few seconds after he had cheerfully said it was time to take the bandage off his scalp. 
Shah pressed his forehead to test whether the bone grated. It didn't, but it hurt like the very devil. Back in the farm hovel, a cauldron boiled on the open fire, and the marines had pulled their tea to fill the small room with a homely smell. The girl, Sharp noticed, was now giving the strangers shy smiles. She had cat-like green eyes, and she laughed when the men tried to talk to her. Take some tea to the barn, Sharp ordered. Those our leaves, a voice said from the back of the room. Sharp turned, but no one pressed the objection, and the tea was taken out to the rifleman. The frost melted outside. The mist cleared somewhat, showing the poplars to the north where Harper lay hidden in a ditch. A grey heron, enemy of trout fishermen, sailed with slow, flapping wings towards the north. Sharp, as the morning wore on, and as the marines beguiled the green-eyed girl into giggling flirtation, decided the day was being wasted. Nothing would come. He crossed to Fredrickson's men to find them hidden deep beneath the thick drifts of dead leaves, and told Sweet William that if nothing appeared within two hours, they would start to withdraw. We'll march to Facture and bid at the men warm tonight. That would leave a short, crisp distance for the morning march to Arcachon, where Sharp would insist that the nonsense about taking Bordeaux be abandoned. Fredrickson was disappointed that this journey might be in vain. You wouldn't wait till dusk? No. Sharp shivered inside his greatcoat. He was sure nothing would come now, though he partly suspected that he'd rather hope nothing would come so that he could begin the homeward journey. Besides, his head was splitting fit to burst. He told himself he needed a doctor, but he dared not reveal the extent of his pain to Fredrickson. Sharp forced a rueful smile. Nothing's going to come, William. I feel it in my bones. You have a reliable skeleton. It's never wrong, Sharp said. The enemy came at midday. Harper and his two men brought news of it. Twenty cavalry, walking rather than riding their horses, led six canvas-covered wagons, two coaches, and five companies of infantry. Sharp, trying to ignore the searing stabs in his head, considered Harper's report. The enemy was coming in strength, but Sharp decided that surprise would nullify that advantage. He nodded to Palmer. Go. He ran to the barn and ordered Memphis riflemen to their hidden positions. If I blow, withdraw, he said, you know where to go. Over the bridge. Minver drew his sword and licked his lips. And cover the retreat. Sharp doubled back, half with him, to where the marines crouched behind the hedge. You see the milestone? Sharp said to Palmer. Palmer nodded. Fifty yards up the road was a milestone that had been first defaced of its number of miles, then reinscribed with the strange kilometers that had recently been introduced in France. The stone recorded that it was forty-three kilometers to Bordeaux a distance that meant nothing to Sharp. We don't move till they reach that stone, understand? Yes, sir. Palmer blanched to think of letting the enemy come that close, but raised no objection. Normally, all Sharp's presentiments, any gloom, would have vanished at the first sight of the enemy, but the pain in his skull was a terrible distraction. He wanted to lie down in a dark place. He wanted the oblivion of sleep, and he tried to will the pain away, but it was there, tormenting him, and he forced his attention past the stabbing egg to watch the cavalry appear from the last wisps of mist. Through his glass, he could see that the cavalry horses were winter-thin. The British army in their tiny corner of France had not even brought the cavalry over the Pyrenees, knowing that until the spring grass had fattened the horses, the cavalry would be a burden rather than an advantage. But the French had always been more careless of their horses. If a horse gets close to you, Sharp told the Marines, who he thought might not have experienced cavalry before, hit it in the bloody mouth. The Marines, shivering in the lee of the hedge, grinned nervously. Behind the cavalry, squealing as such wagons always squealed, the heavy transport wagons lumbered on the roadway. Each was hauled by eight oxen. Behind the wagons were the infantry, and behind the infantry the two carriages that had their windows and curtains tight closed against the cold. Sharp pushed his telescope back into his pocket. In the beechwood, he knew, Fredrickson's killers would be sliding loaded rifles forward. This was like shooting fish in a barrel, for the enemy, deep in their homeland, would be marching with unloaded muskets and absent minds. They'd be thinking of sweethearts left behind, of the next night's billet, and of the enemy waiting at the far, far end of the long road. A French cavalry officer, brass helmet shielded with canvas, and with a black cloak covering his gaudy uniform, suddenly swung up into his saddle. He spurred ahead of the convoy, doubtless drawn to the town beyond the river, 
where wine shops would be open and fires burning and brick hearths. Damn! Sharp said it under his breath. The man could not help but see the ambush, and he'd spring it fifty yards too soon. But nothing went as planned in war, and the disadvantage must be taken, then ignored. Deal with the bugger, Patrick. Wait till he sees us. Yes, sir. Harper thumbed back the cock of his rifle. Sharp looked at Palmer. On my order, we advance. Two files. Yes, sir. No shouting, no cheering. French and Spanish troops cheered as they advanced, but the silence of a British attack was an eerie and unsettling thing. The Marine's white face crouched low. One crossed himself, while another, his eyes shut, seemed to be praying silently. The French officer kicked his horse into a trot. The man had a cigar which dribbled smoke, and his broad, open face looked cheerfully at the sodden, misty countryside. He glanced at the farm, bent to pluck his cloak loose of his stirrup leather, where it had wrapped itself as he mounted, then saw the red coats and white cross belts where the marines were concealed in the head shadow that was still white with frost. He was so astonished that he kept coming, mouth opening to shout an inquiry, and when he was still some fifteen yards short of the hedgerow, Harper shot him. The rifle bullet struck a cuirass hidden by the cloak. The ball, squarely hitting the steel, punctured the armour and deflected upwards, through the Frenchman's throat and into his brain, blood bright as dawn fountain from the man's open mouth. In line! Sharp bellowed. Advance! The horse, terrified, reared. The Frenchman, still incongruously holding his cigar, toppled backwards in the saddle. He was dead, but his knees still gripped the horse's flanks, and when the beast plunged its forefeet back down, the corpse nodded forward in a grotesque obeisance to the marines who were scrambling from the ditch to form a double line across the road. Forward! The horse turned, eyes showing white, and the dead Frenchman seemed to grin a bloodshot grin at Sharp before the horse whirled the ghastly face away. The body slumped to the left, fell, but the man's boot was fast caught in the stirrup, and the corpse was dragged, bouncing behind the bolting horse. Hold your fire! Sharp cautioned the Marines. He wanted no nervous man to waste a musket shot. He drew his sword. Double! The remaining cavalry had stopped, appalled. The wagons, with their vast weight, still trundled forward. The infantry seemed oblivious of the ambush's opening shot. The marines, their breath misting, ran up the road that was marked with great splashes of blood. Sharp's boot crushed the dead cavalry officer's fallen cigar. Two cavalrymen hauled carbines from their saddle holsters. Halt! Sharp shouted. He stood to one side of the road. Front rank, kneel! That was not entirely necessary, but a kneeling rank always steadied raw troops, and Sharp knew that these marines, for all their willingness, had small experience in land fighting. Captain Palmer, fire low if you please. Palmer, a naval cutlass in his hand, seemed startled at Sharp's sudden courtesy in allowing him to give the order to fire. He cleared his throat, measured the distance to the enemy, saw how the handful of cavalry were already climbing into saddles and spreading onto the verges, and shouted the order. Fire! Fifty musket balls crashed out of fifty muzzles. Reload! A sergeant shouted. Lieutenant Fitch, a heavy brass-hilted pistol in his right hand, jiggled up and down on the balls of his feet with excitement. Harper had gone right to clear the filthy yellowish cloud of musket smoke. He saw six horses down, legs kicking on the roadway's stone. Two men had fallen, while two others crawled towards the beechwood. An ox from the leading wagon was bellowing with pain. A carbine banged, then another. Far to the convoy's rear, the French infantry were hurrying down the verges, officers shouting. The ox wagons, brake blocks squealing, were juddering to a clumsy halt. Harper was looking for officers. He saw one, a cavalryman with drawn sabre, who was bellowing at his men to form line and charge. It took Harper twenty seconds to reload the Baker rifle. Another marine volley hammered forward, this one doing less damage because the redcoats, unsighted by their musket smoke, fired blind. Harper had the rifle at his shoulder, the officer in his sights, and he pulled the trigger. Black powder flared, flaming debris lashed his cheek, then he unslung the seven-barrel gun and jumped sideways again. The officer was turning away, hand clasped to his shoulder, but a half-dozen cavalrymen were coming forward, sabres drawn and spurs slashing back at thin flanks. Where cavalry, sir? Harper shouted to Palmer, then, hearing the wooden ramrods of the marines still rattling in barrels, he fired his volley gun. 
The impact threw him backwards, but the noise of the seven-barrel gun, like a small cannon, seemed to stun the tiny battlefield. Two cavalrymen were snatched from their saddles, a horse swiveled to throw its rider, and the cavalry's small threat was finished. Then, beyond the wounded horses and the scatter of the day's first dead, the leading two companies of French infantry appeared in front of their wagons. Their muskets were tipped with bayonets. Fredrickson opened fire. The volley, stinging from the flank, flayed into the first infantry ranks, and Fredrickson was bellowing commands as though he held more men under orders. The French were glancing nervously towards the beechwood as Captain Palmer loosed his third volley. The mist remnants were thick with smoke now. The stench of blood mingled with powder stink. Sharp had joined Harper. Nimbus men, slower to deploy, were firing from the left. Stop loading! Sharp shouted at the Marines. Front rank up! Take swords! The headache was forgotten now in the greater urgencies of life and death. Bayonets, sir, Harper muttered. Only green jackets who carried the sword bayonet used the order to fix swords. Bayonets! Bayonets! Captain Palmer! I'll trouble you to go forward! Sharp could sense this whole battle now, could feel it in his instincts, and he knew it was won. There was an exultation, an excitement, a feeling that no other experience on God's earth could bring. It could bring death, too, and wounds so vile that a man would shudder in his sleep to dream of them. But war also gave this supreme feeling of imposing the will on an enemy and taking success in the face of disaster. The French outnumbered Sharp by three or four to one, but the French were dazed, disorganized, and shaken. Sharp's men were key to the fight, ready for it, and if he struck now, if he behaved as though he'd already won, then this half-stunned enemy would break. Sharp looked at the Marines. Advance! At the double! Advance! The cavalry was gone, destroyed by the seven-barrel gun and by Fredrickson's sharpshooters. Dead and wounded horses lay in the fields, dropped by rifle fire, and their surviving riders had fled to the safety of the wagons that offered some small shelter from the bullets. In front of the wagons, a rabble of infantry was being shaken into line, and Sharp's marines, coming from the smoke with muskets tipped with bayonets, charged them. If the enemy held, Sharp knew, then the marines would be slaughtered. If the enemy held, then each marine would be faced with three or four bayonets. It would only take one enemy officer, one of those blue-coated men on horseback, to survey Sharp's feeble charge, and the marines were done for. Charge! Sharp shouted it as though the volume of his voice alone would breed extra men to face down the enemy line, that uneven though it was, bristled with blades. Fire! Fredrickson, good Fredrickson, had understood all. He'd formed his company into ranks, taken them from the tree's cover, and now at sixty yards' range poured a controlled volley of rifle fire into the infantry's flank. That volley, with sharp stumbling charge, broke the French. Just as scared Frenchmen began to see the paucity of the attacking force, so another enemy appeared, and another voice was shouting charge. And then the sight of the bayonets, as it so often did, engendered panic. The French infantry, mostly young conscripts who had no stomach for a fight, broke and fled. An officer beat at them with a the flat of his sabre, but the French were running backwards. The officer turned, drew a pistol, but a rifle bullet buried itself in his belly, and he folded forward, eyes gaping, and one of Fredrickson's riflemen grasped the bridle as the officer fell sideways to the cold earth. Form of the first wagon's rear! Sharp yelled it to Palmer as they ran forward. The Marine's line was now broken by the necessity for men to step around the dead and dying on the ground. Harper, who couldn't bear to see an animal suffer, picked up a fallen French pistol and shot a wounded, screaming horse between the eyes. A carbine, fired by a dismounted cavalryman, threw down a Marine. Mimber's men shot the cavalryman, six bullets striking at once and flinging him down like a puppet that lay suddenly still and bloodied on the pale grass. There were fugitives under the first wagon. One still had a musket, and Sharp, thinking it loaded, struck with his sword to knock it clear. The boy, terrified, screamed, but Sharp had gone on, jumping blue-jacketed dead. Ahead, in a foul panic, a mass of infantry tumbled in pell-mell retreat. An officer emerging from a coach shouted at them, and some, braver than the rest, slowed, turned, and formed a new line. Captain Fredrickson! I see them, sir! Sharp ran behind the rear of a wagon. On this left side of the road, where Mimber's men stayed in hiding, a full company of French infantry was formed in three ranks. Six the earth! Sharp had to shout twice to Mimber, as Fredrickson's volley drowned his first shout. Flank attack! Flank attack! Palmer's marines were panting. 
Some had reddened bayonets, and others stabbed a Frenchman cowering beneath the heavy wagon. But Palmer and his sergeants pushed them into line and shouted at them to load muskets. The French company fired first. The range was seventy yards, too long for muskets, but two marines were down, a third was screaming, and the others still thrust with wooden ramrods at powder and bullets. Sharp supposed the marines used wooden ramrods because metal rods would rust at sea, then forgot the idle speculation as more enemy bullets thumped into the heavy timber of the wagons. Stragglers from the first company had joined the ranks where French muskets tipped up as the enemy began to reload. Aim! Palmer shouted. Hold your fire! Hold your fire! Sharp took station at the head of the marines. He made his voice steady. There was a time to rouse men in battle and a time to calm them. Marines will advance at the march forward. Sharp was taking the marines down the left flank of the wagons, leaving Fredrickson to control the right side of the road. Mimber's riflemen were showing themselves on this French flank, green-jacketed men who appeared from behind trees and farm buildings, men who worked forward in the skirmishing chain, each man covering his partner, and their fire nibbled at the flank of the French company. A French officer looked sideways, judging whether to turn a file to flick the riflemen away with a control volley, and then he looked forward to where the redcoats advanced. This was no mad charge meant to panic, but a slow, steady advance to show confidence. Sharp wanted to close the range. He wanted this volley of musketry to kill. He watched the enemy's movements. Ramrod's new and bright metal flashed as they were raised. He heard the scraping rattle as they plunged downwards into muskets held between clenched knees. Marines, halt! The boots of the men who advanced on the road crashed to attention. The sound seemed unnaturally loud. Mimber's men still fired, their bullets spinning constantly from the flank. Carbine bullets fired by dismounted cavalrymen buzzed past Sharp. An ox, oblivious of the carnage around, staled on the road, and the smell of the steam pricked at Sharp's nostrils. To your front! Aim! Sharp wanted this slow and sure. He wanted the Frenchmen to see the shape of their death before it came. He wanted them scared. The marine line seemed to take a quarter turn to the right as the muskets went into the shoulders. One or two men, who had not yet cocked their pieces, pulled back the flints, and the click seemed ominous. Sharp walked to the flank of the marine formation and raised his sword. Some of the French were priming their muskets, but most were staring nervously at the small line of redcoats who seemed so deliberate and savage. Sharp let them wait, giving their imaginations time to torment them. Harper came to stand alongside Sharp. He had his rifle loaded, aimed, and he waited for the order. To Harper's eyes, these Frenchmen were boys, the scrapings of a countryside to bring Napoleon's armies up to strength. These were not the moustached, experienced veterans who had died in the appalling Spanish battles, but conscripts dragged unwillingly from school or farm to die in a cause that was doomed anyway. The conscripts primed their pieces. Some had forgotten to take their ramrods out of their musket barrels, but it didn't matter. Aim low! Sharp's voice was harsh. He knew most troops fired high. Aim at their balls! Fire! The sword swept down. The volley smashed out, the sound of the muskets deafening as the heavy weapons leapt back into bruised shoulders. The smoke, stinking of rotten eggs, made its fog. Lie down! Sharp shouted. He saw astonished faces, and his voice rose in anger. Lie down! Lie down! The marines, puzzled, dropped flat. Sharp knelt to one side of the rolling poisonous cloud of musket smoke. The French company had shaken as the volleys struck home. Just like a man punched in the belly, the whole company seemed to fold. Then the officers and sergeants, shouting orders, pushed the ranks back into place, and Sharp saw how the rear files had to step over the writhing and the dead left by the Marines' well-aimed volley. The French commander ignored the riflemen on his flank. They could be dealt with after the redcoats. Tirez! For a new company, unblooded, it was a good response. Sixty or seventy muskets fired at the gunsmoke, but the marines were flat, and the conscripts fired high. Go for them! Go! Sharp was triumphant now. This one company had been the last danger, but he had drawn their sting by laying his men flat. On your feet! On your feet! Go! Cheer, you bastards! This was the moment for noise, the moment for terror. The marines, who a second before had been the target for a controlled, tight volley, scrambled unscathed to their feet and charged. They yelled as if they were boarding an enemy ship. Lieutenant Fitch fired his pistol wildly, then tried to drag his heavy sword from its scabbard. 
The conscripts, staring through their own musket smoke, saw the unharmed enemy coming with long bayonets, and like the first two companies of the convoy's head, broke. Some were slow, and those the marines caught and pinned to the ground with bayonets. A mounted officer, scarlet-faced and furious, charged at the redcoats, but Sharp lunged with his sword, caught the horse's hind quarters, and the beast turned, teeth snapping, as the officer hacked down with his infantry sword. The blades met, clashed, and the shock ran up Sharp's arm. The horse reared, lashed with its hooves, as it was trained to do, but Sharp back swung the sword into the beast's mouth, as he was trained to do. The animal twisted, the officer kicked his feet out of the stirrups, and as the horse fell to one side, nimbly threw himself clear. The horse collapsed off balance, lips bleeding, then scrambled to its feet as if nothing was amiss. Surrender, Sharp said to the officer. The reply, whatever it meant, did not signify surrender. The Frenchman's sword blade flickered out in an expert lunge. The man's horse was now cropping the grass, and the Frenchman reached with his spare hand for its bridle. Sharp lunged, knew that the man would counterattack, so immediately stepped back. The blade duly came for him, skewered thin air, and Sharp's heavy blade cracked down onto the sword hilt, driving the weapon down. And Sharp stepped forward, brought his knee up, then used the ugly iron guard of his sword to punch the officer's face. Surrender, you crap old bastard! The officer was on the grass, sword forgotten and hands clutched to his crutch. He was gasping for breath, moaning, and Sharp decided that constituted a surrender. He kicked the man's sword into the ditch, pulled the horse towards him, and hauled himself clumsily into the saddle. He wanted the extra height to see what happened on his small, well-chosen battlefield. The French had run. A company of them were being organized a quarter mile north, but they posed no immediate problem. A few survivors still clung to the wagons. Some died from bayonet thrusts, but most were being taken prisoner. The wagons were otherwise abandoned, and Sharp guessed their drivers, with other fugitives, had fled into the beech woods. Captain Palmer? Palmer seemed astonished to see Sharp on horseback. Sir? One squad of men to the beech trees, flush the damn place clear. Don't be cautious about it, scare the bastards. Yes, sir. Captain Fredrickson? Sharp twisted the horse towards the far side of the road. Keep that company busy! Sharp pointed to the north. Take half Minver's men and press them, William, press them! There were pickets to be set on the flanks, the wounded to take into the shelter of the wagons, and the wagons themselves to explore. The two coaches, harness horses shivering, were brought forward. One was empty. The other contained two women who sat terrified with smelling salts uncapped. Put a guard on them, Captain Palmer. Unharness the horses. Sharp would leave the women where they were, but the horses, like the oxen, would be scattered into the meadows. Some men would have advised killing the animals to deprive the French of their future use, but Sharp couldn't bear to give that order. The oxen lumbered away, protesting under the prodding of the bayonets. One beast, wounded by a musket bullet in the small battle, was slaughtered, and Sharp watched two marines cutting up the steaming warm flesh that would make a fine supper tonight. Other marines swarmed over the wagons, ripping the canvas covers away and slashing the tie ropes. Barrels and boxes were uncovered and thrown to the road's verges, where the prisoners, shivering and terrified, sat under guard. It had taken twenty-five minutes of savagery, of fire and smoke and bluff and blood, and a French convoy deep in France and guarded by a half battalion of troops was taken. Better still, and even more inexplicable, Sharp's headache was entirely gone. Chapter 11 Lieutenant of Marines Fitch, to whom Sharp had hardly spoken since they'd marched inland, brought the civilians to Major Sharp. The lieutenant heard of them at pistol point until told by Sharp to put his damned toy away. Fitch, his martial ardour offended by the rifleman, gestured at the four stout and worried-looking men. They're from the town, sir. Buggers want to surrender. The four men, all dressed in good woolen clothes, smiled nervously at the mounted officer. They each wore the white cockade, which was a symbol of the exiled King Louis the Eighteenth, and thus an emblem of anti-Napoleonic sentiment. The sight of the cockade, and the evident willingness of the four men to embrace a British victory, were uncomfortable reminders to Sharp of Bamfylde's hopes. Perhaps Bordeaux, like this small town, was ripe for rebellion. He should, Sharp knew, have interrogated a captured French officer by now, but his determination to obey Elphinstone's privately given orders had made him ignore the duty. Kindly ask them, Sharp said to Fitch, who evidently had some French, 
If they still wish to surrender when they understand that we'll be leaving here this afternoon and may not be back for some months. The mayor's monarchical enthusiasm evaporated swiftly. He smiled, bowed, fingered the cockade nervously, and backed away. But he still wished to assure the English milord that anything the town could offer his men would be available. They had only to ask for Monsieur Calabor. Get rid of him, Sharp said. Politely, and get those damn civilians off the bridge. Townspeople, hearing the crackle of musketry, had come to view the battle. The one-legged tollkeeper was vainly trying to make them pay for the privilege of their grandstand view. Fredrickson's rifles snapped from the north as he harried the broken infantry away from the scene of their defeat. Two wagoners and four cavalrymen, hands held high, were being prodded from the beech trees towards the disconsolate prisoners. Marines were piling captured muskets in a pile. The luckiest marines were rifling the wagons. Much of the plunder was useless to a looter. There were vats of yellow and black paint that the French mixed to colour their gun carriages, and which now the marines spilled onto the road to mingle with the blood and ox dung. Two of the wagons held nothing but engineers' supplies. There were coils of three-inch white cable, sap forks, cross-cut saws, bench hammers, chalk lines, scrapers, felling axes, augers and barrels of hambraline. There were spare cartouches for the infantry, each bag filled with a wooden block drilled to hold cartridges. Other wagons held drag chains, crooked sponges, relievers, brick holes, wad hooks, sabot braces and hand spikes. There were garlands for the stacking of round shot, and even band instruments, including a jingling johnny that a proud marine paraded about the stripped wagons, and shook so that the tiny bells mounted on the wooden frame made a strangely festive sound in the bleak, cold day. Another man banged the clash pans until Sharp curtly ordered him to drop the bloody cymbals. On one wagon there were crates of tinned food. The French had recently invented the process, and it was a miracle to Sharp how such...